This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents Hitler, the Germans, and the Final Solution by Ian Kershaw. Performed by Nick Sands. Introduction It seems in writing this introduction as if I am passing review over my life, certainly a good portion of my academic life. It is both a strange and disconcerting feeling. Strange because at least the earlier pieces in this volume were written so long ago that I almost feel at times as if another hand, not my own, was at work. Disconcerting because were I to write those pieces now, I would certainly write them differently. How could it be otherwise? It would be odd indeed, and probably not very commendable, if a historian found nothing to alter or revise in his or her own work during a course of thirty years' reflection on the issues in question. So it is with a degree of unease that I look over these pieces which my friends in Yad Vashem have chosen to present in this volume. I am, nevertheless, most grateful to them for suggesting this collection of some of my work, quite especially to Otto Dov Kulka, a good intellectual friend over thirty years, from whom I have learned an immense amount during a prolonged and fruitful exchange of correspondence. The contributions to the volume are presented in a thematic way to make sense of how they fit together, and how they came to be written, it is best, nevertheless, to take them for the most part chronologically. This approach allows a clearer glimpse of the historian behind the history, of how I conceived of the pieces at the time, how they reflect the course of my own intellectual development in writing on these issues, and how, in some cases, my views have changed in the light of later reflection. I should say at the outset, too, that I have always seen myself as a historian of modern Germany, specifically of Nazism, not directly of the Holocaust. I had come to German history via an increased competence in the German language. German was a subject unavailable at my school, so I was able to begin learning it only in 1969, and then for three years purely as a casual hobby. And what really and increasingly intrigued me as a product of post-war British democracy, was how Germany had so completely succumbed to a dictatorship which had brought about world war and, to rational minds, a scarcely intelligible persecution and extermination of the Jews. This shaped the course of my work, and the place of my studies of German reactions to the persecution of the Jews and of the final solution within it. My chief interest, when I began working on the Third Reich in the mid-1970s, was on how German society had reacted to Nazism, what the attitudes of ordinary Germans had been under the Hitler dictatorship, and what had shaped their behaviour. But within this general framework of interest, I was certainly concerned, especially and from the beginning, to understand as best I could how the majority German population had responded to the increasingly ferocious persecution, then extermination, of the Jews. An early exposure to this issue came in a chance encounter with an old Nazi in 1972, when I, still at the time a committed medievalist with a position at an English university devoted to the teaching and research of English medieval economic and social history, had nevertheless realized the urgent importance for my future in mastering German with all rapidity, and was taking an intensive German language course at the Goethe Institut in Grafing, a small market town about twenty miles outside Munich. At one point in a conversation which had become increasingly fascinating for me, through its expression of a strange alien mentality, my coffee-table companion remarked that, The Jew is a louse. The expression shocked me at the time, and, vivid in my memory, still does. But it posed the question in my mind about what the people of this attractive, sleepy little provincial Bavarian town had thought and done during the Nazi era. Little did I know then that only four or so years later I would be reading police reports from the same small town dating from the period immediately following Hitler's takeover of power, or indeed that the hostelry where I and other students from the Goethe Institute regularly ate our midday meals had been the main meeting place of the small town's Nazi party. 1. By 1976, I was engaged as part of the research team based at the Institut für Zeitgeschichte in Munich, working under the direction of Professor Martin Brostzat on the Bavaria Project, 
Astonishingly, the social history of the Third Reich was in its outright infancy in the mid-1970s when the project was established. It was Brotsatz, a brilliant imagination that saw the project, ostensibly set up to work on resistance and persecution in Bavaria during the Nazi era, as an opportunity to break free from conventional notions of opposition and to uncover patterns of behaviour not usually covered by the rubric resistance. Brostzat had welcomed me with open arms when I had explained to him my interest, which I had developed independently, in carrying out research on popular opinion during the Third Reich, based upon the extensive sets of reports on the mood of the people sent in on a regular basis by an array of agencies of the Nazi state. Though operating within the Bavaria project, I continued to work largely independently and very intensively during a twelve-month stay in Munich in 1976-7 on what I envisaged as a large monograph which would embrace both oppositional and acclamatory aspects of popular opinion. Brustzat became particularly enthusiastic about one part of this research, that which was directed at assessing popular attitudes towards Hitler. With his strong encouragement, this eventually saw life as Der Hitler Mythos, published in its original German form in 1980. Brustzat was also extremely taken by a lengthy chapter, intended as part of the initially conceived monograph, on anti-Semitism and popular opinion, which dealt with Bavarian reactions to the persecution of the Jews. He had already in 1979 incorporated this in the second volume of the series of publications emanating from the Bavaria Project. It gave me my first chance to publish in my new field of modern German history. When the other part of my initially planned monograph, dealing with the oppositional side of the coin, on which I had extensive material and had drafted several chapters, then became the core of a separate publication, appearing in 1983 with Oxford University Press, under the title Popular Opinion and Political Dissent, Bavaria 1933-1945, to I included in it, as I had always intended, a slightly abridged English-language version of this essay. This is the contribution, originally composed in 1977, which appears as Chapter 7 in this volume. It was my initial attempt to examine, on the basis of the regime's own monitoring of opinion, the behaviour and attitudes of ordinary Germans with regard to the Jewish question. It is, I think, worth understanding this genesis of the piece, how it arose as part of a widely framed analysis of different facets of popular attitudes towards the Nazi regime, positive and negative, in order to see how my interpretation took shape. I was struck, as I ploughed through an unending mass of police reports on the mood of the people, not by how much, but by how little the Jewish question, the core of the Nazi world view, appeared to figure, irrespective of whether the opinion reported was acclamatory or oppositional. Reflections of Hitler's popular image in the sources gave, for instance, little indication of the centrality of the Jews to his personal doctrine of hatred. Accordingly, when I published the original version of Der Hitler Mythos, I decided against including a thematic chapter relating to Jews. I later thought this had been a mistake, and included such a chapter, newly written, in the English-language version, The Hitler Myth, which was published in 1987. In the related study, Popular Opinion and Political Dissent, I was able to produce extensive evidence of the constant shaping of opinion by the materialist concerns of daily life, constant complaints about wages, prices, work conditions, and specific grievances of various sectors of society, and of the huge, though politically limited, alienation that emanated from Nazi attacks on the Christian churches. In contrast, what had really surprised me when I was carrying out the research was how little the persecution of the Jews appeared to invade the daily life of the majority of the population, and how limited its impact on popular opinion seemed to be. Of course, there were major flashpoints, such as the boycott of 1933, the promulgation of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, and especially the terrible pogroms of November 1938, when the persecution of the Jews briefly occupied the foreground of opinion. But even during the biggest waves of anti-Jewish action in 1933, 1935 and 1938, opinion had seemed to be influenced in the main by other factors. Of course, this was Bavaria, not Germany as a whole. And, a point which struck me strongly, in wide swaths of Bavaria there were no Jews at all. Most of the population, that is, probably encountered no actual Jews in daily life. 
I brought out the relative insignificance of the Jewish question in the shaping of popular opinion during the pre-war years in a piece published in 1981 and included in this volume as Chapter 5. I was attempting here to summarize my findings on the disparate strands of opinion and deployed Max Weber's concept of das Außer Alltägliche, a German abstraction more weakly rendered in English as the exceptional, to distinguish those spheres of Nazi policy which were intermittent rather than constant, such as the pressures of daily life. In Weber's parlance, das Alltägliche, the everyday or routine, in shaping attitudes. I included brief reference to the persecution of the Jews as part of the exceptional sphere, and suggested here too that the Jewish question had less and less genuine relevance for the daily life of the majority German population, and that the consequence for the shaping of opinion was less the creation of dynamic hatred than of lethal indifference, a lack of concern with ultimately deadly consequences. From my approach to popular opinion in general during the Third Reich came, then, my suggestion that indifference towards the fate of the Jews had characterized the stance of the majority of Germans. I summed up my interpretation in a sentence which has often been quoted since then. The road to Auschwitz was built by hate, but paved with indifference. Following this pointed conclusion, I made the chapter on popular opinion and the extermination of the Jews included in this collection as part of Chapter 8, the shortest in the book, trying to underline the point that, while the Jews were being killed in their millions during the war of extermination unleashed by the Nazis, most Germans had other things on their minds. Of course, I scarcely meant this in any complimentary, let alone apologetic, sense. Rather, I was trying to show that the Nazi efforts at instilling dynamic hatred of Jews in the population through relentless propaganda were not successful but also not necessary. As I put it, latent anti-Semitism and apathy suffice to allow the increasingly criminal dynamic hatred of the Nazi regime the autonomy it needed to set in motion the Holocaust. I had derived the distinction between latent and dynamic anti-Semitism from a somewhat obscure post-war tract by a German psychologist, Michael Müller claudius During the Nazi era, Müller Claudius had subtly prompted a small number of party members of his acquaintance into voicing their views about the November pogroms of 1938, then the deportations in 1941. Through this technique, and on the basis of this tiny, scarcely representative and obliquely constructed sample, he drew his conclusions about opinion towards the persecution of the Jews. Much of it, he indicated, could be summed up as indifference, a term which he used to describe reserved or non-committal reactions. Müller Claudius had in fact come to influence not just me, but the small number of others at that time who had carried out work on popular reactions to the persecution of the Jews. The latter included Marlies Steinert, whose impressive examination of wartime opinion, as reflected in the reports of the SD, Sicherheitsdienst, or Security Service, I had found particularly stimulating. Steinert's large book of more than 600 pages included just one chapter of 27 pages on German attitudes towards the Jews, and that at a time when the regime was taking the steps that would lead to the final solution, including the deportation of thousands of Jews to the death camps. Again, both the sense that most Germans had other things on their minds during the war, reflected in the small proportion of the book devoted to reactions to the persecution of Jews, and her adoption from Müller Claudius of the notion of indifference seemed to me convincing. At the time, though this was to change, the concept of indifference emanating from Müller Claudius had, I think, left its mark on another scholar, working independently and, in the mid-seventies, completely unknown to me, on German popular opinion and the persecution of the Jews. This was Otto Dov Kulke, whose name was first mentioned to me by an Israeli friend, Benjamin Kedar, later a distinguished medieval historian at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But in 1976-7, to like me, researching in Munich, thanks to the generous financial support of the marvellous German institution, the Alexander von Humboldt Stiftung. I was, of course, eager to learn what my rival researcher in Israel, of whose work I knew nothing at that point, was doing. Benjamin agreed to go through one of Kulke's publications, linguistically inaccessible for me, to clarify what common ground we might have. 
So I spent a long evening in a Munich beer hall, no great hardship, I readily concede, and not such a rare occurrence, either, making notes while Benjamin translated from an article which Kulka had published in Hebrew of direct relevance to my own work. It was the beginning of what would turn into a lasting dialogue between Kulka and me, which began in earnest when we met as I was giving a presentation at Harvard in the early 1980s. By that time, however, if not before, Kulka was already critical of the notion of indifference, especially with regard to the years of the final solution, and, together with a former student of mine, Aaron Rodriguez, wrote a constructively critical review of my interpretation on the appearance of my book Popular Opinion. In their review, Kulke and Rodriguez thought the concept of indifference might be more confusing than helpful, and was especially problematic when applied to the interpretation of popular attitudes towards the Jews during the war years, not least since it was an argument derived from the relative silence of the SD reports on this matter. They pointed to some reports from 1941 and 1942 which indicated widespread approval for the imposition of the Yellow Star and for a radical solution of the Jewish problem at the time of the deportations, concluding that the concept of indifference, suggesting as it does only a lack of concern, is too limited in scope and does not convey the full complexity of popular opinion. Their preference was to replace indifference by an attitude that might best be characterized as passive complicity. The disagreement caused me to rethink the validity of the notion of indifference, and an opportunity soon arose to present my second thoughts at an important conference staged by the Leo Beck Institute in Berlin in 1986, which both Kulka and I attended. These further ruminations are included as chapter 9 of this volume. I conceded some ground in accepting that interest in the fate of the Jews was greater, certainly at specific junctures, such as the introduction of the Yellow Star and the deportations, than I had allowed. I agreed, too, that indifference was a difficult, less-than-ideal concept. Yet I continued to prefer it, as a descriptive term of attitudes that shaped behavior, to passive complicity. In fact, I took the view that no one term could adequately encapsulate the variations in opinion, insofar as it is possible at all to assess prevailing attitudes in conditions of repressive dictatorship and absence of free speech. Beyond that, it seemed to me that the more I revisited the sources and the issues arising, the closer rather than the more divergent Kulka and Rodriguez and my own interpretations of behavior turned out to be, despite apparent conflict over definitional terms. The term indifference, I insisted, did not mean neutrality, but carried negative overtones, those of shrugging one's shoulders or turning one's back on an evil in recognition that one can do nothing about it and in the feeling that other concerns are more pressing or overwhelming. It is scarcely a heroic stance, nor morally commendable. But, I was claiming, it probably amounts to a commonplace attitude, and even in democracies, let alone in a dictatorship at war. To strengthen the term, I turned it into moral indifference, which I thought was perfectly compatible with the growing depersonalization of Jews during the war, and the hardening of attitudes towards the Jewish question in the population. In essence, therefore, I was holding to the view that, at the time that Jews were being murdered in their millions, the vast majority of Germans had plenty of other things on their mind, and that the Jewish question was relatively unimportant in the overall shaping of popular opinion. In this piece, I also addressed more directly than I had done in my work on Bavaria, the major difficulties of interpreting the reports on opinion from within the Nazi regime. While Kulke and Rodriguez criticized the argument from silence, for instance, I pointed to the problems of assessing what was presented in the reports as the opinion of the population. Though I agreed that a hardening of attitudes towards Jews, as reflected in the reports, most likely had occurred, it did seem fairly self-evident to me that the reported views voicing, for example, outright approval of the Yellow Star were almost certain to have been those of the Nazified section of the population. What proportion of the total population that amounted to is, in the nature of things, impossible to quantify, despite the obvious dangers involved in expressing criticism of measures against Jews. Moreover, the sources do indicate that Nazi policies did not meet with total approval, even during the war, 
though certainly this applied to only a small and equally unquantifiable minority. Between the extremes, and here we return to the argument from silence, I took the view that it is impossible to know with any precision what people thought, an inference that most people were probably preoccupied with the mounting personal anxieties during the war seemed reasonable. That would, in turn, bring us back to a sense of moral indifference towards the fate of a generally disliked minority. I returned to the passivity which I saw as reflecting the low level of priority in German consciousness accorded to the fate of the Jews in a paper presented to a conference in Haifa in 1986, included in this volume as Chapter 6. Here, as earlier, I suggested that lack of interest in discrimination against a generally disliked minority, coupled with the latent antagonism that had existed even in democratic conditions before the incomparably greater difficulties of speaking out under a dictatorship arose, provided a prerequisite for the process of genocide, by allowing the fanatical hatred of part of the population to gather pace unchecked and unhindered. Pessimistically, I alluded to the questionable liberal assumptions that human beings under threat will be defended in an open society. In this, my last attempt to wrestle with the intractable sources on popular opinion and the fate of the Jews, I tried to distinguish between what people could and did know, quite a lot, what they made of the information, an awareness that genocide, even if the word was not then in currency, was taking place, though ignorance of scale and detail led to only partial comprehension. And reactions, a spectrum from overt approval to blank condemnation, though with an apathetic turning away from unpalatable knowledge and events which could not be averted as the most widespread. By this time, I felt I could take my own investigations of popular attitudes towards the persecution of the Jews no further. Since then, nevertheless, other historians have extended the exploration, and on the basis of a much wider selection of sources than had been available to me in the 1970s and early 1980s. The most notable, among a growing array of studies on this theme, have been David Bonkier's wide-ranging analysis, a recently published book by Peter Longerich, and the magnificent edition of all known police reports on popular opinion and the Jewish question by Otto Dov Kulke and Eberhard Jekyll. Relevant too, if not directly based upon the opinion reports, is the detailed study of Nazi wartime propaganda about the Jews by Geoffrey Herf. I need briefly to comment here on the ways in which my own views, compiled so long ago and represented in the unrevised essays in this volume, still stand up or have been totally supplanted by later research. Bankier spoke of moral insensibility to the Jews' fate by the German population during the deportations and mass murder, of which there was widespread knowledge, adding that many deliberately sought refuge from the consciousness of genocide, which implied responsibility. He accepted that the public did not assign anti-Semitism the same importance as the Nazis did, but that pre-existing, deep-seated anti-Jewish feeling meant that there was widespread support for the aim of ridding Germany of Jews, even when methods, and particularly open violence, were criticized. In these judgments, I found nothing with which I could not concur. Longerich moved the debate on by arguing that the regime's reports on reactions to anti-Jewish policy represented not authentic, but rather artificially produced official public opinion and that their role was to document that the population in its daily behavior expressed its approval for regime policy. As such, opinion was largely reported only in phases of intense anti-Semitic propaganda accompanying anti-Jewish measures, and not in the relatively quiet intervening periods. In this approach, silence in the reports cannot be taken to mirror the indifference of the population. Rather, it reflected the fact that the propaganda machine itself had little interest in certain phases of stressing the anti-Jewish theme, and thus equally little interest in trying to monitor responses. Longerich focused, therefore, less on the reports as indicators of opinion than on the efforts of propaganda to shape it, efforts which he admitted were only a partial success. A consequence of this focus on the monitoring of steered, and therefore distorted, opinion is, he suggested, that it becomes pointless to try to establish the existence of a true popular opinion. The regime's interest, he argued, 
was to implicate the population, whose awareness of atrocities on a huge scale was extensive, into complicity in the mass murder, something it did by making the final solution a sort of open secret. As the fortunes of war turned sharply against Germany, this changed and the regime endeavoured to suppress discussion of the murder of the Jews. Fearful of Jewish revenge, the population was now less than ever ready to concern itself with details of genocide and increasingly tended to suppress what knowledge it had. He concluded that the most simple and dominant attitude, by this time, amounted to openly apparent indifference and passivity towards the Jewish question, which was not to be mistaken for disinterest, but rather reflected demonstrative ignorance as a retreat from responsibility. There is much in this analysis that rings true, and yet much still rests upon inference and surmise rather than empirically demonstrated fact. Anyone familiar with the entire gamut of opinion reports, not just on the Jewish question, and coming from simple local police as well as more sophisticated central agencies of the regime, would have reservations about claims that the views recorded were merely manufactured and artificial, that there was no authentic sphere of opinion, however difficult to recapture, beyond the product of propaganda. If that were so, it is difficult to know why the reports so readily recorded dissenting views in contrast to the reports from propaganda leaders to Goebbels' ministry, where conformity was very much encouraged and negative reportage criticised, and why the regime leadership halted the central SD digests in 1944. The fact that from Stalingrad onwards, dissenting views also increasingly included criticism of Hitler himself, if, of course, carefully and often obliquely expressed, also speaks in favour of an authentic opinion, beneath the propaganda construct and reported approval of government policy. There remains, in Longris analysis, the problem of interpreting the silences of the reports on attitudes towards the Jews. He sees these as mirroring simply the relative lack of propaganda activity, not relative lack of interest in the genocide, until the last phase of the Third Reich, when it amounted to a self-protective, cultivated lack of interest. He may be right, but how can he or we be sure? The mentalities behind opinions left unsaid are anybody's guess. Arguments from silence remain open to objections whichever way they fall. In his detailed study of wartime propaganda on the Jewish question, which consciously shifts the emphasis from what ordinary Germans thought to how the Nazis presented it to them, Geoffrey Herf offers what seems to me a sensible admonition to those wanting to draw conclusions about popular attitudes from such problematic sources as the SD reports. As regards German knowledge or thought about the Holocaust, and how ordinary people responded to the barrage of anti-Jewish agitation, he remarks that the beginning of wisdom in these matters is a certain restraint and much less certainty regarding what ordinary Germans made of Nazi propaganda. I agree with this, and were I writing on this topic today rather than thirty years ago, I would probably be more cautious and agnostic than ever about generalised conclusions on opinion in the German population towards the fate of the Jews. I also concur with a further comment of Herf about the opinion reports. The most plausible reading of the evidence is that a fanatical but no small minority embedded in or hovering around the front organisations of the Nazi party was fully persuaded by the radical propaganda of Jewish responsibility for the war, and that these fanatics were surrounded by a society in which milder forms of anti-Semitism had become commonplace. This matches fairly well with the rough-and-ready division I suggested in my own work, between a sizable minority of radical anti-Semites, though one it is important to stress, backed by all the powerful organs of a ferociously repressive regime, an infinitesimally tiny minority disapproving of the persecution and prepared in some ways to support Jews, and a large proportion which was latently anti-Semitic but passively tolerant towards the ever more radical persecution. The edition by Kulke and Jekyll differs from the above works in that it is a superb and comprehensive edition of Nazi reports on attitudes towards the Jews but one containing no more than a textual introduction which refrains from analysis or interpretation. The editors, nevertheless, raise the question of indifference as part of the major problem of interpreting the newly assembled sources, 
suggesting, perhaps optimistically, that the material now allows a more precise framework of questions and well-grounded answers. In an essay published before the completion of this remarkable edition, Kulko was bolder. Raising once more the differing weightings to be attached to the extensive silence in the reports on the final solution and the depersonalization of Jews, he contrasted the notion of general passivity as the result of indifference, of not knowing or not wishing to know, or alternatively, of a repression of such knowledge, with general passivity as the expression of a broad consensus on the government's policy, a kind of tacit agreement that there was no need to take an active stand on the subject. Extending his consideration to the statements approving of the regime's anti-Semitism in the post-war opinion surveys carried out in occupied Germany by the Americans, Kulke concludes, It is obvious that the interpretation that the German population was generally indifferent to the genocidal policy against the Jews does not pass the test of the confrontation with the additional sources. It is also plain enough that identification with the final solution was quite widespread among the public in the Third Reich. I doubt myself whether the post-war surveys bear the strength of this interpretation. On the figures which Kulke provides from one of the surveys, 20% went along with Hitler on his treatment of the Jews, and a further 19% were generally in favour but felt that he had gone too far. Appalling though these findings are, they do little to address the indifference issue. My own correspondence with Kulke has continued, and our nuanced disagreements continue. They do not seem to me to be very great, but nor are they ultimately resolvable. In the end, I am willing, as I have been throughout, to accept and acknowledge extensive and, probably down to the mid-war period, increasing approval of policies to remove Jews from Germany. But whether the passivity of the majority reflected moral indifference, bad conscience, suppression of uncomfortable knowledge, fear of the consequences, or tacit approval for what was being done, seems to me, truth to tell, impossible to establish. I have the feeling, as I did already by the mid-80s, that interpretations of the German population's stance on the final solution cannot be taken any further. Sometimes historians simply have to accept that they cannot find the hard and fast answers they seek in the inadequate remnants of the past with which they have to deal. New work will, I fear, be susceptible to the likelihood of diminishing returns. 2. By the mid-80s, my own interests were, in any case, moving away from this problem. What had started to engage me over the previous few years was less the issue of how Germans had reacted to the final solution than the question of how the regime that brought this about actually worked. My interest in the structures of power in the Nazi state, and quite especially the place of Hitler within those structures, had gained particular impetus through my attendance in 1979 when I was still no more than a novice in research on the Third Reich, at a conference at Cumberland Lodge in Windsor Great Park, just outside London. The conference gained a certain notoriety for its bitter disputes among leading German historians revolving around the terms, which began life at the conference and polarised debate on the character of the Nazi regime for years to come, of intentionalism and structuralism, or functionalism. Somewhat nervously, I gave my first ever conference paper on my new field of study at the gathering. My paper, on the Führer image and political integration, the popular conception of Hitler in Bavaria during the Third Reich, a foretaste of my Hitler mythos to be published the following year, was well received, to my great relief. But my main fascination with the conference was in the apparently unbridgeable gulf in interpretations about the structures of power in the Nazi state, among the assembled leading German historians. The insistence on the one hand on Hitler's complete domination of all that mattered, the equal insistence on the other of a polycratic system of rule which functioned chaotically and in good measure independently of Hitler's sporadic interventions, intrigued me. And when, plucking up courage, I tentatively suggested, as a newcomer and outsider, that there were fairly obvious ways of bridging the gap between the interpretations, I was gently and humorously put down by one of the luminaries present, who informed me that I was a Doppelganger, who wanted it both ways. Nevertheless, 
the stimulation of the conference prompted me to try to look more closely at the historiographical developments that had led to this, to my mind, strange polarization of views which provoked unusually vehement and polemical assertions. This formed the background to the short book on which I started work in the early 80s. The first edition of The Nazi Dictatorship, Problems and Perspectives of Interpretation appeared in 1985 with, at its heart, three chapters directly devoted to the role of Hitler in the power structures of the Third Reich, covering domestic affairs, the persecution of the Jews, and foreign policy. The contributions included in Part 3 of this volume, Chapters 10 to 12, comprise three sections of the revised fourth edition of this work, published in 2000. It is worth underlining the point here that when the first edition had come out, 15 years earlier, detailed empirical research on what had come to be called the Holocaust was only just beginning. Remarkably, the published contributions to the Cumberland Lodge Conference in 1979 on the Nazi state did not include a single paper on the Holocaust, nor, to my recollection, did the final solution, or the persecution of the Jews more generally, figure centrally in any of the discussions during the conference. This had not struck me at the time. The main focus of attention then had been on the internal structure of the regime during the 1930s, rather than on the period of war and genocide. Brostzat's structuralist account of the genesis of the final solution, prompted by David Irving's apologist claims in Hitler's war, had, it is true, appeared in 1977, followed by Christopher Browning's impressive rejoinder. But these essays mark the very beginning of serious attempts to uncover the complex stages of emergence of the final solution. Surprising as it sounds today, the symposium staged by Eberhard Jekyll at Stuttgart in 1984, at which leading historians advanced their differing interpretations of the complicated evidence for the decision-making process leading to the final solution, was the first time an academic conference in Germany had ever been devoted to the persecution of the Jews. During the 1980s and 1990s, however, immense advances were made in this field, in Germany as well as outside. Part 3 tries to do justice to the quality of much of this work, as well as to the legitimate variants in interpretation which have emerged. Anyone troubling to compare the four editions of The Nazi Dictatorship will be able to follow there not just the burgeoning research, but also the ways in which I revised my own interpretation in the light of the new findings as they arose. Chapter 10, Hitler and the Holocaust, encapsulates the picture as I saw it when I was preparing the fourth edition. Were I to refine the chapter now for a fifth edition, which I have declined to do, then I would have to incorporate still further important additions to the historiography, touched upon here in Chapter 4. The belated but then intensive focus on the Holocaust in German historiography played its part in the extraordinary eruption of the historian's dispute, Historiker Streit, in 1986, in which many of Germany's leading historians openly and heatedly debated the singularity of the Holocaust in the pages of leading newspapers. Subsumed in this dispute, which cast more heat than light and was political rather than actually historical in content, was a related but separable issue, and one which was, to my mind, more interesting from a scholarly perspective. This was the debate about whether the time had arrived to treat the Nazi era as a normal part of history and by normal historical methods, much as one would, for example, analyse, say, the French Revolution or the Reformation. This meant with cool rationality, free from emotion. It also meant ending the way the Third Reich was almost exclusively seen as a resort for lessons of political morality, and properly integrating it into German history, to promote better understanding and a sharpened historical consciousness in post-war democratic German society. And thirdly, it meant looking to those parts of national socialism which might be detachable from the criminal side of the regime and could be incorporated, even positively, in continuities stretching beyond the end of the Third Reich. These bold suggestions arose from what became a famous, or notorious, plea for the historicization of National Socialism, advanced by Martin Brostat in 1985. I included an evaluation of the historicization debate, which involved the leading Israeli historians, Saul Friedländer, Otto Dovkulke, and Dan Diener, in the second edition of My Nazi Dictatorship, presented here as Chapter 11.
Behind the debate lay the increasing attention paid over the previous decade in German work on the Third Reich to Alltagsgeschichte, the history of everyday life, the attempt to explore the social history of the Nazi era from below, from its grassroots. The Bavaria Project had played a major part in stimulating the new avenues of history from below that took off in Germany like a bushfire by the late 70s. Some aspects of this history of daily life seem to depict, even under conditions of the Nazi dictatorship, a normality distinct from the criminal characteristics of the regime, repression, persecution, terror, concentration camps, war, that had dominated in the historiography. But could these be written about as normal history, ignoring their setting in a criminal regime and the context of criminality within which the normality appeared to exist? Was Auschwitz unconnected with normal life in the Third Reich? This was ultimately the key issue. My own assessment of the issue at the time can be read here in Chapter 11. In retrospect, I think it is plain that Brustzat's critics had the better of the debate. It should probably also be added that Brustzat's plea had been rather hurriedly written and was somewhat ill-conceived. It was certainly convoluted and in some senses misleading in expression. Its intention was more limited than it appeared to be. What Brotzat was trying to do was to locate the Nazi era in the continuities that led on beyond 1945 and into the Federal Republic, something which was engaging his attention in his scholarly work at the time, and to emphasize the need to build genuine historical understanding rather than mere moral condemnation into the West German political consciousness. But his plea had the unfortunate effect of seeming to dislocate the daily experience of Nazism from the regime's crimes. Looking back on it twenty years later, the debate, for all its seriousness at the time, seems to have little methodological or programmatic importance. It reflected a particular juncture in historiography, and perhaps also a generational response from a historian who had himself experienced the Hitler era as a young man, and presumably seen facets of daily life which had appeared normal and not part of the criminality at the heart of Nazism. As far as I can see, the methodological issues at stake in the debate have had no real influence on the subsequent writing of the history of the Nazi era. A striking feature, in fact, even of Alltagsgeschichte, as time went on, was how much, not how little, it came to embrace the criminality of the regime, how much the criminality left its mark on so many seemingly normal aspects of life. The Bavaria Project itself, beginning by researching multifaceted manifestations of daily opposition, increasingly uncovered complicity and collaboration. And this turned out to be a precursor of the way some of the best products of Alltagsgeschichte took shape. In the meantime, we have also seen the publication of a number of general histories of the Third Reich which have had no difficulty in combining social history from below with the full weight accorded to the destructive, criminal and genocidal essence of the Hitler regime. In practice, therefore, the acute division of interpretations which the debate over historicization appeared to signify has not materialized. Nor, it could be added, has a split between German and Jewish interpretations of the Third Reich developed despite the implication at the time that this was an unavoidable outcome of separate and conflicting memories. Soon, in any case, the preoccupations of the Historikerstreit and the concerns about historicization of National Socialism were swept away by the dramatic events, unforeseen, I think, by any of the historians taken up in the disputes, that saw the fall of the Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany and the collapse of the Soviet bloc. Within a short time, new perspectives on the Nazi past began to emerge. Chapter 12 amounts to my attempt to assess them, at a time when the trends were still fresh. Here, too, what I wrote then has to be seen as a pièce de cassion, reflections at a specific juncture which, looking back, have a transitory air to them. Since reunification, Germany has become a normal European nation-state, more smoothly than perhaps anyone imagined even if one laboring more than any other under the strain of its own recent past, that of a second German dictatorship, the German Democratic Republic, as well as of the Nazi regime, and still facing difficulties in the full integration of the new Länder. 
the potential dangers of attempts to instill a sense of national identity which either blended out the Nazi past or, even worse, emphasised positive aspects of that past while playing down its crimes against humanity have simply evaporated, even if neo-Nazism, like new forms of fascism elsewhere in Europe, is something not to be viewed with complacency or equanimity. One of these positive aspects could again be linked to the plea for the historicization of Nazism the notion that Hitler's dictatorship could chiefly and best be viewed as an attempt, admittedly brutal, to force through a modernization of Germany which came fully to fruition in the Federal Republic. It seemed a very German perspective. I recall attending a conference in Berlin in 1990 where the question of Nazism as an agency of modernization, consciously or unwittingly a sort of developmental dictatorship, was discussed. A Jewish colleague who had fled from Nazism in the 1930s left partway through the discussions. He told me later, with no small amount of irony, that it had never occurred to him then, as he suffered the torment of Hitler's hordes, that what Nazism was really about was the modernization of Germany. It was a telling point. Even leaving aside any apologetic intent, the tendency implicit in trying to focus upon Nazism's presumed modernizing credentials was to mistake the accidentals of the phenomenon for its essence. It can, however, be immediately added that this type of approach, too, had a short shelf life. It turned out to be a passing strand of historical writing, which in practice left little mark on historiography. A third strand which I highlighted will certainly have greater longevity. This is the increased readiness to compare National Socialism with other forms of terroristic and inhumane regimes, most notably with Stalinism. But while crude, non-scholarly statements that Stalin had more people killed and was worse than Hitler are almost certainly more commonplace, not just in Germany, than they used to be, my impression is that inside the academy, the heyday of the revitalized totalitarianism theorem, which often made for simplistic comparisons, has passed. Instead, some sophisticated, but not value-loaded, empirical analysis has been undertaken which, while accepting some shared ground in the Stalinist and Nazi systems, highlights the differences rather than the similarities. Much the same could be said of a good deal of excellent work on the German Democratic Republic, which easily avoids the trap of bracketing the regimes and the extent of their crimes through the crude label of totalitarianism. Banal truism that it might be, comparison of regimes is necessary to establish singularity and the same applies to the need to specify the singularity of the Holocaust by placing it within a framework of comparative genocide. All in all, looking back on the period since German reunification, most of the worries that I voiced about trends in historiography and that arose during the heated disputes of the mid-1980s have dissipated. Instead, the Holocaust and attendant crimes of the Nazi regime have loomed ever larger both in historical writing and in popular consciousness. So much so, indeed, that the Holocaust can now plainly be seen, something not so plainly apparent in the 1970s or even 1980s, as a defining episode of the 20th century. Among the various reasons for this development is the opening of the archives of the former Soviet bloc, which has prompted a much sharper focus than had ever been possible during the Cold War on Nazi crimes in Eastern Europe, the epicenter of the horror. It was in a climate already altered by the revelations emerging from access to new material that the emphasis in historiography, belatedly, turned away from purely functional or materialistic explanations and started to lay the emphasis squarely upon race ideology as a central driving force of Nazism's attempt to build a new Germany and a new Europe, one purged of its racial enemies. The sensational impact, in Germany above all, of Daniel Goldhagen's book Hitler's Willing Executioners, on its publication in 1996, has partly to be explained by this new atmosphere, of which it was both a reflection and an intensification. In my critical remarks about Goldhagen's book, reprinted below in chapter 12, I suggested that it would occupy only a limited place in future historiography. Looking back, I think that this is technically correct, but underplays the spur that Goldhagen's flawed book gave to new research, not least by German scholars, on anti-Semitism. Of course, this remains a necessary but insufficient cause of the Holocaust, 
but much is now being done to understand in more detailed fashion than earlier the penetration of parts of German society by lethal anti-Semitism even before Hitler began his meteoric climb to power. A comprehensive social history of anti-Semitism in Germany during the Weimar Republic, during, that is, the period of a liberal democracy, when the seeds of the later genocide were sown, were fertilized and started to germinate, has yet to be written. But a beginning has been made. 3. In the later 1980s, a new phase in my work began. The historiographical exploration I had undertaken earlier in the decade, stimulated by my wish to develop a greater understanding of the works of the Nazi dictatorship, now started to lead me in a direction which I would earlier not have thought possible. I had accepted, I think in 1986 or 1987, an invitation to contribute a short analysis of Hitler's power to a series of publications in England, then in its initiatory phase, called Profiles in Power, aimed primarily at a student readership and framed around an examination of how major political leaders in different countries and in different historical epochs had exercised power. I had never worked directly on Hitler, but the idea appealed to me, not in terms of writing a biography, but as a chance to situate the German dictator within the power structures of the Nazi state, and methodologically to deploy Max Weber's concept of charismatic domination. This had for long seemed to me a fruitful way of looking at the Third Reich, but I had so far used the concept only in conjunction with the Hitler myth, not Hitler himself. Soon afterwards, an even more remarkable development, given my trajectory as, in essence, a historian of German society in the Third Reich, occurred. I agreed to write a full-scale new biography of Hitler. I had initially, in fact, declined the publisher's request to undertake this. I was not greatly taken with biography as a genre, and thought that a biography of Hitler could not avoid the pitfalls, all of which I had until then been trying to avoid, of an unduly personalistic interpretation of complex developments in the Third Reich. In any case, I was more than aware that Alan Bullock, then a generation later, Joachim Fest, had written justly praised biographies of Hitler, leaving aside a myriad of lesser biographies, and felt that there was probably not a lot more to be said. The publisher, Penguin in London, accepted my decision, but asked to be informed should I change my mind. I did. I reread both Bullock and Fest, and decided that, after all, they had far from said the last word. On the persecution, then murder of the Jews, and on the war itself, both completely inextricable from the history of Nazism, I was astonished to see how little Bullock and Fest had said. The essence of Hitler's vision, and how it had become translated into practical policy, had not been, to my mind, adequately examined. Vital phases in the radicalization of anti-Jewish policy, in the build-up to the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, preceding and immediately following the Reichskristallnacht pogroms in 1938, and not least in the emergence of the final solution itself, had received surprisingly little detailed treatment. In my own biography, by contrast, as it took shape, anti-Semitism, not just of Hitler himself, the cause of anti-Jewish policy, in which initiatives often came from others, and then the twisted path to the final solution ran as a crucial red thread. The gestation period, even before I began work on the biography in earnest, was a lengthy one. But it was essential for the ripening of my ideas on how to undertake it. One preliminary piece of work emerged from research which I carried out in Polish archives in 1989. I learnt a good deal from my immersion in the files of Artur Greiser, the horrendous Gauleiter of the Vaterland, later expanding my sources in a stay in Ludwigsburg to work in the war crimes archive there, where at lunch each day Daniel Goldhagen, Philippe Bourin, and I would discuss our latest research findings. My interest was in trying to understand as thoroughly as possible the way in which the establishment of the first systematic killing installation of what became the final solution at Chelmno in the Wartegau had come about. I was not persuaded by arguments, first advanced by Brotzat, that the final solution had arisen out of a series of unplanned initiatives by regional or local Nazi leaders in the Eastern Territories, only subsequently gaining sanction and becoming centrally coordinated in a genocidal program. 
On the other hand, I had always found the straightforward Hitler-centric line of much of the literature unconvincing. The article, chapter 3 in this volume, was my attempt to investigate this issue in a specific regional case study. The Wartegau was a pivotal area, given the Nazi attempts to Germanize the province with all haste, which involved the brutal deportation of the unwanted sections of the population, first and foremost Jews, but also huge numbers of non-Jewish Poles. What I tried to show was that initiatives for the moves to genocide there were indeed taken by the regional leadership. However, Greiser and the region's security police leaders, most notably the police chief of the region, Wilhelm Koppe, were taking their initiatives in the full knowledge and with the full approval of their bosses in Berlin. And though his presence was shadowy, Hitler, it seemed clear, was the ultimate instance in the authorization of genocide in the province. A second preliminary to the writing of my Hitler biography, included here as chapter 2, arose from an invitation to speak at the Institut für Zeitgeschichte in Munich in 1992. At the publication launch of the first three volumes of what would become an indispensable 14 volumes of Hitler's speeches, writings and ordinances between the refoundation of the Nazi Party in February 1925 and his takeover of power eight years later. I had already some years earlier reviewed the superb edition of Hitler's early speeches and writings assembled by Eberhard Jekyll with the assistance of Axel Kuhn. I now took the opportunity systematically to review the changing content of Hitler's public presentations between 1925 and 1928. While the Nazi party floundered in the political doldrums, but while Hitler was largely still speaking to the converted, before the surge in popularity demanded an alteration in propaganda methods. What this investigation clearly showed, to my mind, was that Hitler was far more than the propagandist and loud-mouthed beer-hall bigot of so much dismissive portrayal. There was, however repulsive, a consistent mind at work, something much earlier accepted by Eberhard Jekyll and, more intuitively before him, also by Hugh Trevor Roper. Moreover, there seemed no need to choose between the two versions, Hitler as ideologue or Hitler as propagandist. He was both. This, and his often underrated skill in political manoeuvring, was his danger. He was an ideological fanatic who did not retreat into cranky but alienating obsessions, but knew how to mobilize politically, and it was a fatal mix. By now, thanks to a period of research leave spent at the incomparable Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin in 1989-90, to where I could follow with my own eyes the astonishing events of that extraordinary year, I had been able to complete my short profile of Hitler's power. In this brief study, I developed my ideas of charismatic domination as the basis of Hitler's leadership position. I also introduced a related concept as an integral part of my analysis. This was taken from the superb translated documentary collection by Jeremy Noakes, with assistance in the first of the four volumes from Geoffrey Pridham, which I had regularly used with my students in England. I was very struck with a document in the second volume citing a routine speech by a Nazi functionary in 1934 who had declared that it is the duty of everybody to try to work towards the Führer along the lines he would wish. I had not at this point started my biography, but I now knew what the explanatory leitmotif would be. I developed the notion further in a paper prepared for a conference at Philadelphia in 1991. This paper, reproduced in this book as Chapter 1, was another important preparatory step towards undertaking the biography. The theme of the conference was a comparison between Germany and Russia, then the Soviet Union, in the first half of the 20th century. So, in the first part of my paper, I compared the nature of leadership in the Hitler and Stalin dictatorships, before going on to develop my thesis that charismatic domination formed the key to the exceptionality of Hitler's position. I saw the radical dynamic of the regime rooted in Hitler's embodiment of a utopian vision of national redemption through racial purification within Germany as the platform for imperial conquest through racial extirpation. The final section of the paper then introduced the related concept of working towards the Führer to try to show how the radical dynamic worked, how the drive to put into practice the vision symbolized by Hitler operated. This was, in essence, a preview of the interpretative thrust of my two-volume biography of Hitler, written in the second half of the 1990s. 
Working towards the Führer has, then, as I see it, particular relevance to the radicalization of policy in the Jewish question. I had emphasized this in the relevant parts of my biography. Some time after its completion, I developed the analysis in an essay on Hitler's role in the final solution, initially commissioned as a contribution to a multi-volume Italian compilation, Storia della Shoah, then printed in its original English form in Yad Vashem Studies and appearing in this work as Chapter 4. The remit of the commission included a survey of existing historiographical interpretations. This formed the first part of the essay, updating, therefore, to some extent, the historiographical analysis in Chapter 10 below. The second part then went on to unfold my understanding of the dialectic of radicalization in Nazi anti-Jewish policy before the war. Hitler himself later acknowledged that during the earlier part of his rule he had been forced, for tactical, not principled reasons, of course, to remain inactive in the Jewish question. Yet the radicalization had continued unabated. I tried to explain how this could happen. This dialectic, as I depicted it, had its driving force in the vision of national salvation which Hitler represented, a distant utopian goal which could be attained only by the cleansing to be brought about through the removal of the Jewish arch-enemy. What removal meant, of course, was open to different interpretations. I suggested that the dialectic ran along the following lines. Hitler would signal a green light to party radicals to step up measures against Jews. Action would inevitably build from below, putting pressure on the regime to sanction it, and ultimately demanding Hitler's intervention. This would legitimate the radical action before starting the process once more, but at a higher level of discrimination and persecution. I then went on to illustrate how Hitler operated in the genesis of the final solution. A key seemed to me, as it had done when I was writing the biography, to be found in the use of his infamous prophecy, first announced to the Reichstag in 1939, that in the event of another war, the Jews would be destroyed. As the final solution was being ushered in, Hitler used this prophecy on several telling occasions to signal the need for radical action by his underlings. They, in turn, understood the prophecy to indicate the wish of the Führer without any need for explicit orders. The prophecy had an additional function, to spread to the general public an awareness, while avoiding detailed or explicit information, that the destruction of the Jews was inexorably taking place. In this way, the prophecy became a key metaphor for the final solution, and functionally served to indicate how, in this crucial area, the presumed wish of the Führer activated this most terrible of the regime's crimes. 4. The final two essays in this collection, chapters 13 and 14, are more reflective pieces which try to come to grips with the question of the essential singularity of Nazism. Whether, and if so, in what ways, the Third Reich could be seen as an exceptional or unique system of rule was an issue which had always implicitly and sometimes explicitly raised itself in the historiography. Often, such a question was dealt with through models of comparative fascism or totalitarianism, both of them concepts with serious definitional problems. An invitation to deliver a Trevelyan lecture at Cambridge in 2002, in which I was asked to survey relevant historiography, gave me the opportunity to tackle the question head-on. After a brief overview of how the problem had been treated in some influential strands of historiography, I returned to the nature of Hitler's charismatic authority, which had been a constant theme of my work on the Third Reich since I had worked on the Hitler myth back in the 1970s. I briefly compared the character of the Führer cult in Germany with the leadership cults in Italy, the Soviet Union and Spain to underline the peculiar strength of Hitler's position. I emphasized the way in which he could embody in his public image important pseudo-religious strains of German political culture which had predated the First World War, but had through war and defeat received an enormous boost. This embodiment in Hitler of a dynamic revolutionary thrust, unachievable without war and a colossal gamble for world power and demanding national salvation through racial purification, a chiliastic goal that became institutionalized in every facet of political organization in the Third Reich, distinguishes the Third Reich from every other known political dictatorship, however terrible the specific forms of gross inhumanity in each of these was. The final essay in this volume, 
widens the perspective far beyond Germans and Jews. It also attempts to link an evaluation of the past with a few reflections about the future from the vantage point of the beginning of the 21st century. The piece began life as a talk in German delivered at a specific occasion. A gathering on the edge of the beautiful Lake Starnberg in Bavaria in late 2000 to celebrate Hans Mommsen's 70th birthday. For me, the timing was not propitious. I was so frequently away from home around then, giving lectures related to my Hitler books, that I was able to prepare my talk only in airport lounges and on planes. A couple of years later, I decided to work up the paper somewhat more thoroughly in English. This is the version that was eventually published in Contemporary European History in 2005 and is reprinted here. I asked in the essay what, beyond advances in the technology of killing, had spawned such a colossal expansion of mass political violence in the 20th century. What propelled societies towards violence or restrained them from perpetrating it? And finally, what was intrinsically modern about modern mass violence? I found answers in the combination of Janus-faced popular sovereignty, used to justify, in different conditions, both liberal democratization and populistic attacks on democracy, coupled with the demonization of minorities, with the potential for bureaucratic planning and technological advances, both again holding positive and negative potential. I parted company, however, from the full implications of Sigmund Baumann's influential thesis locating the propensity to genocide and the Holocaust in particular, in the highly developed bureaucratic rationality of the modern state machine. The lack of sophistication in planning and implementation, but magnitude and speed of the mass killing in the Rwanda genocide, carried out in the main with little more than guns and machetes, should alone give pause for thought about such an argument. Rather, I suggested, the decisive factor was the nature of a new kind of ideology, which, whatever its varied form and expression, was absolutist in its total claim to determine who should have the right to inhabit the earth in the building of a mooted coming utopia. To be a Jew under Hitler, a Kulak under Stalin, or an intellectual under Pol Pot was, as I put it, tantamount to a death sentence. The Nazi state, however, produced the most absolutist form of ideology of all, in that the biological exclusion of Jews was more lethally uncompromising than the often brutally arbitrary, socially deterministic exclusivism of Stalinism or Pol Pot. And this most extreme manifestation of absolutist ideology thoroughly permeated the most advanced state machinery and exploited the most developed technology in Europe. The final solution arose from this unholy combination. The essay ended with a rather gloomy look into the crystal ball. Historians are, of course, no better than anyone else when it comes to dealing with the future rather than the past. How things will turn out is impossible to foretell. At least, a replication of the conditions which produced the Holocaust is, mercifully, nowhere in sight. The problems are now very different to those which gave rise to Hitler and genocidal antisemitism. Even so, it is difficult to view the future with great optimism. The threat from an international order in disarray most obviously in the Middle East, is palpable. And humankind's capacity to combine new forms of ideological demonization with bureaucratic refinement and unparalleled technological killing power is far from eradicated. So far, with great effort, the combination, which would be truly dangerous if marshaled by a powerful state entity, has been held in check. Will it continue to be? Part 1 Hitler and the Final Solution 1. Working Towards the Führer Reflections on the Nature of the Hitler Dictatorship The renewed emphasis, already visible in the mid-1980s, on the intertwined fates of the Soviet Union and Germany, especially in the Stalin and Hitler eras, has become greatly intensified in the wake of the upheavals in Eastern Europe. The sharpened focus on the atrocities of Stalinism has prompted attempts to relativize Nazi barbarism, seen as wicked, but on the whole less wicked than that of Stalinism, and by implication of communism in general. The brutal Stalinist modernizing experiment is used to remove any normative links with humanizing, civilizing, emancipatory, or democratizing development from modernization concepts, 
and thereby to claim that Hitler's regime too was, and intentionally so, a modernizing dictatorship. Implicit in all this is a reversion, despite the many refinements and criticisms of the concept since the 1960s, to essentially traditional views on totalitarianism, and to views of Stalin and Hitler as totalitarian dictators. There can be no principled objection to comparing the forms of dictatorship in Germany under Hitler and in the Soviet Union under Stalin, and, however unedifying the subject matter, the nature and extent of their inhumanity. The totalitarianism concept allows comparative analysis of a number of techniques and instruments of domination, and this too must be seen as legitimate in itself. The underlying assumption that both regimes made total claims upon society, based upon a monopolistic set of ideological imperatives, and resulting in unprecedented levels of repression and attempted indoctrination, manipulation and mobilization, giving these regimes a dynamic missing from more conventional authoritarian regimes, again seems largely incontestable. But the fundamental problem with the term totalitarianism, leaving aside its non-scholarly usage, is that it is a descriptive concept, not a theory, and has little or no explanatory power. It presumes that Stalinism and Hitlerism were more like each other than different from each other, but the basis of comparison is a shallow one, largely confined to the apparatus of rule. My starting point in these reflections is the presumption that, despite superficial similarities in forms of domination, the two regimes were, in essence, more unlike than like each other. Though seeing greater potential in comparisons of Nazism with other fascist movements and systems, rather than with the Soviet system, I would want to retain an emphasis upon the unique features of the Nazi dictatorship and the need to explain these alongside those characteristics which could be seen as generic components of European fascism in the era following the First World War through the specific dominant features of German political culture. In this, I admit to a currently rather unfashionable attachment to notions of a qualified German Sonderweg. Sometimes, however, highlighting contrasts can be more valuable than comparing similarities. In what follows, I would like to use what, on an imperfect grasp of some of the recent historiography on Stalinism, I understand to be significant features of Stalin's dictatorship to establish some important contrasts in the Hitler regime. This, I hope, will offer a basis for some reflections on what remains a central problem of interpretation of the Third Reich. What explains the gathering momentum of radicalization, the dynamic of destruction in the Third Reich? Much of the answer to this question has, I would suggest at the outset, to do with the undermining and collapse of what one might call rational structures of rule, a system of ordered government and administration. But what caused the collapse, and, not least, what was Hitler's own role in the process? These questions lie at the centre of my inquiry. First, however, let me outline a number of what appear to me to be significant points of contrast between the Stalinist and the Hitlerist regimes. Point 1. Stalin arose from within a system of rule, as a leading exponent of it. He was, as Ronald Sunni puts it, a committee man, chief oligarch, man of the machine, and, in Moshe Levin's phrase, bureaucracy's antichrist, the creature of his party who became despot by control of the power which lay at the heart of the party in its secretariat. In a sense, it is tempting to see an analogy in the German context in the position of Bormann rather than Hitler. Is it possible to imagine Stalin echoing Hitler's comment in 1941? I've totally lost sight of the organizations of the party. When I find myself confronted by one or other of these achievements, I say to myself, by God, how that has developed. At any rate, a party leader and head of government less bureaucratically inclined, less a committee man or man of the machine than Hitler, is hard to imagine. Before 1933, he was uninvolved in and detached from the Nazi movement's bureaucracy. After 1933, as head of government, he scarcely put pen to paper himself, other than to sign legislation put in front of his nose by Lammers. The four-year plan memorandum of 1936 is a unique example from the years of 1933 to 45 of a major policy document composed by Hitler himself, 
written in frustration and fury at the stance adopted during the economic crisis of 1935-6 by Schacht and some sectors of business and industry. Strikingly, Hitler only gave copies of his memorandum to two persons, Göring and Blomberg, much later giving a third copy to Speer. The economics minister himself was not included in the short distribution list. Business and industrial leaders were not even made aware of the existence of the memorandum. Hitler's way of operating was scarcely conducive to ordered government. Increasingly, after the first year or two of the dictatorship, he reverted to a lifestyle recognizable not only in the party leader of the 1920s, but even in the description of the habits of the indolent youth in Linz and Vienna recorded by his friend Kubitzek. According to the post-war testimony of one of his former adjutants, Hitler normally appeared shortly before lunch, quickly read through Reich press chief Dietrich's press cuttings, and then went into lunch. So it became more and more difficult for Lammers, head of the Reich Chancellery, and Meissner, head of the Presidial Chancellery, to get him to make decisions which he alone could make as head of state. When Hitler stayed at Obersalzberg, it was even worse. There he never left his room before 2 p.m. Then he went to lunch. He spent most afternoons taking a walk. In the evening, straight after dinner, there were films. He disliked the study of documents. I have sometimes secured decisions from him, even ones about important matters, without his ever asking to see the relevant files. He took the view that many things sorted themselves out on their own, if one did not interfere. As this comment points out, even Lammers, the only link between Hitler and the ministries of state, whose heads themselves ceased definitively to meet around a table as a cabinet by early 1938, had difficulty at times with gaining access to Hitler and extracting decisions from him. Lammers himself, for example, wrote plaintively to Hitler's adjutant on the 21st of October 1938, begging for an audience to report to the Führer on a number of urgent matters which needed resolution and which had been building up since the last occasion when he had been able to provide a detailed report on the 4th of September. Hitler's increasing aloofness from the state bureaucracy and the major organs of government seems to mark more than a difference of style with Stalin's modus operandi. It reflects, in my view, a difference in the essence of the regimes, mirrored in the position of the leader of each, a point to which I will return. Point 2. Stalin was a highly interventionist dictator, sending a stream of letters and directives determining or interfering with policy. He chaired all important committees. His aim appears to have been a monopolization of all decision-making and its concentration in the Politburo, a centralization of state power and unity of decision-making which would have eliminated party-state dualism. Hitler, by contrast, was on the whole a non-interventionist dictator as far as government administration was concerned. His sporadic directives, when they came, tended to be Delphic and to be conveyed verbally, usually by Lammers, the head of the Reich Chancellery, or, in the war years, as far as civilian matters went, increasingly by Bormann. Hitler chaired no formal committees after the first years of the regime, when the cabinet, which he hated chairing, atrophied into non-existence. He directly undermined the attempts made by Reich Interior Minister Frick to unify and rationalize administration, and did much to sustain and enhance the irreconcilable dualism of party and state, which existed at every level. Where Stalin appeared deliberately to destabilize government, which offered the possibility of a bureaucratic challenge, Hitler seems to have had no deliberate policy of destabilization, but rather, as a consequence of his non-bureaucratic leadership position and the inbuilt need to protect his deified leadership position by non-association with political infighting and potentially unpopular policies, to have presided over an inexorable erosion of rational forms of government. And while the metaphor of feudal anarchy might be applied to both systems, it seems more apt as a depiction of the Hitler regime, where bonds of personal loyalty were from the beginning the crucial determinants of power, wholly overriding functional position and status. Point 3. Personalities apart, Hitler's leadership position appears to have been structurally more secure than Stalin's. If I have followed the debates properly, it would seem that there was some rational basis for Stalin's purges, even if the dictator's paranoia took them into the realms of fantasy. As the exponent of one party line among several, one set of policies among a number of alternatives, 
One interpretation of the Marx-Lenin arcanum, among others, Stalin remained a dictator open to challenge from within. Kirov, it appears, had the potential to become a genuine rival leader in the early 1930s, when dissatisfaction and discontent with Stalin's rule was widespread. Stalin's exaggerated feeling of insecurity was then to some measure grounded in reality. The purges which he himself instigated, and which in many instances were targeted at those closest to him, were above all intended to head off a bureaucratic challenge to his rule. Hitler thought Stalin must be mad to carry out the purges. The only faint reflections in the Third Reich were the liquidation of the SA leadership in the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, and the ruthless retaliation for the attempt on Hitler's life in 1944. In the former case, Hitler agreed to the purge only belatedly and reluctantly, after the going had been made by Himmler and Göring, supported by the army leadership. The latter case does bear comparison with the Stalinist technique, though by that time the Hitler regime was plainly in its death throes. The wild retaliation against those implicated in the assassination attempt was a desperate measure and aimed essentially at genuine opponents, rather than being a basic technique of rule. Down to the middle of the war, Hitler's position lacked the precariousness which surrounded Stalin's leadership in the 1930s. Where Stalin could not believe in genuine loyalty even among his closest supporters, Hitler built his mastery on a cultivated principle of personal loyalty to which he could always successfully appeal at moments of crisis. He showed a marked reluctance to discard even widely disliked and discredited satraps like Streicher, who had in Hitler's eyes earned his support through indispensable loyalty and service in the critical early years of the movement. And he was in the bunker visibly shaken by news of Himmler's treachery the loyal Heinrich, finally stabbing him in the back. A dangerous challenge to Hitler, especially once Hindenburg was dead, could effectively come only from within the armed forces, in tandem with an emergent, disaffected but unrepresentative minority among the conservative elites, or from a stray attack by a lone assassin, as came close to killing Hitler in 1939. Even in 1944, the leaders of the attempted coup realised their isolation and the lack of a base of popular support for their action. Hitler, it has to be accepted, was, for most of the years he was in power, outside the repressed and powerless adherents of the former working-class movements, sections of Catholicism, and some individuals among the traditional elites, a highly popular leader, both among the ruling groups and with the masses. And within the Nazi movement itself, his status was quite different from that of Stalin's position within the Communist Party. There are obvious parallels between the personality cults built up around Stalin and Hitler, but whereas the Stalin cult was superimposed upon the Marxist-Leninist ideology and Communist Party, and both were capable of surviving it, the Hitler myth was structurally indispensable to, in fact the very basis of, and scarcely distinguishable from, the Nazi movement and its Weltanschauung. Since the mid-1920s, Ideological orthodoxy was synonymous with adherence to Hitler. For us, the idea is the Führer, and each party member has only to obey the Führer, Hitler allegedly told Otto Strasser in 1930. The build-up of a Führer party squeezed heterodox positions onto the sidelines, then out of the party. By the time the regime was established and consolidated, there was no tenable position within Nazism compatible with a fundamental challenge to Hitler. His leadership position as the font of ideological orthodoxy, the very epitome of Nazism itself, was beyond question within the movement. Opposition to Hitler on fundamentals ruled itself out, even among the highest and mightiest in the party. Invoking the Führer's name was the pathway to success and advancement. Countering the ideological prerogatives bound up with Hitler's position was incompatible with clambering up the greasy pole to status and power. Point four. Stalin's rule, for all its dynamic radicalism in the brutal collectivization program, the drive to industrialization, and the paranoid phase of the purges, was not incompatible with a rational ordering of priorities and attainment of limited and comprehensible goals, even if the methods were barbarous in the extreme and the accompanying inhumanity on a scale defying belief. Whether the methods were the most appropriate to attain the goals in view might still be debated, but the attempt to force industrialization at breakneck speed on a highly backward economy and to introduce socialism in one country 
cannot be seen as irrational or limitless aims. And despite the path to a personalized dictatorship, there was no inexorable cumulative radicalization in the Soviet Union. Rather, there was even the great retreat from radicalism by the mid-1930s, and a reversion towards some forms of social conservatism, before the war brought its own compromises with ideological rectitude. Whatever the costs of the personal regiment, and whatever the destructiveness of Stalin in the purges of the party and of the military, the structures of the Soviet system were not completely broken. Stalin had been a product of the system, and the system was capable of withstanding nearly three decades of Stalin and surviving him. It was, in other words, a system capable of self-reproduction, even at the cost of a Stalin. It would be hard to claim this of Nazism. The goal of national redemption through racial purification and racial empire was chimeric, a utopian vision. The barbarism and destructiveness which were inherent in the vain attempt to realize this goal were infinite in extent, just as the expansionism and extension of aggression to other peoples were boundless. Whereas Stalinism could settle down, as it effectively did after Stalin's death, into a static, even conservative, repressive regime, a settling down into the staid authoritarianism of a Franco-esque kind is scarcely conceivable in the case of Nazism. Here, the dynamic was ceaseless, the momentum of radicalization an accelerating one incapable of having the brakes put on, unless the system itself were to be fundamentally altered. I have just used the word system of Nazism. But where Soviet communism in the Stalin era, despite the dictator's brutal destabilization, remained recognizable as a system of rule, the Hitler regime was inimical to a rational order of government and administration. Its hallmark was systemlessness, administrative and governmental disorder, the erosion of clear patterns of government, however despotic. This was already plain within Germany in the pre-war years as institutions and structures of government and administration atrophied, were eroded or merely bypassed, and faded into oblivion. It was not simply a matter of the unresolved party-state dualism. The proliferation of special authorities and plenipotentiaries for specific tasks, delegated by the Fuhrer and responsible directly to him, reflected the predatory character and improvised techniques imminent in Nazi domination. Lack of coherent planning related to attainable middle-range goals, absence of any forum for collective decision-making, the arbitrary exercise of power embedded in the leadership principle at all levels, the Darwinian principle of unchecked struggle and competition until the winner emerged, and the simplistic belief in the triumph of the will, whatever the complexities to be overcome. All these reinforced each other and interacted to guarantee a jungle of competing and overlapping agencies of rule. During the war, the disintegration of anything resembling a state system rapidly accelerated. In the occupied territories, the so-called Nazi New Order drove the replacement of clearly defined structures of domination by the untrammeled and uncoordinated force of competing power groups to unheard-of levels. By the time Goebbels was writing in his diary in March 1943 of a leadership crisis, and speaking privately of a leader crisis, the system of rule was unrescuable. Hitler's leadership was at the same time absolutely pivotal to the regime, but utterly incompatible with either a rational decision-making process or a coherent, unified administration and the attainment of limited goals. Its self-destructive capacity was unmistakable. Its eventual demise, certain. Hitler was irreplaceable in Nazism, in a way which did not apply to Stalin in Soviet communism. His position was, in fact, irreconcilable with the setting up of any structures to select a successor. A framework to provide for the succession to Hitler was never established. The frequently mooted party senate never came about. Hitler remained allergic to any conceivable institutional constraint and by 1943, the deposition of Mussolini by the fascist Grand Council ruled out once and for all any expectation of a party body existing quasi-independently of the leader in Germany. Though Goering had been declared the heir apparent, his succession became increasingly unlikely as the Reich Marshal's star waned visibly during the war. None of the other second-rank Nazi leaders was a serious alternative candidate to succeed Hitler. 
it is indeed difficult to see who could have taken over, how the personalized rule of Hitler could have become systematized. The regime, one is compelled to suggest, was incapable of reproducing itself. The objection that, but for a lost war, there was nothing to prevent this happening, seems misplaced. The war was not accidental to Nazism. It lay at its very core. The war had to be fought and could not be put off until a more favorable juncture. And by the end of 1941, even though the war dragged on a further three and a half years, the gamble for world power was objectively lost. As such, the dynamism of the regime and its self-destructive essence could be said to have been inseparable. This brings me back to the questions I posed at the beginning of the paper. If my understanding of some of the recent discussion on Stalinism is not too distorted, and if the points of contrast with the Hitler regime I have outlined above have some validity, then it would be fair to conclude that, despite some superficial similarities, the character of the dictatorship, that is of Stalin's and Hitler's leadership positions within their respective regimes, was fundamentally different. It would surely be a limited explanation, however, to locate these differences merely in the personalities of the dictators. Rather, I would suggest, they should be seen as a reflection of the contrasting social motivations of the followers, the character of the ideological driving force, and the corresponding nature of the political vanguard movement upholding each regime. The Nazi movement, to put the point bluntly, was a classic charismatic leadership movement. The Soviet Communist Party was not. And this has a bearing on the self-reproducing capacity of the two systems of rule. The main features of charismatic authority, as outlined by Max Weber, need no embroidering here. The perceptions of a heroic mission and presumed greatness in the leader by his following. The tendency to arise in crisis conditions as an emergency solution. The innate instability under the double constant threat of collapse of charisma through failure to meet expectations and of routinization into a system capable of reproducing itself only through eliminating, subordinating, or subsuming the charismatic essence. In its pure form, the personal domination of charismatic authority represents the contradiction and negation of the impersonal, functional exercise of power which lies at the root of the bureaucratic, legal, rational authority of the ideal-type modern state system. It cannot, in fact, become systematized without losing its particular charismatic edge. Certainly, Max Weber envisaged possibilities of institutionalized charisma, but the compromises with the pure form then become evident. The relevance of the model of charismatic authority to Hitler seems obvious. In the case of Stalin, it is less convincing. The mission in this latter case resides, it could be argued, in the Communist Party as the vehicle of Marxist-Leninist doctrine. For a while, it is true, Stalin hijacked the mission and threatened to expropriate it through his personality cult. But this cult was a gradual and belated product, an excrescence artificially tagged on to Stalin's actual function. In this sense, there was a striking contrast with the personality cult of Hitler, which was inseparable from the mission embodied in his name practically from the beginning, a mission which from the mid-1920s at the latest did not exist as a doctrine independent of the leader. Weber's model of charismatic authority is an abstraction, a descriptive concept which says nothing in itself of the content of any specific manifestation of charismatic authority. This is determined by the relationship of the leadership claim to the particular circumstances and political culture in which it arises and which give it shape. The essence of the Hitlerian charismatic claim was the mission to achieve national rebirth through racial purity and racial empire. But this claim was in practice sufficiently vague, adaptable and amorphous to be able to mesh easily with and incorporate more traditionalist blends of nationalism and imperialism, whose pedigree stretched back to the Kaiserreich. The trauma of war, defeat and national disgrace, then the extreme conditions of a state system in a terminal stage of disillusion and a nation racked by chasmic internal divisions, offered the potential for the charismatic claim to gain extensive support, stretching way beyond the original charismatic community and for it to provide the basis for an altogether new form of state. In a modern state, the replacement of functional bureaucracy through personal domination is surely an impossibility. But even the coexistence of legal rational and charismatic sources of legitimacy can only be a source of tension and conflict, 
potentially of a seriously dysfunctional kind. What occurred in the Third Reich was not the supplanting of bureaucratic domination by charismatic authority, but rather the superimposition of the latter on the former where constitutional law could now be interpreted as no more than the legal formulation of the historic will of the Führer, seen as deriving from his outstanding achievements, and where Germany's leading constitutional lawyer could speak of state power being replaced by unrestrained Führer power, the result could only be the undermining of the basis of impersonal law on which modern legal rational state systems rest and the corrosion of ordered forms of government and institutionalized structures of administration through unfettered personal domination whose overriding source of legitimacy was the charismatic claim, the vision of national redemption. The inexorable disintegration into systemlessness was, therefore, not chiefly a matter of will. Certainly, Hitler was allergic to any semblance of a practical or theoretical constraint on his power but there was no systematic divide-and-rule policy, no sustained attempt to create the administrative anarchy of the Third Reich. It was indeed, in part, a reflection of Hitler's personality and his style of leadership. As already pointed out, he was unbureaucratic in the extreme, remained aloof from the daily business of government, and was uninterested in complex matters of detail. But this non-bureaucratic style was itself more than just a personal foible or eccentricity. It was an inescapable product of the deification of the leadership position itself, and consequent need to sustain prestige to match the created image. His instinctive Darwinism made him unwilling and unable to take sides in a dispute till the winner emerged, but the need to protect his infallible image also made him largely incapable of doing so. It was not in itself simply the undermining of rational structures of government and proliferation of chaotic polycratic agencies that mattered. It was that this process accompanied and promoted a gradual realization of ideological aims which were inextricably bound up in the mission of the charismatic leader as the idea of Nazism located in the person of the Führer became translated between 1938 and 1942 from utopian vision into practical reality. There was, in other words, a symbiotic relationship between the structural disorder of the Nazi state and the radicalization of policy. The key development was unquestionably the growth in autonomy of the authority of the Führer to a position where it was unrestrained in practice as well as theory by any governmental institutions or alternative organs of power, a stage reached at the latest by 1938. After the blomberg fritsch affair of February 1938, it is difficult to see where the structures or the individuals capable of applying the brakes to Hitler remained. By this date, the pressures unleashed in part by the dictator's own actions, but even more so by diplomatic and economic developments beyond his control, encouraged and even conditioned the high-risk approach which was, in any case, Hitler's second nature. Meanwhile, in conjunction with the expansion into Austria and the Sudetenland in 1938, race policy, too, shifted up a gear. The Reichskristallnacht pogrom in November, instigated by Goebbels, not Hitler, though carried out with the latter's express approval, was the culmination of the radicalization of the previous year or so, and ended by handing over effective centralized coordination of the Jewish question to Heydrich. Territorial expansion and removal of the Jews the two central features of Hitler's Weltanschauung had thus come together in 1938 into sharp focus in the foreground of the picture. The shift from utopian vision to practical policy options was taking shape. It would be mistaken to look exclusively or even mainly to Hitler's own actions as the source of the continuing radicalization of the regime. Hitler was the linchpin of the entire system, the only common link between its various component parts but by and large he was not directly needed to spur on the radicalization. What seems crucial, therefore, is the way in which charismatic authority functioned in practice to dissolve any framework of rational government which might have acted as a constraint and to stimulate the radicalization largely brought about by others without Hitler's clear direction. The function of Hitler's charismatic Führer position could be said to have been threefold, that of unifier, of activator and of enabler in the Third Reich. 
As unifier, the idea incorporated in the quasi-deified Führer figure was sufficiently indistinct but dynamic to act as a bond not only for otherwise warring factions of the Nazi movement, but also, until it was too late to extricate themselves from the fateful development, for non-Nazi national conservative elites in army, economy and state bureaucracy. It also offered the main prop of popular support for the regime, repeatedly giving Hitler a plebiscitary basis for his actions, and a common denominator around which an underlying consensus in Nazi policy could be focused. As activator, the vision embodied by Hitler served as a stimulant to action in the different agencies of the Nazi movement itself, where pent-up energies and unfulfilled social expectations could be met by activism carried out in Hitler's name to bring about the aims of leader and party. But beyond the movement, it also spurred initiatives within the state bureaucracy, industry and the armed forces, and among the professionals such as teachers, doctors or lawyers, where the motif of national redemption could offer an open door to the push for realization of long-cherished ambitions felt to have been held back or damaged by the Weimar system. In all these ways, the utopian vision bound up with the Führer, undefined and largely undefinable, provided guidelines for action, which were given concrete meaning and specific content by the voluntary push of a wide variety of often competing agencies of the regime. The most important, most vigorous, and most closely related to Hitler's ideological imperatives of these was, of course, the SS, where the idea or vision offered the scope for ever new initiatives in a ceaseless dynamic of discrimination, repression, and persecution. Perhaps most important of all, as enabler, Hitler's authority gave implicit backing and sanction to those whose actions, however inhumane, however radical, fell within the general and vague ideological remit of furthering the aims of the Führer. Building a national community, preparing for the showdown with Bolshevism, purifying the Reich of its political and biological or racial enemies, and removing Jews from Germany, offered free license to initiatives which, unless inopportune or counterproductive, were more or less guaranteed sanction from above. The collapse in civilized standards which began in the spring of 1933 and the spiraling radicalization of discrimination and persecution that followed were not only unobstructed by, but invariably found legitimation in the highest authority in the land. Crucial to this progress into barbarism was the fact that in 1933 the barriers to state-sanctioned measures of gross inhumanity were removed almost overnight. What had previously been unthinkable suddenly became feasible. Opportunities rapidly presented themselves, and they were readily grasped. The sterilization law of July 1933 is an early instance of such a dropping of barriers. Ideas long cherished by proponents of eugenics in biological social engineering found all at once a climate in which they could be put into practice without the constraints still taken for granted in proposals, in themselves inhumane enough, but still confined to voluntary sterilization, for legislation put forward by the German Doctors' Association just weeks before Hitler's takeover of power. By 1939, the erosion of civilized values had developed far enough to allow for the possibilities of liquidating as useless life those deemed to be harmful to the propagation of healthy comrades of the people. And, illustrating how far the disintegration of the machinery of government had progressed, when written authorization was needed, it took the form not of a government law or decree, which Hitler expressly ruled out, but a few lines typed on Hitler's private-headed paper. The few lines were enough to seal the fate of over 70,000 mentally ill and physically disabled persons in Germany by mid-1941, in the so-called Euthanasia Action. After 1939, in the parts of Poland annexed by Germany and incorporated into the Reich, Prompted by Hitler's exhortation to brutal methods in a racial struggle which was not to be confined by legal considerations, the constraints on inhumanity to the Polish population and, of course, to the Jewish minority in Poland, disappeared completely. Hitler needed to do nothing to force the pace of the rapidly escalating barbarism. He could leave it to the satraps on the spot. Characteristically, he said he asked no more of his Gauleiter in the East than that after ten years they should be able to announce that their territories were completely German.
The invitation was in itself sufficient to spark a competition in brutality, though allegedly this was the opposite of what Hitler wanted. Between the arch-rival provincial chieftains, Albert Forster in West Prussia and Arthur Greiser in the Wartegau, to be able to report to the Führer in the shortest time that the racial struggle had been won, that complete Germanization had been achieved. The license which Hitler as enabler offered to such party bosses in the East can be illustrated graphically through the initiative taken by Greiser in May 1942, recommending the liquidation of 35,000 Poles suffering from incurable tuberculosis. In the event, Greiser's suggestion encountered difficulties. Objections were raised that it would be hard to maintain secrecy. Reference was made here to the impact of the earlier euthanasia program in Germany itself, and was likely, therefore, to arouse unrest among the Polish population, as well as presenting foreign propaganda with a gift. It was regarded as necessary to consult Hitler himself if the action were to go ahead. Greiser's enlightening response ran, I myself do not believe that the Führer needs to be asked again in this matter especially since at our last discussion with regard to the Jews, he told me that I could proceed with these according to my own judgment. This judgment had already, in fact, been to recommend to Himmler the special treatment, that is, killing, of 100,000 Jews in the Wartegau, the start of the final solution there. Greiser thought of himself throughout as the direct agent and instrument of the Führer in the crusade to create his model Gau. Any hindrance was met by the claim that his mandate to Germanize the Wartegau rested on plenipotentiary powers bestowed on him personally by the Führer himself. The relationship between the Führer, serving as a symbol for actionism and ideological radicalization, and the drive from below on the part of so many agencies, non-Nazi as well as Nazi, to put the vision or parts of it into operation as practical policy, is neatly captured in the sentiments of a routine speech of a Nazi functionary in 1934. Everyone who has the opportunity to observe it knows that the Führer can hardly dictate from above everything which he intends to realize sooner or later. On the contrary, up till now, everyone with a post in the new Germany has worked best when he has, so to speak, worked towards the Führer. Very often, and in many spheres, it has been the case, in previous years as well, that individuals have simply waited for orders and instructions. Unfortunately, the same will be true in the future but in fact it is the duty of everybody to try to work towards the Führer, along the lines he would wish. Anyone who makes mistakes will notice it soon enough, but anyone who really works towards the Führer, along his lines and towards his goal, will certainly both now and in the future one day have the finest reward in the form of the sudden legal confirmation of his work. These comments hint at the way charismatic authority functioned in the Third Reich anticipation of Hitler's presumed wishes and intentions as guidelines for action in the certainty of approval and confirmation for actions which accorded with those wishes and intentions. Working towards the Führer may be taken in a literal, direct sense with reference to party functionaries, in the way it was meant in the extract cited. In the case of the SS, the ideological executive of the Führer's will, the tasks associated with working towards the Führer offered endless scope for barbarous initiatives, and with them institutional expansion, power, prestige, and enrichment. The career of Adolf Eichmann, rising from a menial role in a key policy area to the manager of the final solution, offers a classic example. But the notion of working towards the Führer could be interpreted too in a more indirect sense where ideological motivation was secondary or perhaps even absent altogether, but where the objective function of the actions was nevertheless to further the potential for implementation of the goals which Hitler embodied. Individuals seeking material gain through career advancement in party or state bureaucracy, the small businessman aiming to destroy a competitor through a slur on his Aryan credentials, or ordinary citizens settling scores with neighbours by denouncing them to the Gestapo, were all, in a way, working towards the Führer. Doctors rushing to nominate patients of asylums for the euthanasia program in the interests of a eugenically healthier people. Lawyers and judges zealous to cooperate in the dismantling of legal safeguards in order to cleanse society of criminal elements and undesirables. Business leaders anxious to profit from preparations for war and, once in war, 
by the grabbing of booty and exploitation of foreign slave labor. Thrusting technocrats and scientists, seeking to extend power and influence through jumping on the bandwagon of technological experimentation and modernization. Non-Nazi military leaders, keen to build up a modern army and restore Germany's hegemony in Central Europe. And old-fashioned conservatives with a distaste for the Nazis, but an even greater fear and dislike of the Bolsheviks. All were through their many and varied forms of collaboration, at least indirectly, working towards the Führer. The result was the unstoppable radicalization of the system and the gradual emergence of policy objectives closely related to the ideological imperatives represented by Hitler. Time after time, Hitler set the barbaric tone, whether in hate-filled public speeches giving a green light to discriminatory action against Jews and other enemies of the state, or in closed addresses to Nazi functionaries or military leaders where he laid down, for example, the brutal guidelines for the occupation of Poland and for Operation Barbarossa. But there was never any shortage of willing helpers, far from being confined to party activists, ready to work towards the Führer, to put the mandate into operation. Once the war, intrinsic to Nazism and Hitler's vision, had begun, the barbarism inspired by that vision, and now unchecked by any remnants of legal constraint or concern for public sensitivities, plumbed unimaginable depths. But there was no prospect, nor could there have been, of the new order settling into a system of government. Competing fiefdoms, not structured governments, formed the grim face of Nazi rule in the occupied territories. The rapaciousness and destructiveness present from the start within Germany now became hugely magnified and intensified, with the conquered peoples rather than the Germans themselves as the main victims. Through the metaphor of working towards the Führer, I have tried to suggest here that the vision embodied in Hitler's leadership claim served to funnel a variety of social motivations, at times contradictory and conflicting, into furthering, intentionally or unwittingly, Nazi aims closely associated with Hitler's own ideological obsessions. The concept of charismatic authority in this interpretation can be taken as useful in helping to depict the bonds with Hitler forged by various social and political forces, enabling the form of personalized power which he represented to free itself from all institutional constraints and to legitimize the destructive dynamic intrinsic to the Nazi gamble for European hegemony through war. The model of charismatic authority, which I have suggested is applicable to the Hitlerian but not to the Stalinist dictatorship, not only helps to characterize the appeal of a quasi-messianic personalized form of rule embodying national unity and rebirth in the context of the collapsed legitimation of the democratic system of Weimar, it also, given the irreconcilable tension between charismatic authority and bureaucratic rule in the Third Reich, offers insights into the inexorable erosion of anything resembling a system of domination capable of reproducing itself. Within this behemoth, a governmental disorder, working towards the Führer amounted to a selective push for the radicalization and implementation of those ideological lines most closely associated with Hitler's known broad aims, which could gradually take shape as policy objectives rather than distant goals. Above all, the charismatic model fits a form of domination which could never settle down into normality or routine draw a line under its achievements and come to rest as conservative authoritarianism, but was compelled instead to sustain the dynamism and to push ceaselessly and relentlessly for new attainments in the quest to fulfill its chimeric goal. The longer the Hitler regime lasted, the more megalomaniacal the aims, the more boundless the destructiveness became. But the longer the regime went on, the less it resembled a governmental system with the capacity to reproduce itself. The inherent instability of charismatic authority in this manifestation, where the specific content of the charismatic claim was rooted in the utopian goal of national redemption through racial purification, war and conquest, implied then not only destructiveness but also self-destructiveness. Hitler's own suicidal tendencies could in this sense be said to reflect the inbuilt incapacity of his form of authoritarian rule to survive and reproduce itself. 2. 
Ideologue and Propagandist Hitler, in light of his speeches, writings and orders, 1925-1928 to The difficulty inherent in locating and assembling the scattered texts authored by Adolf Hitler is probably the principal factor that has impeded progress on their collation and publication. A full half-century after the end of the Third Reich, when the present project is targeted to be completed, we will finally have a scholarly edition of Hitler's extant speeches and writings dating from the period between his entry onto the political stage and his seizure of power on January the 30th, 1933. In perusing the now available volumes of this important work, covering the period between the refounding of the NSDAP, National Socialist German Workers' Party, in February 1925, and the Reichstag election of May 1928, it is sometimes difficult to keep in mind just how insignificant the Hitlerian movement actually was during those years. It constituted nothing more than a tiny, inconsequential, marginal phenomenon on the political scene. At that time, the Weimar Republic was experiencing its so-called Golden Age, years marked by an economic upswing and Stresemann's successes in foreign policy and social political progress there appeared to be a consolidation afoot in the unquiet republic. Even when it came to Bavaria, where the NSDAP had done better at the polling booths than anywhere else in Germany, both the semi-monthly official reports of the district superintendents and the daily press reflect just how marginal the Nazi movement was as a political factor during this phase. It is essential to keep this salient fact in mind when embarking on an analysis of the present volumes. The significance of this edition, then, lies principally in its value in assisting us in grasping the internal development of the NSDAP in a period when it had no realistic expectations of gaining power and was initially bogged down in a welter of serious internal disputes and wrangling. In particular, the edition provides us the first opportunity to systematically trace the development of Hitler's political ideas during the mid-1920s. The edition begins with the refounding of the NSDAP on February the 26th, 1925. The early difficulties Hitler encountered in overcoming the fragmentation of the old party, which had broken up in 1924, and the various rivalries in the far-right folk national, Völkisch, camp, were quite substantial, especially since the Bavarian authorities had issued a ban in March 1925 prohibiting Hitler from speaking in public. This muzzling had temporarily robbed him of his most powerful weapon, namely his prodigious talents for demagogy. The first part of the edition illuminates these problems. The slow and laborious construction of the party base in Saxony, Thuringen and Württemberg. Hitler's confrontation with his rivals Greifer and Rivenfloh in northern Germany. And above all, the conflicts in his own party ranks. These disputes involve not only the controversial figures in Hitler's Munich circle and elsewhere in Bavaria, particularly Hermann Esser and Julius Streicher. They also resulted from discordant interpretations of the direction of foreign policy thinking in the movement, differences of opinion regarding the relation of the SDAP to other Völkisch groups, widely divergent views on strategy when it came to the burning issues of the day, such as the dispossession of the princes, and even possible changes in the party programme, changes that might, after all, also have created a challenge to Hitler's position and authority. The present edition enables us to trace better the course of these disputes, with one proviso. They are viewed only from Hitler's point of view. During these months, Hitler was largely occupied with the task of solidifying his base of authority within the National Socialist Movement. He insisted that party central headquarters should remain in Munich, where his personal power remained unassailable. He defended Esser and Streicher, the Frankenführer, leader of the Franks, so indispensable for the party stronghold of Franconia, against their critics. Apart from that, Hitler's main goal at this stage was to eliminate his rivals in the Völkisch camp. During his 1924 Landsberg incarceration, he had consciously kept aloof from the fragmented folk national movement and watched from the sidelines while his political rivals foundered. None could gain the upper hand. Even before the abortive Beer Hall Putsch, 
there were unmistakable first signs of a personal cult in the making, a tendency that rapidly intensified after the propaganda coup of the Munich trial. In his capacity as a propagandist and mass agitator, Hitler was absolutely necessary for the movement. Although until March 1927 he had been banned in Bavaria from speaking at public meetings, he was permitted to address closed party gatherings. According to his own judgment, after the first few weeks he was able even to capitalize on the ban, further enhancing his prestige. It is well known that Hitler's speech at the party leaders' convention in Bamberg on February the 14th, 1926, unfortunately reconstructable only on the basis of a brief newspaper report, was a milestone on the road to consolidation of his authority and the rejection of the reformist tendencies espoused by Gregor Strasser, Josef Goebbels and others. There were the first initial indications of the development of a Führer party, in which the guiding idea was embodied by the Führer rather than enshrined in the mutable planks of a party program. By the time of the party plenum on May 22, 1926, Hitler had gained the upper hand. He spoke triumphantly at that meeting about the internal consolidation of the movement and was able, with some justification, to contend that the homogeneity of the party had been restored. The Weimar Party Convention held shortly thereafter, at which the party program of 1920 was declared unalterable, underscored his dominant position. The Führer cult found its external expression in the Hitler salute, from then obligatory in the movement. The next party convention, held in Nuremberg in August 1927, proved to what extent the myth of the Führer had become the fulcrum of a movement in which the idea and party leader were inseparably fused. All other folk national groupings were largely sapped of their energy, if not in a state of total collapse. These sectarian quarrels and bickerings would probably have continued to remain a sideshow for the development of Weimar democracy had it not been for the worldwide economic depression that took hold in 1929. Nonetheless, this was a phase in which the Nazi movement was able to successfully expand its organization and mobilize a relatively large core of activists, despite the still feeble power of attraction the movement possessed for the broader electorate. In this way, and far better than before 1923, an organizational and ideological basis was forged. It was that foundation that enabled the movement, beginning in 1929, to exploit successfully the death throes of the Republic. The edition reflects salient aspects of the organizational structure and build-up of the Nazi movement as contained in the orders decreed by Hitler as party leader. However, its major importance undoubtedly lies in the fact that it provides us with the first possibility to undertake a systematic and chronological investigation of the path taken by Hitler's own thinking during this crucial period. In 1927, he himself commented on one occasion that he required more than two hours to fully expound his ideological program. In this succinct overview, I hope to summarize the essential points with greater brevity. A volume published some years ago sheds ample light on the development of Hitler's ideas up to 1924. The global rabble-rousing anti-Semitism, which is the dominant chord in virtually all of Hitler's early speeches, was initially aimed at the Jews primarily in their alleged role as financiers, capitalists, black marketeers, and profiteers. In contrast, there had been a shift in perspective by the mid-1920s. Under the impact of the Russian Civil War, identification of the Jews with Bolshevism had largely supplanted the emphasis on Jewish finance capital in Hitler's thinking. Or, to put it more precisely, Jewish Bolshevism had become his second main target and had even been transposed to center stage. However, beginning in about 1922, there was another shift. Anti-Marxism gradually began to emerge as a stronger factor, outweighing anti-Semitism. Though Hitler left no doubt that in his eyes the struggle against Marxism was indeed identical with that against the Jews. A second change in Hitler's worldview in this period was the development of the concept of Lebensraum, living space, which replaced the initially rather conventionally espoused idea of colonialism by continental conceptions of conquest over Russia with England's assistance. Nonetheless, the volume edited by Jekyll and Kuhn contains only a single document pertinent to this question, from the autumn of 1922, 
a geopolitical idea which was soon to assume a central role in the Hitlerian conceptual scheme. Finally, the Jekyll Kuhn edition shows that, as far as I can judge, Hitler's own self-image was undergoing a process of change by 1922 to 1923. Albrecht Tyrrell has stressed just how crucial the period of incarceration in Landsberg had been for Hitler's shifting self-image, i.e., for the insight he gained that he was not just the drummer preparing the way for a future great leader, but was himself that great leader for the future of Germany. Yet that specific idea is present at least in rudimentary form even earlier than his imprisonment, in speeches given by Hitler in 1922 and 1923, when, evidently influenced by the example of Mussolini, he repeatedly referred to the institution of the heroic leader and the importance of the historical personality, increasingly emphasizing its centrality, at times, it would appear, with obvious reference to his own person. It can be argued that by 1924, the central core of Hitler's world view, history as racial struggle and the annihilation of both Judaism, whatever that might mean in concrete terms, and its most dangerous political and ideological manifestation, Marxism, was a conception firmly planted in his thinking. By contrast, the notion of Lebensraum, although already broached, as yet occupied no special position within the matrix of his thought, and the idea of the heroic Führer, was still not fully crystallized. It is well known that in Mein Kampf these ideas are bundled together into an amalgam, less so in the first volume, issued in July 1925, than in the second, published in December 1926. The second volume was written in 1925 to 1926, and thus during the period covered by the present edition. Immediately thereafter, in the summer of 1928, Hitler dictated the text of his so-called Zweites Buch, second book which dealt far more than Mein Kampf with questions of foreign policy and Raumfragen, territorial issues. A major attraction of the present edition is that it covers this specific period in the development of Hitler's ideas, namely the years spanning the second volume of Mein Kampf and the Zweites Buch. A striking feature is Hitler's clearly deepening involvement with the question of territory and land policy, during the period from 1926 to 1928, even though he expressly used the term Lebensraum only once, as far as I can discern, namely on March the 30th, 1928. Up to the end of 1926, Hitler touched only rarely on the question of land policy. In a speech on December the 16th, 1925, he characterized the acquisition of land and soil as the best way to mold German fate in economic terms. At the Weimar Party Convention in July 1926, he picked up the issue once again. Yet it was not until about March 1927 that it began increasingly to appear in his speeches as a central component. Between the summer of 1927 and May 1928, Hitler specifically underscored the Raumfrage in almost all his major speeches, ad nauseam, one might add, utilizing virtually the same words again and again. Several passages from these speeches are likewise repeated nearly verbatim at key points in his Zweites Buch. The content can be summarized as follows. German resurgence must travel the path of economic upswing. The prerequisite for this is a solution to the shortage of territory, Raumnot, which can be attained only by the use of force. Hitler extols Eastern colonization in the Middle Ages, imperialism, and the principle of conquest by the sword. Although he rarely mentions Russia, the ultimate aim of this territorial policy is unmistakably clear. His belief in social Darwinism and its racial theory of history is an iron principle. The weaker must fall so that the stronger can live. In his view, three values remain decisive when it comes to the fate of a people. A. The value of blood or race. B the value of personality, and C, its warring spirit or drive for self-preservation. These three values, embodied in the Aryan race, were, in Hitler's view, mortally endangered by the three vices of Jewish Marxism, democracy, pacifism, and internationalism. By using the documentation under discussion, it can be shown for the first time that the ideas dominating the Zweitersbuch 
including the issue of South Tyrol and his interest in the growing economic power of the United States, were already present in basic form a year earlier and were repeatedly broached in Hitler's speeches in 1927 to 1928. Emphasis on the importance of personality played a central role in Hitler's rhetoric. The theme of personality and of the role of the Führer is a recurrent leitmotif in all the speeches and writings collected in this edition. Thus, his strong emphasis in 1925 to 1926 on the unity of the movement that can only be achieved through a Führer is not surprising. In the speech on the occasion of the refounding of the NSDAP on February the 27th, 1925, for example, Hitler views his role as Führer in bringing together again all those who now are diverging. The art of the Führer in assembling the stones of the mosaic, the Führer as focal point or as preserver of the idea, were repeatedly underscored, especially in the initial months after the party's refounding. Even later, Hitler never missed an opportunity to stress the importance of personality and thus indirectly the myth of the Führer, functioning as the central integrating mechanism of the movement. Again and again he hinted at his own claims to grandeur and greatness, barely disguised by allusions in particular to Bismarck and Frederick the Great. One example is his remarks on Bismarck in May 1926. It was necessary to implant the national idea within the masses of the people, and a giant had to complete this task as lengthy applause indicated the implications of this remark were not lost on Hitler's audience. Quite naturally, the edition has little new to offer when it comes to the development of Hitler's anti-Semitism. As is well known, hatred for the Jews was far more than a mere propaganda theme for Hitler. Nonetheless, the consciously tactical employment of anti-Semitism within the framework of propaganda purposes is in clear evidence here. Thus, for example, Hitler made no mention whatsoever of the Jews in his notorious speech delivered before the Hamburg National Club in February 1926. The sole aim of the Nazi movement, he underscored then, was the total and complete annihilation of Marxism. This contrasts with remarks made when speaking before his own audience in the Munich beer halls, where almost every speech was replete with brutal attacks on Jews as the masterminds behind financial capital, polluters of the people, and adherents of the subversive doctrine of Marxism. With mounting emphasis on the issue of territory, beginning in 1927 to 1928, there is a slight drop in the frequency of expressly anti-Semitic tirades, which now often have a somewhat ritualistic ring. In part, they are replaced by emphasis on Marxism as the principal adversary. Yet this certainly did not mean that there had been any changes with respect to the pathological hatred for the Jews that Hitler harboured. For Hitler, the destruction of Marxism and the destruction of the Jews were identical goals. The Jew is, and remains, the world enemy, he asserted in typical form in February 1927. And his weapon, Marxism, is a plague afflicting mankind. The positive content of the many hundreds of speeches and writings reproduced in this edition is extremely scant. The sole social component of the idea consisted in doing away with the divided class society of a nationalistic but purportedly debilitated and decadent bourgeoisie and a socialist proletariat polluted by Marxism, to fuse nationalism and socialism and to overcome the class antagonisms between head workers and hand workers by the establishment of a community of struggle. It was envisaged that this would generate the new spirit, which would in turn guarantee the success of the people's struggle for existence. Over and over again, Hitler declared that he had no interest in day-to-day -day politics and issues. In actual fact, what he formulated were distant goals. At this juncture, such goals probably had a more visionary or even metaphorical meaning for his audiences, far removed from any basis in reality. In this voluminous edition, one can search in vain for any suggestion of a medium-term, rational policy and hierarchy of priorities. Clarity and precise objectives were neither desired nor possible. The sole and exclusive goal was mobilization for the struggle for power. Naturally, Hitler likewise was at a loss when it came to exactly how the utopian final aim might be achieved. 
the conquest of Lebensraum could only mean aggression against Russia. However, in the mid-1920s, it was probably little more than a militant slogan for Hitler's audiences, though not necessarily when it came to Hitler himself. Even regarding the Jews, the real aim remained fuzzy. It is true that he called for chasing that pack of Jews from our fatherland with an iron broom. Yet elsewhere his remarks suggest that perhaps not all Jews should be arbitrarily expelled from Germany. The Jew had to be shown, he stated in February 1928, that we're the bosses here. If he behaves well, he can stay. If not, then out with him. And even the fundamental prerequisite for racial struggle, the overcoming of Marxism in Germany and the establishment of a socially and racially homogeneous folk community, Volksgemeinschaft, remained at this point nothing more than a utopian vision. One that, from the vantage of the time, appeared practicable solely in the eyes of absolute fanatics. What Hitler had to offer in contrast with all other Völkisch leaders was an absolutely unaltering and solidly girded ideological vision. This was a vision that derived its power and persuasiveness precisely from its simplicity, internal consistency and comprehensiveness, an all-encompassing character that integrated apparently contrary and contradictory elements. Hitler combined the conviction of a fanatical believer with a demagogic talent unparalleled in the National Socialist camp. As the self-proclaimed adherent of a fixed world view, he was always able to present his public with a crude choice of either or, black or white, victory or total destruction. He appealed, of course, masterfully and quite consciously, to his audience's basest instincts. In his speech at the Hamburg National Club, he declared that the masses did not want intellectual ideas, rather, what they desired was a faith, because the broad masses of people are blind and stupid and don't know what they're doing. The masses have a primitive view. What abides is the feeling of hatred. Precisely by dint of his matchless abilities to stir up hatred and his talents as a demagogue, with persuasiveness nourished by an unshakable worldview, Hitler proved able by 1928 to consolidate his preeminent position within the extremist folk national camp and to strengthen his colossal aura as a Führer among his followers. In conclusion, I wish to point out briefly what I believe this new edition contains that is especially relevant for the current discussion among historians about Hitler and the Third Reich. The edition makes it abundantly clear that, notwithstanding the scant intellectual substance and disgusting moral content of his ideas, Hitler had, by the mid-1920s, developed a consistent and coherent world view that was far more than mere hollow, propagandistic phrase-mongering. The fact that Hitler was nothing but an unprincipled opportunist, as the Taiwan thesis advanced by Rauschning and still in occasional currency contends, appears to be untenable, as does the reductionist notion that his ideas were nothing but propaganda. Moreover, such an interpretative tack is hardly in a position to grasp Hitler's personal motivation and the psychological forces that powered it. After perusing this new edition of materials, I believe there can no longer be any doubt that Hitler was both a profoundly dedicated ideologue and a masterful propagandist, and there was no contradiction whatsoever between the two. In this sense, the edition strengthens those interpretations based on the assumption that it is necessary to accord Hitler's personal ideological goals central significance particularly in connection with developments in the realm of racial and foreign policy in the Third Reich. Hitler cannot merely be reduced to the function of a system that was growing cumulatively more and more radical. On the other hand, what is contained here is no blueprint for rule, if blueprint is supposed to signify something other than the formulation of distant utopian goals. Concentrating on Hitler's personal worldview, no matter how fanatically he was inspired and motivated by it, cannot readily serve to explain why a society, which hardly shared the arcanum of Hitler's philosophy, gave him such growing support from 1929 on, in proportions that rose with astonishing rapidity. Nor can it account for the reasons why, from 1933 on, the non-national socialist elites were prepared to play more and more into his hands in the process of cumulative radicalization. 
It is evident that an addition of Hitler's speeches and writings from the period 1925 to 1928 can contribute only indirectly to explanations of such a complex problem. Nonetheless, it does suggest that the interpretative approach adopted by Martin Brostat could be usefully pursued and expanded. In that view, Hitler's secret vision was able to serve as an orientation for action, or even as an ideological metaphor for the masses, who were prepared, without sharing his fanatical convictions, to work towards the Führer in accordance with his wishes, whatever their underlying motives and reasons. An interpretation of the Third Reich currently in vogue tends to portray Hitler as a conscious modernizer, who had a more or less coherent program for the revolutionary restructuring of German society. That view is intended to be a contribution to the historicizing of Hitler and National Socialism. After examining more than 1,350 pages of his speeches, writings and orders from this period, and I must add that aside from his biting sarcasm, there is not a single joke in this entire corpus, I am unable to see any basis for such a reading. Hitler's social idea remained totally diffuse. Destruction of Marxism, yes, but this is followed by a notion little more concrete than the aforementioned overcoming of the division between nationalism and socialism, and the creation of a Volksgemeinschaft based on race and struggle. Admittedly, there are indications in 1927 to 1928 that Hitler admired the motorization and advanced technology of the United States. But he argued again and again that Germany's possibilities for competing with, and ultimately defeating, the United States rested on a geographical prerequisite, territorial conquest by the sword in continental Europe. To my mind, this is the most primitive form of 19th century social Darwinistic imperialism. I am at a loss to discover anything modern in such a notion. Hitler promised modernization solely in the sense of a society transformed by struggle, war and conquest. From my perspective, it is an abuse of concepts to present this as some sort of intentional social modernization. Yes, Germany's modernization did in fact partially result from Hitler's war, but to trace this process of modernization in any way back to Hitler's intentions is, I would counsel, highly misleading. Hitler did view himself as a revolutionary, but his revolution was strictly and exclusively racial, a revolution of annihilation. What makes the present edition so significant is that it documents a decisive stage not only in the shaping of Hitler's thoughts, but also in the transformation of the NSDAP into a Führer movement that attached itself increasingly to the visionary goals embodied in the person of the charismatic leader. As a mechanism of integration, mobilization, and legitimation, the Hitler myth was indispensable for the unfolding dynamics of the NSDAP. On the basis of this edition, its development as a charismatic community, Max Weber, can be clearly attested. The functional consequence is implicit. Already as early as February 1925, Hitler stressed that he could not create unity as a party within the party. The building up of a colossal, inviolable nimbus surrounding the Führer, the necessity to protect his prestige by keeping his distance from any and every conflict, and the concomitant need to maintain a distance from the daily affairs of the party, and later from the daily business of government, to say nothing about his personal preferences, necessarily had to result in an imminent and unbridgeable contradiction in the Third Reich. This was the contradiction between the legal rational, i.e. the legally constituted bureaucratic state on the one hand, and the destructive and ultimately self-destructive system of Führer rule founded on an extra-legal, charismatic basis on the other hand. Of course, the latter is far removed in time from the period covered by the materials in this edition. It will, however, be fascinating to observe in subsequent volumes just how these perspectives develop in the years of the Nazi rise to power, beginning in 1929. Yet even for these later years, the reader should bear in mind that Hitler and the NSDAP were in no position to achieve state power solely by dint of their own strength, and that the actions of the non-national socialist power brokers, little influenced by Hitler's personal worldview, were of crucial importance for that ascent to power. It should be recalled that even the massive influx of new members into the NSDAP was not owing primarily to Hitler's Weltanschauung. Finally, 
It is important to keep in mind that it was not so much National Socialism which sentenced the First German Republic to death. On the contrary, the undermining of the Weimar democracy was a key prerequisite for the rise of the NSDAP. Even in the face of the unsettling neo-Nazi phenomena that can be observed in the aftermath of events since 1989, there would appear to be little likelihood for a repetition of that specific structural context which facilitated a takeover of state power by a rabid demagogue and racial ideologue, as we encounter him in this edition. Unless a totally unforeseen catastrophe should befall Europe. The present edition, and the project of which it is a part, will make a substantial contribution to a more profound understanding of Hitler's ideas and actions in the period preceding the takeover of state power. The gap between the paltriness of his ideas and Hitler's dynamic effectiveness will remain a puzzling factor. Perhaps this suggests that any future study about the man should be conceived less as a classic biography than as a social history of Hitler. 3. Improvised Genocide? The Emergence of the Final Solution in the Wartegau The Wartegau, officially the Reichsgau Vaterland, with its capital in Posen, Poznania, was the largest of three areas of western Poland annexed to the German Reich after the defeat of Poland in 1939. In the genesis of the Final Solution it plays a pivotal role. Some of the first major deportations of Jews took place from the Wartegau. The first big ghetto was established on the territory of the Wartegau, at Wuj, which the Nazis renamed Litzmannstadt. In autumn 1941, the first German Jews to be deported at the spearhead of the combing-out process of European Jewry were dispatched to the Wartegau. The possibility of liquidating ghettoized Jews had by then already been explicitly raised for the first time in the summer of 1941, significantly by Nazi leaders in the Wartegau. The first mobile gassing units to be deployed against the Jews operated in the Wartegau in the closing months of 1941. And the systematic murder of the Jews began in early December 1941 in the first extermination camp, actually a gas van station, established at Chelmno on the Nair in the Wartegau. Despite the centrality of the Wartegau to the unfolding of what the Nazis called the final solution of the Jewish question, the systematic attempt to exterminate the whole of European Jewry, the precise course of development of Nazi anti-Jewish policy in the Wartegau, though mentioned in every account of the origins of the final solution, has not been exhaustively explored. To focus upon the Wartegau in the genesis of the final solution can, however, helped to contribute towards answering the central questions which have come to dominate scholarly debate on the emergence of systematic genocide. How and when the decision to wipe out the Jews of Europe came about, whether at the moment of German triumph in midsummer 1941, or later in the year when the growing probability of prolonged war in the East ruled out an envisaged territorial solution. Hitler's own role in the shift to a policy of outright genocide and whether the final solution followed a single order or set of directives issued from Berlin as the culmination of a long-held program of the Nazi leadership, or unfolded in haphazard and piecemeal fashion, instigated by local initiatives of regional Nazi bosses, improvised as a largely ad hoc response to the logistical difficulties of a Jewish problem they had created for themselves, and only gradually congealing into a full-scale program for genocide. The deficiencies and ambiguities of the evidence, enhanced by the language of euphemism and camouflage used by the Nazis even among themselves when dealing with the extermination of the Jews, mean that absolute certainty in answering these complex questions cannot be achieved. Close assessment of the Wartegau evidence, it is the contention of this essay, nevertheless sheds light on developments and contributes towards an interpretation which rests on the balance of probabilities. When the rapidly improvised boundaries of the newly created Reichsgau Posen, from the 29th of January 1940, Reichsgau Vaterland, or for short, the Wartegau, taking its name from the Warte, the central river of the province, were eventually settled, they included an extensive area centering upon the large industrial town of Łódź, which had formerly been in Congress Poland and had never been part of Prussian Poland. 
the borders of the Reich were thereby extended some 150 to 200 kilometers eastwards of the boundaries existing before 1918. For Nazi aims at solving the Jewish question, the significance of this extension was that it brought within the territory of the Wartegau, which was to be ruthlessly Germanized, an area containing over 350,000 Jews, some 8% of the total population of the region. The most important figures in the Wartegau scene after 1939 were Arthur Greiser, Reich governor, and at the same time Gauleiter of the Nazi party, and Wilhelm Kuppe, the SS and police chief of the region. Greiser, born in the Posen province in 1897, was utterly ruthless and single-minded in his determination to make his region the model Gau of Nazi rule. He called upon a special commission given to him by Hitler personally whenever he encountered difficulties or obstructions. He also stood high in Himmler's favour and was given on the 30th of January 1942 the honorary rank of Obergruppenführer in the SS. Kopper, born in Hildesheim in 1896, nominally subordinate to Greiser, but in practice possessing a high degree of independence as the leading SS functionary in the region, had effective control over deportation policy in the Wartegau. He was well up in Himmler's good books and had the ready ear of the Reichsführer SS. At the same date as Greiser's promotion within the SS, the 30th of January 1942, and precisely at the point when the killing of the Wartegau Jews had begun, Kopper was promoted by Himmler to the rank of SS Obergruppenführer and General der Polizei. Like Greiser, he was notorious for his cold ruthlessness. The tone for the administration of Poland was provided by Hitler himself. Admiral Canaris pointed out to General Keitel on the 12th of September 1939 that he had knowledge that extensive executions, Fusilierungen, were planned for Poland and that the nobility and clergy especially were to be exterminated, ausgerottet. Keitel replied that this had already been decided by the Führer. The Wehrmacht had to accept the racial extermination and political cleansing by the SS and the Gestapo, even if it did not itself want anything to do with it. That was why, alongside the military commanders, civilian commanders were being appointed, to whom the racial extermination, Volkssturms Ausrottung, would fall. On the 17th of October, Hitler spoke to a small group of those leaders most directly concerned of a hard racial struggle which did not allow any legal constraints or comply with principles otherwise upheld. The new Reich territories would have to be purged of Jews, Polacks and rabble, and the remainder of the former Poland, the General Gouvernement, would serve as the dumping ground for such groups of the population. Hitler was involved at an early stage in schemes for a solution to the Jewish question in Poland, though the ideas themselves emanated from Himmler, presumably in close collaboration with the chief of the security police, Reinhard Heydrich. At a meeting on the 14th of September 1939, Heydrich explained his own views on the Jewish problem in Poland to the assembled security police leaders, adding that suggestions from the Reichsführer were being placed before Hitler which only the Führer could decide. These were presumably the suggestions which became incorporated in Heydrich's directions to leaders of the Einsatzgruppen on the 21st of September 1939 for the concentration of Jews in the larger towns as a preparatory measure for a subsequent final goal, to be kept strictly secret. The final goal was at this time evidently the eventual deportation of the Jews from Reich territory and from Poland to the intended reservation east of the Vistula as Hitler himself indicated on the 29th of September to Alfred Rosenberg. Hitler's views accorded precisely with guidelines which Heydrich drew up on that same day. The intention was to create a type of Reich ghetto to the east of Warsaw and around Lublin, in which all the political and Jewish elements who are to be moved out of the future German Gauer will be accommodated. The plans for Poland, as they were gradually congealing in September and early October 1939, amounted, therefore, to a threefold division. Of those parts to be incorporated into the Reich and eventually wholly Germanized and sealed off by an eastern fortification, of a German-run foreign-speaking Gau under Hans Frank outside a proposed east wall centering on Krakow and coming to be called the General Government as a type of buffer zone, and of a Jewish settlement to the east of this area into which all Jews from Poland and Germany would be dumped. 
The initial expectations, both of a Jewish reservation in the Lublin area and of the mass deportation of German Jews to the general government rapidly, however, proved illusory. The organizational and administrative difficulties involved had been hopelessly underestimated. Eichmann's immediate attempt in October 1939 to deport Vienna's Jews to the Lublin area was rapidly stopped, and in the event, apart from small-scale deportations from Stettin and Schneidemühl in Pomerania to the Lublin area in February and March 1940, an SS initiative which Frank's administration could not cope with, prompting a protest from the general governor and a temporary ban announced by Göring on the 24th of March 1940 on deportation of Jews into Frank's domain, Jews from the Altreich, Germany of the pre-1938 boundaries, were not deported to the east until autumn 1941. From the measures for occupied Poland decided by the central Nazi leadership in September 1939, it can be seen that Hitler set the tone and provided the ultimate authority for the brutality of racial policy and that he had far-reaching but imprecise notions of future developments drawing at least in part on policy initiatives suggested by Himmler, which rapidly proved unfeasible and impracticable. Precisely because Hitler's barbarous imperatives offered no more than broad but loosely formulated aims and sanctioned for action of the most brutal kind, they opened the door to the wildest initiatives from agencies of party and state, and above all, of course, from the SS. The authorities on the spot in the Wartegau did not, in fact, reckon that they would have too much difficulty in tackling the Jewish question, and consequently grossly underestimated the self-created logistical problems. The view prevailed that the real problem was Polish, not Jewish. At the outset of the occupation, the Jews were seen by the Wartegau leadership as a sideshow. The main issue in the Wartegau was thought to be less the Jewish than the Polish question. Initially, it seemed that things were running more or less according to expectation. In his new capacity as Reich Kommissar for the strengthening of German nationhood under powers bestowed on him by Hitler on the 7th of October, Himmler, on the 30th of October, ordered all Jews to be cleared out of the incorporated territories in the months November 1939 to February 1940. On the basis of the discussions on the 8th of November in 1939 in Krakow, at which he was present, about the evacuation of Jews and Congress Poles from the Old Reich and from the Reich Gau of Danzig, Posen, and other areas, Koper issued instructions on the 12th of November 1939 for the deportation from the Wartegau between the 15th of November 1939 and the 28th of February 1940 of initially 200,000 Poles and 100,000 Jews. This appears to have been subjected to slight delay and an amendment of the numbers involved. For, on the 28th of November, Heydrich ordered an initial short-term plan, NAR plan, to deport 80,000 Jews and Poles from the Wartegau to the general government between the 1st and the 16th of December 1939, at a rate of 5,000 per day, to make way for 40,000 Baltic Germans. These expulsions were immediately put into effect. Discussions with Eichmann in Berlin on the 4th of January 1940 then indicated the goal for the Wartegau as the deportations of 200,000 Jews and 80,000 Poles. But at a meeting in Berlin on the 30th of January 1940, the first murmurings of complaint from the general government about the number of expellees being deported from the Wartegau over the border could be registered. By the time Kupper was forced to reply in spring 1940 to the ever louder complaints, the total number of Jews and Poles deported had reached 128,011. By February 1940, deep divisions on deportation policy were apparent. While Himmler pressed for speedy deportation of Poles and Jews to make room for the planned influx of ethnic Germans into the annexed territories, Göring opposed the loss of manpower useful to the war effort and was backed by Frank, anxious to block the expanding numbers of expellees being forced into his domain. In April, Greiser's request to deport the Wartegau Jews was deferred until the coming August. But by the summer of that year, it was plain that the intended deportations from the Wartegau into the general government could not be carried out. An important meeting on the issue took place in Krakow on the 31st of July, 1940. Greiser emphasized at the meeting the growing difficulties in the Wartegau. He spoke of the massing of Jews as the construction of a ghetto in Litzmannstadt, Wuj, had concentrated around 250,000 Jews there. This was, he declared, merely a provisional solution. 
all these Jews had to leave the Vatagau, and it had been envisaged that they would be deported to the general government. He had imagined that the modalities would be discussed at the meeting, but now a new decision, that is, to deport the Jews overseas to Madagascar, had emerged. Clarification was crucial. The difficulties of feeding the Jews forced into the ghetto, as well as the mounting problems of disease, meant, he claimed, that they could not be kept there over the coming winter. A temporary solution had at all costs to be found, which would allow for the deportation of these Jews into another territory. The governor-general, Hans Frank, reminded Greiser that Himmler had given him the assurance on Hitler's command that no more Jews were to be sent into the general government. Koper brought the discussion back to the looming crisis in the Wartegau. The position regarding the Jews was deteriorating daily, he claimed, repeating that the ghetto in Litzmannstadt had only been set up on the presumption that the deportation of the Jews concentrated there would commence in mid-1940. Frank replied that the Germanization of Litzmannstadt could not take place overnight and might well last 15 years. The situation in the general government, he stated, was in any case worse than that in the Wartegau. Greiser correctly drew the conclusion from the discussion that there was no prospect, even as an interim solution, of the general government receiving the Wartegau's quarter of a million Jews. It was again stressed, however, by his entourage that there could be no question of the Jews remaining in Litzmannstadt and that the Jewish question must, therefore, be solved in some way or other. On the 6th of November 1940, Frank informed Greiser by telegram that further deportations of Poles and Jews from the Wartegau into the general government were impossible before the end of the war. He had informed Himmler of this position and given instructions to turn back any transports. Meanwhile, conditions for the Jews in the improvised ghettos and camps of the Wartegau were unspeakable. Outbreaks of epidemic diseases were inevitable. At Kutno, where 6,500 Jews were confined in a former sugar factory, spotted fever, fleck fever, broke out on the 30th of October, 1940. Breaking up the camp or dispersal of the inmates into buildings in adjoining streets was ruled out for fear of infecting Germans. Even fresh straw for bedding and hot water for delousing could not be provided. It was reported to Greiser that as things stood, any possibility of combating the spotted fever in the camp could be ruled out. Worries were expressed about the situation in the coming winter. The epidemic was predictably unstoppable. By the summer of 1941, there had been 1,145 cases, 280 of them fatal. The camp was finally closed in March 1942, by which time there had been 1,369 cases, 313 leading to deaths. A fate worse than spotted fever, of course, awaited the survivors. In the huge Woj ghetto, whose Jewish population, when hermetically sealed off from the rest of the city on the 1st of May 1940, numbered 163,177 persons, starvation went hand in hand with disease. The problems of administration and control, of food provision and epidemic containment, that is, the difficulties of coping with the internment of the Wartegau Jews, which the Nazi leadership both in Berlin and in Posen had been in such a rush to bring about, were only too apparent to Greiser, Koper, and other heads of the Wartegau administration, not least the Gestapo and the local government leaders in Woj itself. The pressure which Greiser and Koper had sought to put on Frank mirrored the pressure they were under from their own subordinates to do something about the mounting and apparently insoluble Jewish problem in the province. But by mid-1941, there was no solution in sight. It was at this juncture, however, in the summer of 1941, that talk began of new possibilities which might be contemplated. And the first evidence of such possibilities being envisaged can be witnessed in remarks issuing from the top echelon of the Wartegau administration. On the 16th of July 1941, the head of the security service, SD, in Posen, SS Sturmbahnführer Rolf Heinz Höpner, a man close to both Greiser and Koper, sent to Adolf Eichmann in the Reich Security Head Office in Berlin a summary, headed Solution of the Jewish Problem, of discussions involving a variety of agencies in the Reich Governor's headquarters. A possible solution to the Jewish question in the Reichsgau Vaterland had been broached. This amounted to the concentration of all Wartegau Jews in a huge camp for 300,000 persons close to the centre of coal production.
where those Jews capable of working could be exploited in a number of ways with relatively easy policing, as the police chief in Woj, SS Brigadefuhrer Albert, vouchsafed, and without epidemic danger to the non-Jewish population. The next item addressed the issue of what to do about those Jews incapable of working. A new, ominous note was struck, offering a cynical rationalization for genocide. There is the danger this winter, ran the minute, that the Jews can no longer all be fed. It is to be seriously considered whether the most humane solution might not be to finish off those Jews not capable of working by some sort of fast-working preparation. This would be, in any event, more pleasant than letting them starve. Additionally, it was recommended that all Jewesses still capable of bearing children be sterilized, so that the Jewish problem would be completely solved within the current generation. Reich Governor Greiser, it was added, had not yet commented on the matter. Government President Übelhör in Litzmannstadt had, however, given the impression that he did not want the ghetto there to disappear because it was so lucrative. Just how much could be made from the Jews had been explained to Herpner by pointing out that the Reich Labour Ministry was prepared to pay six marks a day from a special fund for each Jewish worker, whereas the actual cost amounted to only 80 pfennig a day. Herpner's covering note asked for Eichmann's opinion. The things sound in part fantastic, Herpner concluded, but would, in my view, be quite capable of implementation. The Herpner Memorandum demonstrates that there were still, in July 1941, divergent views, even among the Woods authorities themselves, about the treatment of the ghettoized Jews, now that the ghettos appeared to be a long-term prospect rather than a transient solution. But above all, the Memorandum highlights the idea of genocide at an embryonic stage. By July 1941, Events elsewhere were already pushing German policy towards the Jews strongly in the direction of genocide. The preparations for the War of Annihilation with the Soviet Union marked, it has been noted, a quantum jump into genocide. Certainly, a genocidal climate was now present as never before. But orders for a general killing of Jews were, recent research indicates, not, as is often presumed, transmitted orally by Heydrich to the leaders of the Einsatzgruppen before the invasion of the Soviet Union. The Einsatzgruppen did not initially behave in a unified fashion, and there was a gradual escalation of killing during the first weeks of the campaign. Only after clarification of the tasks of the Einsatzgruppen had apparently been sought and provided by Himmler in August 1941 was there a drastic extensification of the slaughter to all Jews, irrespective of age or sex. Outside the Soviet Union, too, the obvious impasses in anti-Jewish policy were, from a number of differing directions, now developing a rapid and accelerating momentum towards outright and total genocide. On the 31st of July 1941, Goering, who had been nominally in charge of coordinating the forced emigration of German Jews since the aftermath of the Great Pogrom of November 1938, commissioned Heydrich with undertaking the preparations for the complete solution of the Jewish question within the German sphere of influence in Europe. All Goering did, in fact, was to sign a document drawn up in Heydrich's office, almost certainly drafted by Eichmann. The initiative came, in other words, from the Reich Secretary Head Office. The Goering mandate has frequently been interpreted as the direct reflection of a Hitler order to kill the Jews of Europe. Such an interpretation is open to doubt. It seems more probable that the mandate still looked to a territorial solution, envisaging the removal of German and other European Jews to a massive reservation in the East, somewhere beyond the Urals. The war, it was thought, would soon be over. The opportunity of such a territorial solution would then present itself. The result, needless to say, would itself have amounted to a different form of genocide in the long run. But it was not the actual final solution which historically emerged in the closing months of 1941 and the beginning of 1942. The territorial solution which was still being pressed for in the summer of 1941 was predicated upon a swift German victory. By September, this prospect was already dwindling. Before this time, Hitler, holding to his notion that the Jews could serve as hostages, had resisted pressure, especially from Heydrich and Goebbels, to deport the German Jews to the east. In mid-September, a foreign office inquiry about deporting Serbian Jews to the east was turned down by Eichmann on the grounds that not even German Jews could be moved to Russia or the general government. 
Eichmann recommended shooting. But around the same time, in mid-September 1941, Hitler was persuaded to change his mind about deporting the German Jews. In the next months, the crucial steps which culminated in the final solution proper were taken. In October and November 1941, the threads of the extermination net were rapidly pulled together. In this development, events in the Wartegau played a crucial role. Notification of the Führer's wish that the Old Reich and the Protectorate, Bohemia and Moravia, should be cleared of Jews as a first stage to Poland and then in the following spring further to the east, was sent by Himmler to Greiser on the 18th of September 1941 four days after Rosenberg's apparently successful intervention in persuading Hitler to deport the German Jews. Evidently, because of the immediate implications for the Wartegau of the deportation order, the letter was sent directly to Greiser as head of the province's government and administration. Himmler reported the intention to deport 60,000 Jews to Litzmannstadt for the duration of the winter. Further details, added Himmler, would be provided by Heydrich, either directly or via Koper. Whether the figure of 60,000 Jews was an error or was rapidly revised is unclear. But within a week, the number concerned was referred to as 20,000 Jews and now 5,000 gypsies. Possibly they were intended as the first installment, but even this number was far too great for the authorities in Litzmannstadt. The ghetto administration vehemently protested at the intended influx, and the protest on the grounds of existing massive overcrowding, provisioning problems, economic dislocation and danger of epidemics was conveyed by the government president of Litzmannstadt, Übelhor, in the strongest terms to Berlin. But it was to no avail. Heydrich stated, though his telegram to Übelhor was overtaken by events and never sent, that the deportation was absolutely necessary and no longer to be delayed and that Greiser had given his permission to receive the Jews in Litzmannstadt. Himmler demanded the same understanding from Übelhor that he had received from Greiser. He sharply upbraided Übelhor, for whom Greiser intervened, for his objectionable tone. From this exchange it is clear that the pressures for deportation were coming from Berlin, that Greiser was willing to comply despite the already mounting impossibility of solving the Wartegau's own Jewish question, and that opposition from Litzmannstadt itself was simply ruled out by Reich's security head office. The stated aim, the further expulsion of the Jews the coming spring to the east, does not appear at this point to have been concealing an actual intention to exterminate the Jews in death camps in Poland. Clearly, Übelhor knew nothing of any such intention. Hitler himself spoke at the end of the first week in October of transporting Czech Jews directly to the east, and not first into the general government, and both Heydrich and Himmler referred in early October to German Jews being sent to camps in the Baltic. Here, of course, their fate, in view of the murderous onslaught of the Einsatzgruppen in the Soviet Union, would have been all too predictable. The decision to deport Jews into areas where they had already been killed in their tens of thousands was plainly in itself genocidal. By this time, in late September or early October 1941, it would appear that the decision for physical extermination, at least of Jews incapable of working, had in effect been taken, though Russia, rather than Poland, was still foreseen as the area of implementation. The option of deporting the Jews farther east to the Soviet Union rapidly vanished, however, in the next weeks with the first transport difficulties, then the stalling of the German advance and the deteriorating military position in Russia. Far from a quick blitzkrieg victory, the end of the war in the east was nowhere in sight. And towards the end of October, Eichmann was making it clear that the mooted further deportation to the east of Jews deported from Germany to Litzmannstadt referred only to Jews fit to work. Since Jews in the east incapable of working were already being earmarked for extermination, the implication was obvious. New approaches to solving the Jewish question were meanwhile beginning to emerge. In circles closely connected with the Jewish question, there was now ominous talk of special measures for extermination. Victor Brach of the Führer Chancellery, and formerly the inspiration of the euthanasia action, whose personnel after the halting of the program in the Reich in late August were now available for redeployment and carried with them expertise derived from the gassing of the incurably sick, offered advice on the potential of poison gas as a means for tackling the Jewish problem, again at precisely this juncture. In October, too, 
the SS commandeered Polish laborers at Belcek in eastern Poland to undertake the construction of the extermination camp there, one of the three camps, the others were Sobibor and Treblinka, which developed into Operation Reinhardt, directed by the Lublin police chief, Globocnik. The former euthanasia personnel dispatched to liaise with Globocnik arrived in Lublin around the same time. The first experimental gassings at Auschwitz of Soviet prisoners of war took place in late summer and autumn 1941 and construction of the extermination camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau was underway by the end of the year. On the 16th of December 1941, Hans Frank spoke openly in a meeting of leaders of the general government about the need to exterminate the Jews wherever we find them, pointing out that the Gauleiter of the Eastern Territories were saying they too did not want the Jews. They were asking why there was not a resort to self-help to liquidate the Jews, rather than sending them to the East. Frank commented that he did not know how the extermination of the 3.5 million Jews in the general government could come about, since they could not be shot or poisoned. A comprehensive plan for the extermination of the Jews had evidently not yet been established. Physical extermination was, however, now unmistakably the intention. The Jewish transports from Berlin, Prague, Vienna and elsewhere had meanwhile been rolling into Łódź. The first German Jews arrived on the 16th of October 1941. By the 4th of November 1941, there had already been 20 transports, and the deportation target was reached. With the number of Jews sharply increasing, and the prospects of reductions through further deportations eastwards even more rapidly diminishing, killing the Jews of the Wartegau now emerged as a practical option. The option was rapidly seized upon. Already in autumn 1941, and weeks before the transports from the Wodz ghetto to systematic extermination of Chelmno began, there were mass killings of Jews at locations in the southern part of the Wartegau. Polish underground sources smuggled out information, published in the United States in 1942, of the slaughter in October 1941 of the entire Jewish population, reputedly some 3,000 persons, of the Kunin district, which had been gathered together in Sakharov, a village the Germans renamed Hinterberg and then driven in truckloads into the Kazimir woods where all trace of them ended. Post-war German investigations corroborated the essence of the report. They concluded that, in an indeterminate period, probably between autumn 1940 and late summer or autumn 1941, and in various actions, a large number of Jewish men, women and children were driven into the woods between Kazimierz Biskupi and Kletchev, and either shot or killed in a gas van. Most of the victims, it was noted, were from Tsagorov, Hinterberg, where beforehand a large number of Jewish families from the Konin district had been concentrated. Witnesses said the killings were carried out by police and Gestapo. Further post-war trial investigations in Germany established that, beginning on the 26th of November 1941 and lasting several days, an SS extermination squad had killed perhaps some 700 Jews, mainly elderly, ill or feeble Jews and children, interned in a camp at Kozminek, Bornhagen in German, near Kalisch, by means of a gas van. Probably such killings were envisaged by the security police and liquidation squads as experiments in the extermination techniques which would soon need to be deployed for the far larger numbers in the Wodz ghetto. The major operation was not long delayed. At the beginning of December 1941, regular and systematic extermination began at the site which had been selected specifically for the purpose. Chelmno, by a special task squad which had already accumulated much expertise in gas van extermination. In the framework of the euthanasia program, which ran in the Reich between autumn 1939 and summer 1941, a special unit under Herbert Lange had operated in the annexed areas of the East from a base in Posen. The most extensive of its mass killings had been the murder between the 21st of May and the 6th of June 1940, of 1,558 mental patients from asylums in and around Zoldau in East Prussia. The technique used by Lange's Zonderkommando was the gassing of victims by carbon monoxide poisoning in a large van. Lange's chauffeur, Walter Burmeister, recorded in post-war testimony that he had driven Lange around the Wartegau in autumn 1941, accompanied by other members of the Stapo Leitstelle of Posen and a guard drawn from the Schutzpolizei, looking for a suitable location to carry out killings of Jews. He then, presumably once an appropriate spot had been found, drove Lange to security police headquarters in Berlin and back.
In November 1941, shortly after returning from Berlin, Lange's unit, now increased in size, moved from Posen to Chelmno. And at the beginning of December 1941, began the use of two gas vans. A third gas van arrived during the course of the month, sent from Berlin. Thus began the killing process in the first of the extermination establishments to begin its operations. Did the initiative to begin the killing come from Berlin or from within the Wartegau? In one post-war trial, it was accepted that orders for the resettlement, that is, killing of Jews from the Wurge ghetto, to the extermination camp at Chelmno, went directly from the Reich Security Head Office in Berlin to the Gestapo office in Wurge. Even if correct, this could be taken as consonant with a request emanating from within the Wartegau, then sanctioned in Berlin. However, neither a request from Wurge nor a general order coming from Berlin for resettlement of the Wurge Jews could have bypassed the heads of the civil and police administration in the Wartegau, Greiser and Kupper. Moreover, the resettlement of the Wurge Jews began only on the 16th of January 1942, more than a month after the killings in Chelmno had started. If orders were transmitted direct from Berlin to Wurge, they must have been subsidiary to an initial decision to initiate the genocide in the Wartegau by exterminating the Jews incapable of work. And the balance of probabilities points towards seeing the initial impulses coming from within the Wartegau itself, and not directly from Berlin. The emergence of a genocidal solution in the Wartegau corresponds exactly with the weeks in which the authorities there were having to cope with the reception of 20,000 Jews, accepted only under protest by the local authorities in Litmanstadt. With the collapse of hopes of deporting the province's own Jews, then the forced reception of Jews from Germany, and finally the cutting off of an exit route for any of the Jews, Wartegau anti-Jewish policy had run ever further into a cul-de-sac. Killing offered a way out. And, it will be remembered, it had already been talked of seriously among the Wartegau ruling elite as early as July 1941. The means, with the redeployment of Lange's special unit, were by autumn 1941 now to hand to implement what in July had been referred to in the Herpner Memorandum as fantastic notions. The mention in that memorandum of the names of the Wurge police chief, Albert, and the government president, Übelhor, who came, it will be recalled, in September to protest in the strongest terms about the orders for a new influx of Jews to the Wurge ghetto, indicates the centrality of the Wurge authorities to the internal Wartegau debate on the fate of the region's Jews. It is possible, as has been suggested, though there is no direct evidence to prove it, that when the position, from the point of view of the Nazi bosses in Wurj, became critical following the order to take in the tens of thousands of new deportees from the Reich in the autumn, the suggestion to liquidate them came initially from the Gestapo at Wurj. On the other hand, the Sonderkommando Lange drew mainly for its personnel on the security police headquarters at Posen, where it was based before moving to Helmno, and continued to liaise directly with the Posen office, not with Wurj. Whatever part was played by the security police authorities in Wurge and Posen, the key role was almost certainly that of the overall head of the security services in the Wartegau, higher SS and police chief Wilhelm Kopper. Kopper's own version of his involvement in the emergence of a genocidal solution was given in connection with his trial in Bonn in 1960. He portrays himself as the conscience-stricken recipient of orders from Berlin, quite apart from the apologetics, the account has to be treated with caution. Cooper claimed he heard, either in 1940 or in 1941, that a commissar, whose name he later learned was Lange, and a special SS unit were to be sent to him from Berlin to carry out the physical extermination of the Jews in the Vaterland. His understanding at the time, he said, was that this would apply only to Jews incapable of work. The impression, he added, also of Greiser. Cooper's view was that the Sonderkommando would carry out experiments trying out gassing methods already devised by Brack of the Führer Chancellery. Koper was adamant that he had heard of the deployment of the Lange unit from Ernst Danzog, inspector of the security police and SD in the Vaterland, based in Posen, and learned further from a telephone conversation with Dr. Rudolf Brandt from Himmler's personal office that an action against the Jews was being prepared and that Brack's gassing experiments, reaching completion in Berlin, were now to be deployed by Sonderkommando Lange under Brach's direction in the Vaterland. In a crisis of conscience, alleged Koper, he consulted Greiser, who, it was immediately obvious, was fully in the picture, and stated that it was a matter of a Führer order, 
which could not be sabotaged, since Cooper purportedly opposed such experiments as inhumane. In this account, it seems plain, Cooper is conflating the beginnings of the euthanasia action in the Vatikau with the decision to kill the province's Jews. He could not possibly have heard of a decision to exterminate the Jews of the Vatikau in 1940. But nor did he encounter the name of Herbert Lange and existence of his Zonderkommando for the first time in 1941, and in connection with an action against the Jews. For Lange and his men had by then already been stationed in Posen and at Koppa's behest for over a year, employed in the gassings of mental patients in the annexed areas of Poland. And whether in connection with the euthanasia action or the extermination of the Jews, it seems unlikely that Koppa learned of the deployment of the Zonderkommando Lange from Danzog, a subordinate. Finally, assuming that the telephone conversation with Brandt took place in autumn 1941, and along the lines Koper described, it might still be doubted whether it should be seen as relaying an order from Berlin as opposed to complying with a request from within the Wartegau to deploy the BRAC methods to exterminate the Jews, without minimizing the indispensability of empowering orders from Berlin, and accepting that by October 1941 a decision had been taken or sanctioned by Hitler to exterminate European Jewry, certainly those Jews incapable of working, it seems nevertheless probable, as we shall see, that Koper was far more active in initiating the action against the Jews in the Vatikau than his post-war account suggests. At any rate, for well over a year before the killing of the Jews began, Koper was in overall command of Lange's unit. Later, when it was renamed Sonderkommando Kulmhoff, the German name for Chelmno, and placed under a new leader, Hans Botmann, Cooper had general control of the unit's personnel and economic matters, delegating the practical running of the unit to Damzog's office. In the summer of 1941, Cooper was among the circle of recipients, including by no means all the higher SS and police leaders, of the reports on events, Ereignismeldungen, explicitly detailing the killings of Jews in the Soviet Union. He knew, therefore, of the ravages of the Einsatzgruppen in Russia, and of course at first hand of the gassings of mental patients in the annexed Polish territories, since he had lent out Zonderkommando Lange for that purpose. He was, as his own testimony shows, aware of Brach's experiments with techniques of mass killing by use of poisonous gas. There can be no doubt that he was involved in the deliberations which led to the Herpner Memorandum in July 1941. He was, in every way then, well attuned to the progressively radical thinking on the possible solution to the Jewish question in the top echelons of the SS and at Reich Security Headquarters in Berlin. The central role played by the regional command of the security police in the emergence and implementation of a policy of genocide in the Wartegau is obvious. But where did the overlord of the Wartegau, Reich Governor and Gauleiter Arthur Greiser, fit into the decisions to move to outright genocide? Despite Koper's assertion that Greiser was supinely carrying out a Führer order imposed on the Wartegau from Berlin, the evidence suggests, in fact, that the request to begin killing the Jews came directly from Greiser himself. As the letter from Himmler to Greiser of the 18th of September 1941, informing him of the decision to deport 60,000 Jews to the Wurge ghetto, shows, communication on such matters between the head of the SS and the leader of the Wartegau did not need to pass through the hands of Kopper. Greiser himself had excellent relations with Himmler. But, as Kopper's testimony indicated, the Reich governor and the regional police chief were of one mind on the Jewish question, while the rounding up of Jews from the smaller ghettos of the Wartegau needed evident close cooperation between the security police and the administrative organs under Greiser's control. It is clear that Greiser contacted Himmler directly in a number of instances relating to Helmno and the Zonderkommando operating there. And when, after a temporary end to the killing, the work of the Zonderkommando was recommenced in early 1944, it was on the basis of an agreement between Himmler and Greiser in which, it seems plain, the initiative was taken by the latter. Something of Greiser's role can be gathered, too, from references to the killing of the Jews in mid-1942. A report of the Wurz Gestapo from the 9th of June 1942 noted that all Jews not capable of work were to be evacuated, a euphemism for liquidated, according to the directions of the Gauleiter. This is probably to be linked with the killing of 100,000 Jews which Greiser himself had requested and referred to in a letter to Himmler dated the 1st of May 1942. 
Greiser spoke in this letter of the completion within the next two to three months of the action approved by you in agreement with the head of the Reich Security Head Office, SS Obergruppenführer Heydrich, for the special treatment, another camouflage term for killing, of around 100,000 Jews in the area of Maigau. Although Greiser spoke of the action being completed within two to three months, according to a memorandum from the Reich Security Head Office dated the 5th of June 1942, a total of 97,000 Jews had in fact already been killed in Chelmno since December 1941. Greiser's request for permission to carry out the special treatment must therefore have been made considerably earlier. Indeed, it conceivably marked the actual request to begin the killing before the commencement of operations in Chelmno at the beginning of December 1941. Greiser went on in his letter of the 1st of May 1942 to request Himmler's approval of a further initiative on his part, the use of the Zonderkommando, directly following on the Jewish action, to liquidate 35,000 Poles in the Gau, suffering from incurable tuberculosis. The tuberculosis episode is revealing in a number of respects for the light it casts on the likely decision-making process in the killing of the Jews. Greiser's letter to Himmler was immediately followed by a letter to the latter's personal adjutant, SS Sturmbahnführer Rudolf Brandt, from Koper, recommending that the case be verbally explained to the Reichsführer and offering his own approval of the solution striven for by the Gauleiter. Brandt's reply to Koper stated that he had passed on Greiser's suggestion for an opinion from Heydrich, but that the last decision in this matter must be taken by the Führer. Soundings were, in fact, taken a week later, on the 21st of May, from Heydrich, who replied on the 9th of June, stating that he had no objections, subject to thorough discussion of the necessary measures with the security police. Himmler then wrote to Greiser, using Heydrich's wording as the basis of his own letter, towards the end of June. There matters appear to have rested until the autumn. Preparations for the action presumably took some time. In November 1942, however, before the action had commenced, Greiser received a letter from Dr. Kurt Blum, deputy head of the Nazi Party's health office, Hauptamt für Volksgesundheit, in Berlin, raising objections on the grounds that it would be impossible to maintain the necessary secrecy, thereby arousing unrest and providing enemy propaganda with a gift. He specifically referred to the lessons to be learned from the mistakes of such a kind made in the euthanasia action in Germany. Consequently, he thought it necessary to consult Hitler to ask whether, in the light of the euthanasia action, which Hitler had stopped, if only partially, for such reasons, the tuberculosis action should go ahead. Greiser wrote again to Himmler on the 21st of November in the light of Blomer's objections. His comment is enlightening. He wrote, I myself do not believe that the Führer needs to be asked again in this matter, especially since at our last discussion with regard to the Jews, he told me that I could proceed with these according to my own judgment. Himmler nevertheless regarded Blomer's objections as serious enough to advise against the implementation of Greiser's suggestion. From this exchange, a number of points seem clear. The initiative for killing 100,000 Jews and the later suggestion for the liquidation of 35,000 tuberculosis victims came directly from Greiser. Approval in both cases was sought from Himmler, who in the latter case certainly then consulted Reich Security Head Office. The Wartegau head of security, Koper, paved the way for the approval of the tuberculosis action and probably did the same with the regard to the initiative on the Jews. It cannot be proved, but seems distinctly possible, that the initial suggestion came from him. In the case of the tuberculose Poles, it was pointed out that a decision could only come from Hitler, whose authorization was essential, at which point doubts arose leading to Himmler's blocking of an initiative he had earlier approved. It seems inconceivable that the killing of the Jews could have been decided upon without some equivalent blanket authorization by Hitler. But it also appears plain that, as in the tuberculosis matter, all that would have been required of Hitler was authorization for the implementation of initiatives coming from others. And as Greiser pointed out, Hitler's response to his own request for authorization on solving the Jewish question in the Wartegau had been to grant him permission to act according to his own discretion. Hitler's role here, as elsewhere, was to set the tone and then to provide the broad sanction for actions prompted and set in motion by others. In the implementation of genocide in the Wartegau, 
it can be concluded that responsibility for the personnel and economic matters connected with the Zonderkommando at Chelmno rested with the higher SS and police chief, Koper, and was delegated by him to the inspector of the security police and SD, Danzog. While general responsibility lay in the hands of Reich Governor and Gauleiter, Greiser, operating with the permission of Reichsführer SS Himmler and head of Reich Security, Heydrich, and with the blanket authorization to act as he saw fit, provided by Hitler himself. This examination of the emergence of genocide in the Wartegau, admittedly tentative in places, and necessarily resting at times on the balance of probabilities, has suggested that improvisation by the German authorities on the spot played a decisive role in the autumn of 1941. It was only in the immediate aftermath of Himmler's order to receive tens of thousands of new Jews into the Wartegau and there into the overcrowded Woj ghetto, following Hitler's authorization to deport German and Czech Jews, that earlier fantasy talk of liquidating Jews became transformed into a realizable prospect of extermination. The rapid conversion of the Sonderkommando Lange, conveniently to hand, but before that date having no special link with the proposed solution to the Jewish question, into a unit deployed specifically in the systematic extermination of Jews, the prompt search for a suitable killing ground, the initial, seemingly experimental, slaughter of Jews at Sagarov and Bornhagen, and the establishment of Chalmno itself, all smack of improvisation. In this, the initiatives by the Wartegau rulers were highly important. Permission to kill a 100,000 Jews was actively sought by Reich Governor Greiser. No order to that effect was forced upon him by Himmler or Heydrich. Such a mandate had been requested by spring 1942 at the latest, but almost certainly well before this time and in all probability before the end of 1941. It is Greiser, too, who discusses the Wartegau Jews with Hitler himself at an unspecified date, at the latest by autumn 1942, but probably earlier, and is told to deal with them as he thinks fit. And, as we have seen, the Gestapo at Woj recorded the fact that they were acting on Greiser's direct instructions in the liquidation of Jews incapable of work. Greiser was subsequently evidently well informed about what took place at Chelmno, and took a keen interest in the developments and in the work of Zonderkommando Kulmhoff. And finally, it was Greiser who on the 7th of March 1944 sent a telegram to Hitler, proudly reporting that the Wartegau jury had shrunk to a tiny remnant. Nevertheless, it seems more likely that Cooper, rather than Greiser, took the lead in initiating the move to outright genocide in the Wartegau. Most probably it was Koper, au fait with the thinking of Heydrich and Himmler, already having cooperated in Brach's gassing experiments through the use of the gas van by Lange's men to kill euthanasia victims, and well aware of the antagonism in Litzmannstadt caused by the order to take in the new influx of Jews, possibly even prompted by the Gestapo there, who suggested to Berlin that a way out of the self-imposed problem would be to deploy the Lange unit to liquidate at least the Jews of the smaller ghettos where the problems in Nazi eyes were even greater than those of Woj, and where the possibility of moving them to Woj was ruled out. It will be recalled that at the time that Herpner had sent his memorandum, in July, Greiser had not voiced an opinion on the solutions suggested. Evidently they had come from within the security police, rather than from Greiser himself and it seems likely that, several months later in the autumn, when the fantastic notions mentioned by Herpner were being turned into reality, it was not Greiser, but Koper, who was the actual initiator, with the Reich governor approached when approval at the Gau level was needed. It would be mistaken to conclude from this that local initiatives acted in independence from central policy in Berlin, and even more so to imagine that central policy merely grew out of practical improvisations at local or regional level. An abundance of evidence has now been assembled, demonstrating beyond reasonable doubt that by the late summer and early autumn 1941, the decision physically to exterminate the Jews of Europe must have been taken by the Nazi leadership. But the contrast between central planning and local initiative can easily be too sharply drawn. Whatever the nature of any central decision already reached, the fateful developments of autumn 1941 do have, within the overall goal of extermination of the Jews of Europe, an unmistakable air about them of improvisation, experimentation, and rapid adaptation to new policy objectives and opportunities. The final solution, as it came to emerge, 
formed a unity out of a number of organizationally separate programs, one of which, arising from conditions specific to the Vartigau and remaining throughout under the direction of the province's own leadership, rather than the central control of the Reich Security Head Office, was the extermination program at Helno. At the time of Hitler's decision in mid-September, against his earlier reluctance to deport the German Jews to the east, knowledge of any already determined central extermination policy was clearly still confined to an extremely small circle of initiates. Plainly, Übelhoer and the Litzmannstadt authorities were unaware in late September 1941 that the aim of anti-Jewish policy was systematic genocide. Otherwise, the vehemence of the objection to the influx of more Jews to the Wurz ghetto would be hard to comprehend. But Koper would have known, if anyone in the Vatikau did. His role as the police chief on the ground, aware of thinking at the centre, was pivotal. Hitler's own role in the emergence of a policy of systematic genocide was mainly to voice the need for a radical solution to the Jewish question and to sanction and approve initiatives presented to him by those, above all Heydrich and Himmler, keen to translate the Führer's wishes into practical policy objectives. The evidence from the Vatikau, not least the authorization to Greiser to act as he saw fit in the Jewish question, fits the picture of a dictator whose moral responsibility is not in question, but who was content to provide carte blanche for others to turn ideological imperatives into concrete directives for action. By the date of the Wannsee Conference on the 20th of January 1942, the killing in the Wartegau had been in operation for over six weeks. By March 1942, the final solution, as it is known to history, was in full swing. The killings at Chelno began with the Jews from the neighbouring small ghettos and camps. Transports from the Wodge ghetto began on the 16th of January 1942. Some 55,000 Jews from the Wodge ghetto itself had been killed by the end of May 1942. By the end of 1942, the number of transports had declined, and at the end of March 1943, Operations at Chelmno were ended and the camp dissolved. Greiser appeared in Chelmno, thanked the men of the Zonderkommando in the name of the Führer for their work, invited them to a festive meal in a hotel in Wartbrüchen, and attained through intercession with Himmler their further deployment, according to their wishes, as a unit attached to the SS Volunteer Division Prince Eugen in Yugoslavia. The killings were restarted in April 1944, when Botman and the Zonderkommando were brought back to Chelmno for a second stint, which ended on the 17th to the 18th of January, 1945. Of the leading provincial perpetrators of Nazi genocide in the Wartegau, Inspector of the Security Police and SD Ernst Damzog was killed in action in 1945. Head of the Posen SD, Rolf Heinz Hörpner, was sentenced in March 1949 in Poznanie, Posen, to life imprisonment, and released under an amnesty in April 1956. The government president of Wurz, Dr. Friedrich Übelhoer, disappeared after American internment under a false name. The police president of Wurz, Dr. Wilhelm Albert, died in 1960. The Gestapo head in Wurz from April 1942, and at the same time Lord Mayor of the city of Wurz, Dr. Otto Bradfisch, responsible also for Einsatzgruppen shootings in Russia, was sentenced in Munich in 1951 to ten years in a penitentiary, and in Hanover in 1963 to thirteen years, less the time spent from his Munich imprisonment, for complicity in the murder of 15,000 and 5,000 persons. The head of the Jewish desk in Wuj, Gunther Fuchs, was sentenced in Hanover in 1963 to life imprisonment for nine cases of murder and complicity in the murder of at least 15,000 persons. The head of German administration of the Wurz ghetto, Hans Bibov, was hanged in Wurz in 1947. Herbert Lange was killed in action near Berlin in 1945. His successor as head of the Sonderkommando, Kulmhoff, Hans Bortmann, hanged himself in British custody in 1946. Of the 160 men suspected of participating in the Chelmno murders, 105 could not be found. Twenty-two were established as dead or missing in action, and two had been hanged in Poland. A total of thirty-three were located and interrogated, of whom twelve eventually stood trial in Bonn in 1962. The result of the trial and appeal was, finally, that on the 23rd of July 1965, 
eight were found guilty of involvement in murder, and sentenced to periods of between thirteen months, two weeks in prison, and thirteen years in a state penitentiary. In another three cases, the involvement was regarded as so slight that no punishment was fitting. The last case was stopped because the accused was unfit to stand trial. Arthur Greiser was condemned to death by a Polish court and hanged in Poznania in 1946, after a last-minute plea for the intercession by the papacy had failed. Wilhelm Koper escaped after the war and lived under a pseudonym for over 15 years as a successful businessman, becoming director of a chocolate factory in Bonn, before being captured in 1960 and finally, in 1964, being arraigned for his involvement in mass murder in Poland. He was deemed unfit to stand trial. He died peacefully in his bed on the 2nd of July, 1975. The nearest estimates are that a minimum of 150,000 Jews and about 5,000 gypsies were murdered in Chelmno between 1941 and 1945. Four Jews survived. Chapter 4 Hitler's Role in the Final Solution Hitler's Mentality The Removal of the Jews as Germany's Salvation Hitler's very first and last recorded political statements concerned the Jewish question. In a letter written as early as September 1919, using biological terminology he would frequently deploy, he spoke of the activities of Jews producing a racial tuberculosis among nations. He stated emphatically that Jews were a race, not a religion. Anti-Semitism as a political movement, he declared, should be based on reason, not emotion, and must lead to the systematic removal of the rights of Jews. However, he concluded, the final aim, which could only be attained in a government of national strength, had to be the removal of the Jews altogether. In his political testament, dictated on the eve of his suicide, with the Red Army at his gates, Hitler declared, I left no doubt that if the nations of Europe are again to be regarded as mere blocks of shares of these international money and finance conspirators, then that race too, which is really guilty of this murderous struggle, will be called to account. Jury, I further left no one in doubt that this time millions of children of Europe's Aryan peoples would not die of hunger. Millions of grown men would not suffer death, and hundreds of thousands of women and children not be burnt and bombed to death in the towns, without the real culprit having to atone for his guilt, even if by more humane means. Almost twenty-six momentous years separate the two statements. These were no propaganda ploys. There can be no doubt that they represent fervently held core beliefs. At their heart was the link in Hitler's mind between war and the Jews, there from beginning to end of his political career. In a terrible passage in Mein Kampf, Hitler expressed his belief that the sacrifice of millions at the front would not have been necessary if twelve or fifteen thousand of these Hebrew corruptors of the people had been held under poison gas. It was not a prescription for future action, but the thought never left him. Hitler's writings and speeches illustrate the striking continuity of a small number of basic, unchanging ideas that provided his inner driving force. Whatever the vagaries of opportunistic policy and the necessary adjustments of propaganda over the years, these ideas remained a constant from his entry into politics down to his death in the bunker. It is seldom that a politician holds with such tenacity to a core body of ideas over such a lengthy period of time. And, however repulsive, and whatever their irrational basis, they did constitute a circular, self-reinforcing argument, impenetrable by rational critique, something which we can genuinely call a Weltanschauung, or ideology. This ideology was formed in full no later than 1925. There were really no more than three core elements, each of them a long-term goal rather than a pragmatic middle-range political aim, resting on an underlying premise of human existence as racial struggle. 1. Securing Germany's hegemony in Europe. 2. Attainment of living space, Lebensraum, to ensure the material basis for Germany's long-term future. And 3. Removal of the Jews. 
It amounted to a vision of Germany's salvation, a glorious future in waiting. It could be achieved, Hitler repeatedly stated, only by heroic leadership, that, by 1924, he had come to see as represented by himself. And all three strands of the vision could be attained at one fell swoop with the destruction of the Soviet Union, and with it the eradication of Jewish Bolshevism. The war in the East that would eventually begin in June 1941 was, therefore, intrinsic to this vision. The Weltanschauung was, however, itself a rationalization of a deeper, more profound feeling within Hitler, a burning thirst for revenge against those who had destroyed all that he held good. The war of 1914-18, to when he had experienced the immense carnage as a committed and courageous soldier, fanatical about the German cause, had given him a purpose for the first time in his life. In one of the few letters he wrote from the front in 1915, he spoke of the huge sacrifice in human life being worthwhile to produce a post-war homeland, purer and cleansed of alien influence. This was how he saw the colossal slaughter, not in terms of human suffering, but as worthwhile for the making of a better Germany. This was why the news, unexpected for him as for so many others, of Germany's capitulation in November 1918, which reached him while he was hospitalized at Pazewalk in Pomerania, recovering from mustard gas poisoning, was so utterly traumatizing. He had identified his personal fate wholly with that of the German Reich. An acute sense of national humiliation now emerged with his own misery. His searing bitterness and visceral hatred of a rare intensity reflected this identification and was now directed at perceived enemies he had begun to identify years before, scapegoats first for his own ills, now responsible for those of the nation. He could not accept the failure of the army in which he himself had fought. Dark forces of sedition at home had to be responsible. Revenge, even though he was in no position to bring it about, gripped him with the power of an obsession. Those who had undermined Germany's national prestige had reduced her to this shame would have to pay for it. This was the personal fire within him that was never extinguished. It was wholly consistent then that from the beginning of his career in 1919, Hitler fanatically pursued two interlinked goals, to restore Germany's greatness, and in so doing to avenge and make good the disgrace of the capitulation in 1918, punishing those responsible for the revolution that followed and the national humiliation that was fully revealed in the Treaty of Versailles of 1919. The goals could only be attained, as he repeatedly said, by the sword, that is, by war. Since, in his eyes, the Jews were responsible for these most terrible crimes of all time, for the stab in the back of 1918, the capitulation, the revolution for Germany's misfortune. Since, in his perverted perception, they were the main carriers of capitalism in Wall Street and the city of London, as they were of Bolshevism in Moscow, and since, in his belief, in the legend of the Jewish world conspiracy, they would always block his path and pose the most dangerous enemy to his plans, it followed logically that war for him had to be a war against the Jews. Moreover, it was equally logical, in Hitler's mind, that when that war was recognized as irredeemably lost, continuation of the struggle to the point of self-destruction, with the exhortation to future generations to continue the fight against international Jewry, would be needed as the final demonstration of Germany's defiance, the last act of sacrifice necessary to expiate the shame and infamy inflicted by the Jews in 1918. The tenacity with which he held to this dogmatic belief that the Jews had caused the First World War, but that, in the event of them plunging the world once more into war, they would perish, is truly striking. He repeated the sentiment over and again, publicly and privately, he saw himself as the agent of Germany's national salvation, and that salvation would only be achieved through destroying the power of the Jews. The consistency of Hitler's aim to remove Jews, and the fact that, during the years of his dictatorship, the Jews were indeed removed, first from Germany, then from the whole of German-occupied Europe, through ruthless persecution and ultimately physical annihilation, seems to offer a straightforward answer to the question of Hitler's role in the final solution. However, this role is less obvious than it might at first sight appear. While his continued personal hatred of Jews can be plainly demonstrated, how that translated into policies of persecution, then extermination, is not always easy to discern. 
Hitler himself remarked in one of his wartime monologues that even regarding the Jews, I had for long to remain inactive. For tactical reasons, of course. Yet even without Hitler's close involvement in the direction of policy, continual radicalization of anti-Jewish policy took place. And as one seminal study pointed out long ago, the figure of Adolf Hitler is a shadowy one. This in itself has given rise to differing interpretations among historians. How far Hitler had to intervene directly in order to steer policy, and whether the final solution followed a long-term ideologically driven plan of annihilation, or arose as the end of a process of cumulative radicalization out of unplanned ad hoc improvisation and local barbaric initiatives in attempts to cope with the self-inflicted logistical problems arising from Nazi anti-Jewish policy, have been long-standing issues of legitimate disagreement. The nature and timing of any Führer order, or even whether it was necessary for one to be given, have been a central component of the debate. Interpreting the Decision for the Final Solution With few exceptions, notably the early study by Gerald Reitlinger and the monumental work of Raoul Hilberg, detailed research on the decisions and policies of genocide began as late as the 1970s, expanding greatly over subsequent decades, especially once the archival repositories in the former Eastern Bloc were opened. Only in the light of such research has it become possible to evaluate more precisely the role Hitler played in the emergence of the final solution. Yet even now, after exhaustive analysis, much remains obscure or contentious. The problems of interpretation arise from the complexities and deficiencies of the surviving fragmentary evidence, reflecting in good measure the obfuscatory language of the Nazi leadership, as well as the extreme unbureaucratic leadership style of Hitler, who, especially once the war had begun, placed a high premium upon secrecy and concealment, with orders on sensitive issues usually passed on verbally and on a need-to-know basis. Until the 1970s, it was generally taken for granted that a single, direct Hitler order launched the final solution. The presumption emanated from a Hitler-centric approach to the Third Reich, which placed heavy emphasis upon the will, intentions and policy directives of the dictator. This sometimes went hand in hand with the claim, as voiced in Lucy Davidovich's influential book, that Hitler had followed a grand design, or program of annihilation, dating back to his traumatic experience of the end of the First World War, and that, though there had on occasion been necessary tactical adjustments, the implementation of the plan merely awaited the right opportunity, which then came in 1941. Gerald Fleming, one of the first historians to investigate systematically the evidence for Hitler's involvement in the implementation of the final solution, concurred in seeing a strategic plan for the realization of Hitler's aim, dating back to his experience of the German Revolution of 1918. Early biographers of Hitler followed a similar line. A psycho-historical explanation for this pathological aim was offered by Rudolf Binion, who saw Hitler entering politics in order to kill the Jews as revenge for Germany's defeat in subliminal association with the death of his mother in 1907 under treatment from a Jewish doctor. A reaction to this pronounced Hitler centrism gained ground in the 1970s. It formed a general alternative approach to interpreting the Third Reich, what came to be known as the structuralist or sometimes functionalist, in distinction from the intentionalist approach. Rather than looking to Hitler's personal direction of policy, the fragmentation of policymaking in a polycratic system of government with confused and chaotic lines of administration, led by a weak dictator, concerned primarily with propaganda and upholding his prestige, came to be emphasized. As regards anti-Jewish policy, too, structuralist approaches looked away from the role of the individual, not that Hitler's paranoid anti-Semitism, indispensability to the barbaric persecution that led to genocide, or moral responsibility were doubted, to the structures of rule in the Third Reich and the functions of competing agencies as they strive to implement hateful but vaguely couched guidelines for action. In a seminal article published in 1977, stirring a debate that has rumbled on ever since, Martin Brostzat argued that Hitler had given no comprehensive general extermination order at all. Rather, problems in undertaking deportation plans arising from the unexpected failure swiftly to defeat the Soviet Union during the summer and autumn of 1941 had prompted Nazi satraps in the occupied territories of the East to start taking the initiative in killing the Jews in their regions. The killing gained retrospective sanction from above, 
but only gradually, by 1942, turned into a comprehensive extermination program. There had been, therefore, no long-term design for the physical annihilation of Europe's Jews, and there had been no specific Hitler order. In an influential essay published in 1983, Hans Mommsen presented a forceful argument pushing in much the same direction. Mommsen accepted without question Hitler's knowledge and approval of what was taking place, but he saw a direct Hitler order as incompatible with the dictator's endeavours to distance himself from the direct personal responsibility and reluctance to speak of the final solution, even among his close entourage, except in oblique terms or propaganda statements. For Mommsen, the key to the emergence of the final solution was not to be found in the implementation of Hitler's will to exterminate the Jews, but in improvised bureaucratic initiatives whose dynamic prompted a process of cumulative radicalization in the fragmented structures of decision-making in the Third Reich. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, at the time that these programmatic essays by Brustzat and Mommsen appeared, detailed research into the decisions that launched the final solution was still little developed. Important works, beyond Hilberg, had in the meantime, of course, appeared, damaging beyond repair the notion of a grand design for extermination, a plan reaching back to 1918. Yehuda Bauer, one of the foremost Israeli experts on the Holocaust, summed up the general revision by pointing to a number of stages of development in anti-Jewish policy, all of them rooted in the unchanging notion of removing the Jews from Germany, though not following any long-term extermination program. This verdict followed two penetrating analyses of anti-Jewish policy by Karl Schleunis and Uwe Dietrich Adam, which pursued the vagaries and cul-de-sacs of Nazi persecution, ruling out the notion of a simple strategy of implementing a long-standing extermination plan determined by Hitler. Far from being a straight path, the road to Auschwitz, according to Schleunis, was a twisted one. Directly prompted by Brustzat's hypotheses, one of the first researchers to explore the intractable and highly complex source material for the crucial months in 1941, which saw the emergence of the final solution, meaning not just the mass killing of Jews in the Soviet Union in the wake of Operation Barbarossa, but a program to exterminate all the Jews of Europe in Nazi-occupied areas, was Christopher Browning, in the early stages of a career which saw him advance to become one of the world's leading experts on the Holocaust. Rejecting Brustzat's emphasis upon local initiatives only gradually congealing into a program, Browning insisted upon central direction and returned to an emphasis upon a decision by Hitler, which, like Hilberg and others, he placed in summer 1941. He saw this decision crucially reflected in the mandate given by Göring to Heydrich on July the 31st, 1941, ordering him to prepare a total solution of the Jewish question. The novelty of Browning's interpretation, however, was that he envisaged Hitler commissioning Goering to work out a plan for the final solution to be confirmed at a later date, in effect the first part of a two-staged order. The next months witnessed radicalization at various levels, during which the killing of Jews escalated greatly. There was confusion, contradiction at times, and much improvisation, but none of this was incompatible, in Browning's view, with a mandate to work for the extermination of the Jews dating back to the previous July. Browning concluded that in late October or November 1941, with the attack on the Soviet Union stalled, Hitler approved the extermination plan he had solicited the previous summer. In numerous impressive detailed studies that he has published on the topic since this early essay, Browning has never substantially revised this interpretation. The timing, as well as the nature, of any Führer decision for the final solution had by now become a central issue of interpretation. It was extensively debated at an important conference in Stuttgart in 1984. Most, though not all, of the experts participating accepted that there must have been a Führer order. However, on the date of such an order, which all agreed was at some point in 1941, interpretation varied considerably. The dominant view was that the crucial decision, mainly seen as linked to the Göring mandate, for the extension to the whole of Europe of the physical annihilation of the Jews already raging in the Soviet Union, took place in summer, while the end of the war seemed imminent. Some, however, placed a Hitler decision not in the euphoric phase of the summer, but in the autumn, when it was realized that the war in the Soviet Union would drag on, and when the possibility of deporting Jews into Soviet territory, as earlier envisaged, had evaporated. 
the question of the timing of any Hitler decision had acquired wider significance. The euphoria interpretation had him planning to destroy the Jews from a position of strength. When ultimate triumph seemed within his grasp, it pointed in the direction of a determining intention to kill the Jews when the opportunity arose. The alternative, a decision taken from effective weakness, when the prospect of victory had receded and the problems of a protracted and bitter war were mounting, was more suggestive of a reaction to circumstances that had spiralled out of control, a response to the inability to bring about the desired territorial solution of the Jewish question by deporting Jews to the Arctic wastes of the Soviet Union, and a vengeful determination to succeed in the war against the Jews, even should ultimate victory in the military war prove impossible to attain. The case for placing a Hitler decision not in the euphoria of high summer expectations of imminent victory, but some two months later, when pessimism over a long war in the East was starting to grip the dictator, was most cogently advanced by Philippe Bourin, writing in the late 1980s. In contrast to Browning and others, Bourin argued, a point meanwhile more widely accepted, that it would be mistaken to see in the Goering mandate of the 31st of July 1941 a reflection of a fundamental order by Hitler for the final solution, that is, to extend the genocide already taking place in the Soviet Union into a program for the physical extermination of the whole of European Jewry. Rather, according to Bourin, the Goering mandate still fell within the remit of attaining a territorial settlement in the East once the war was over. The mandate, which had been drafted in Heydrich's own office for Goering's signature, was aimed at establishing the authority in an issue where there were many competing instances, of the head of the Reichsicherheitshauptamt, in all matters pertaining to the solution of the Jewish question. The lack of clarity that evidently still prevailed among Nazi authorities in the late summer and early autumn of 1941 meant, for Bourin, that no decision for the final solution had yet been made. He argued that such an order in September 1941 was synonymous with the decision to deport the Jews to the East, one unquestionably made by Hitler, and at a time when he was gloomy about the slowing advance in the Soviet Union and the growing prospect of a long conflict. Soon after Bourin's study appeared, the archives of the former Eastern Bloc started to divulge their secrets. Predictably, a written order by Hitler for the final solution was not found. The presumption that a single explicit written order had ever been given had long been dismissed by most historians. Nothing now changed that supposition. In fact, little was discovered in Moscow or other East European archives that cast new light directly on Hitler's role in the final solution. Indirectly, nevertheless, new perspectives on the emergence of a genocidal program did provide fresh insights into Hitler's own role. One outstanding work which profited from the new research opportunities was Goetz Ali's study, published in 1995 of the interconnection of Nazi plans to resettle hundreds of thousands of ethnic Germans in the occupied territories of Poland, and the twists and turns of policy to deport the Jews. In his detailed reconstruction of racial policymaking in the eastern territories between 1939 and early 1942, Ali was able to show how increasingly radical anti-Jewish measures resulted from blockages produced by the brutally unrealistic resettlement plans of the Nazi authorities. Ali concluded that there was no single specific decision to kill the Jews of Europe. Rather, analogous to Momsen's notion of a system of cumulative radicalization, he posited a long and complex process of decision-making, with notable spurts in March, July and October 1941, but continuing still as a series of experiments down to May 1942. Hitler's role, according to this interpretation, was confined to decisions as an arbiter between competing Nazi leaders whose own schemes to deal with the Jewish question had created insoluble problems. Ahler's argument that there had been no precise point at which Hitler had given a single decision for the final solution has gained backing from a number of detailed regional studies into the emergence of genocide in the occupied territories. One outcome has been a clearer understanding of how, in the critical months of autumn 1941, Regional Nazi authorities resorted to increasingly radical self-help and local initiatives to free their areas of Jews, while there were evidently signals from Berlin indicating an approaching comprehensive solution to the Jewish problem and prompting regional Nazi leaders to adopt drastic measures to resolve their own difficulties. The conflicting interpretations of the aims of anti-Jewish policy in this phase seemed to imply that a fundamental decision had not yet been taken. 
Some local extermination programs set in motion by local Nazi satraps in coordination with Berlin did commence. In November 1941, construction began of a small extermination camp at Bergetz in the Lublin district of the General Gouvernement, instigated by the SS police chief of the area, Odilo Globotznik, with the aim of liquidating Jews in that area incapable of working. In the Wartegau, the annexed part of western Poland, the regional police chief, Wilhelm Kupp, and the Gauleiter, Arthur Greiser, liaised with Berlin about locating gas vans at Chelmno. These began operations in early December to kill Jews from the overcrowded Wodz ghetto and elsewhere in the region as part of a deal to compensate for the influx of yet more Jews sent eastwards as part of the first wave of deportations from the Reich. But localized solutions, including the shooting of Jews on arrival from Germany in the Baltic in autumn 1941, did not yet form part of a fully devised comprehensive program. A final solution was still evolving, still in an experimental phase. Research had, in certain ways then, moved away from the differing hypotheses about the date of Hitler's decision for the final solution by implying or explicitly stating that no such decision had been made. By a different route, and on the basis of more profound research findings, this was returning to the broad thrust of the programmatic structuralist hypotheses of Brotzat and Mommsen from the late 1970s and early 1980s. But the conclusions were far from universally accepted. The emphasis upon local initiatives, improvised measures, unsteered processes unfolding until they metamorphosed into an unauthored program of extermination was not convincing to many historians. Some experts, prominent among them Christopher Browning, felt that for all the undoubted advances that detailed regional studies of emerging genocide had brought, the central direction of policy had been underplayed. The role of Hitler, too, seemed scarcely to figure in the new explanations. Was it likely or plausible that the most radical of radical anti-Semites had played no direct part in shaping the policies aimed at destroying his perceived arch-enemy? As David Bonkier, then, in a magisterial survey, Saul Friedlander had demonstrated even in the 1930s, Hitler had been more active in anti-Jewish policy, down to points of detail, than the earlier work, by Karl Schleunis in particular, had implied. It was not easy, therefore, to accept that he had remained detached from decision-making at precisely the time when his long-professed aim of removing the Jews was turning into practical reality. Browning continued in an array of important publications also to maintain the importance of a Führer order, and to date this, as he always had done, to summer 1941, the time of euphoria. He remained unmoved by the objections raised to this dating, though he emphasized that he was not positing a single decision, but envisaging the point at which Hitler inaugurated the decision-making process, the first move in developments that would stretch over the subsequent months. Other historians, equally anxious to emphasize Hitler's direct role in steering policy towards an intended and planned final solution, reached different conclusions about the timing of a Führer order. Richard Brightman dated a fundamental decision to exterminate the Jews by the dictator to as early as January 1941, adding, however, that if the goal and basic policies were now clear, the specific plans were not, and followed only after some time with the first operational decisions in July. In other words, Brightman was not positing an incisive policy decision, rather a statement of intent. But Hitler had long held the view that another war would bring about the destruction of the Jews, and at this point, in early 1941, in the context of planning Operation Barbarossa, deportation of the Jews to the Arctic wastes of the Soviet Union was opening up as a realistic prospect. There, over time, the presumption was that they would perish. It is difficult to see a Hitler decision in January 1941 stretching beyond that ultimate, though still vague, notion of a territorial solution. Though this was itself implicitly genocidal, the vagaries of policy over the following months speak against seeing January 1941 as the date when Hitler took the decision for the final solution. An entirely different suggestion for the date of a Hitler order came from Tobias Jezak. In Jezak's view, the declaration of the Atlantic Charter by Roosevelt and Churchill on August 14, 1941, meaning that Germany would soon be at war with the USA, was the trigger for Hitler. Suffering at that point from a nervous collapse, and reeling from the recognition of the failure of his strategy to defeat the Soviet Union, to take the fundamental decision that the Jews of Europe should be physically destroyed. However, 
Jezak probably exaggerates the impact of the Atlantic Charter on Hitler. It is doubtful that this in itself was sufficient to provide the vital spur for such a momentous decision, one in Jezak's interpretation taken swiftly and without any consultation. Jezak is left, in fact, with little but speculation to support his claim that Hitler had already taken the decision when he met Goebbels on August the 19th to agree to proposals put to him by the propaganda minister to force Jews in Germany to wear the Star of David. Another interpretation of a fundamental decision by Hitler to launch the final solution was proposed by Christian Gerlach. For him, the disparities in implementing anti-Jewish measures ruled out a specific central order by Hitler in summer or early autumn. Despite the evident escalation of genocidal actions, there was still a lack of clarity about the treatment of the deported Reich Jews, and the various regional liquidation measures were not yet coordinated. The need to provide precisely this clarification and coordination lay, he claimed, behind Heydrich's invitation to significant figures in those agencies concerned to a meeting at the Wannsee on December the 9th, 1941. Pearl Harbor then intervened, and the meeting was postponed. According to Gerlach's interpretation, by the time the meeting eventually took place, on January the 20th, 1942, Hitler's basic decision to kill all the Jews of Europe had taken place. In the context of a war that had now become global, Gerlach sees a speech made by Hitler to Reichsleiter and Gauleiter on December the 12th, and an accompanying series of private meetings with Nazi leaders during the following days, as tantamount to Hitler's basic decision for the final solution. Gerlach certainly makes a good case for a further radicalization of extermination policy in December 1941. But it is difficult to imagine Hitler, who refrained from speaking on the extermination of the Jews in other than vague generalizations even to his intimate entourage, choosing to announce a basic decision to instigate the final solution to a meeting of around 50 Nazi leaders. None of those present later referred to this meeting as of any particular significance with regard to the final solution. And Goebbels, whose diary notes form the source for Hitler's reported comments, summarized the remarks on the Jews in a few lines of an otherwise extensive diary entry, without highlighting them as of special importance. A recent meticulous examination of the complex evidence of decision-making on anti-Jewish policy between 1939 and 1942 offers yet another variant. Florent Braillard places the date of Hitler's order to commence the final solution as a comprehensive program later than any other historian had done, to June 1942, immediately following the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich in Prague. At Heydrich's funeral, June the 9th, Himmler told SS leaders that they would have completed the migration, Völkerwanderung, of the Jews within a year. This is the point, infers Breyer, linking Himmler's comments to reported draconian remarks about the Jews by Hitler around that time, that the final solution, meaning the program for the complete and rapid eradication of all Europe's Jews, was initiated. It perhaps seems more plausible, however, to see it as the last major escalatory push in establishing a Europe-wide killing program. Peter Longrich's magisterial study of the politics of annihilation had, in fact, already established, something by now widely accepted, also by Braillard, that a comprehensive program of extermination of European Jewry developed as an incremental process, with a number of acceleratory spurts between summer 1941 and summer 1942. Already by March and April 1942, as Longerich shows, plans were being elaborated to deport the Jews from Western Europe to the East and to extend the killing in Poland and Central Europe. Probably Heydrich's assassination provided the impetus to draw the threads together. It seems certain, given the fragmentary and unsatisfactory evidence, that all attempts to establish a precise moment when Hitler decided to launch the final solution will meet with objections. And, of course, much depends upon what is envisaged as a Führer order. Was it a precise and clear directive, or merely a green light, or nod of the head? Interpretation rests additionally upon whether decision-making on the final solution is regarded as a continuum with adjustments and acceleratory phases over the period of a year or so, or whether a point is sought where one precise quantum leap can be distinguished as forming the decision. And yet structuralist or functionalist accounts in which Hitler's role is minimized or marginalized also seem unsatisfactory. Ahler's emphasis, for instance, on the link between blockages in the Nazi plans for population transfer and resettlement of ethnic Germans, and the radicalization of anti-Jewish policy, though valid, 
does not explain why the failure of deportation plans led to genocide solely in the case of the Jews. This leads directly back to the role of ideology, often underplayed in structuralist accounts. Building on long anti-Semitic tradition, the Jews occupied a quite singular place in Nazi demonology and in plans for racial cleansing. The Jews had been the number one ideological enemy of the Nazis from the beginning, and their murderous treatment in 1941 followed not only years of spiraling persecution, but also repeated statements by Nazi leaders, most prominently Hitler himself, advocating their removal. So we are back to Hitler, and to his role in the way the Nazi system of rule operated. It seems impossible to isolate a single, specific, Führer order for the final solution, in an extermination policy that took full shape in a process of radicalization lasting over a period of about a year. At the same time, much indicates that the extermination program did not develop without a decisive role being played by Hitler himself. To reconcile these two statements, we should look both for a series of secret authorizations for particular radicalizing steps, which can only be deduced from indirect or secondary evidence, and for a number of public signals or green lights for action. We should also recognize that Hitler was the supreme and radical spokesman of an ideological imperative that, by 1941, had become a priority for the entire regime leadership. Within that framework, we now need to consider how Hitler shaped the path to genocide. The Dialectic of Radicalization in Nazi Anti-Jewish Policy Before the War With Hitler's takeover of power on the 30th of January 1933, a proto-genocidal elite, backed by huge mass movement, the Nazi Party and its multifarious sub-organizations, held together by the utopian vision of national salvation, to be achieved through racial cleansing at the core of which was the removal of the Jews, gained control over the instruments of a modern, sophisticated state system. The vision, both in its positive aspects, creation of a unified people's community, rebuilding of national pride, grandeur and prosperity, and its negative elements, destruction, not just defeat, of political opponents, elimination of those whose physical or mental weakness or disability were seen to threaten the health and strength of the population, exclusion of Jews from public life and their physical removal from Germany, was embodied in the figure of the leader. Hitler's Weltanschauung, a set of visionary aims rather than precise policy objectives, now served, therefore, to integrate the centrifugal forces of the Nazi movement, to mobilize the activists, and to legitimate policy initiatives undertaken to implement his expressed or implied will. The very looseness of the ideological imperatives encouraged functionaries of the regime, in myriad ways, to work towards the Führer to contribute to the accomplishment of the visionary goals which Hitler represented. Among these goals, the removal of the Jews was a tangible objective, and one in which the pathological fixation of Hitler himself accorded with the central conviction of the ruling Nazi elite, and also fueled the widespread and often bitter anti-Semitism at the party's grassroots, a seething pot of hatred into which a poisonous concoction of socio-economic grievances, anger and resentments was poured. And among the anti-Semitic elite, now running the German state, no one took a more radical stance on the removal of the Jews than Hitler himself. Countless speeches during the 1920s had demanded that the Jews, whom he often associated with vermin or bacilli, should be removed, sometimes likening the removal to that of a parasite or a germ, excised in order to leave a healthy organ. Such imagery implied that removal meant destruction or annihilation, vernichtung a term Hitler used in his bacteriological similes. The language is not just extreme, but points also to a proto-genocidal mentality. The man with this mentality was now in charge of the German state, and countless Germans were seeking at every turn to implement what they interpreted to be his wishes. Hitler was a shrewd enough politician to know when to turn down his violent anti-Semitism, in the early 1930s, as the Nazi party exploited conditions of economic depression and political collapse to soar towards power, his speeches focused less on anti-Semitism. The huge electoral gatherings, as he knew, were scarcely to be won over to the NSDAP solely by verbal assaults on the Jews. So Hitler adjusted to circumstances. His inner convictions, most notably the central place of the removal of the Jews in his ideological vision, 
had, however, not altered one jot. Once in power, Hitler knew he had to be tactically alert, particularly to the international pressures on Germany's still weak economic and military position, to press ahead with measures against the Jews, measures which he personally wanted and which the Nazi movement was demanding. When necessary, he could, and did, keep the party radicals in check. At other times, it was useful to unleash their pent-up violence on the Jews. This produced a characteristic process of radicalization during the 1930s. In accordance with Hitler's expressed or presumed wishes, a green light to step up measures against Jews would be given to party radicals. Pressure for action would build from below, which Hitler, though remaining aloof, would approve. When, for domestic or external reasons, violent forms of persecution became counterproductive, Hitler would intervene to channel the attacks into highly discriminatory anti-Jewish legislation, at each stage placating the radicals by ratcheting up the radicalization of the measures adopted. There was, therefore, a continuing dialectic between wild actions from below and orchestrated discrimination from above. Each phase of radicalization was more intense than its predecessor. The momentum in this way was never allowed to die. It is well to keep in mind Hitler's pre-war role in the Jewish question when considering the part he played in the emergence of the final solution. It is plain that between 1933 and 1939, the decisive steps in the increasingly radical persecution of the Jews were taken with his approval and authorization even where, for tactical reasons, he remained publicly detached or concealed the nature of his own interventions, letting it be known that he favoured action, invariably signalled through vicious public statements, and verbal approval of the most radical measures in confidential, unminuted discussions, formed the usual pattern. Hitler was certainly involved when vital decisions, with regard, for example, to the boycott in 1933, the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, and the pogrom of 1938, were needed. Crucial shifts in policy required his approval. It is hard to imagine that this was not the case during the months in 1941 to 1942, when extermination of the Jews began to take shape as a concrete policy option. As German expansionism led to acute tension in foreign affairs and the threat of war grew ever closer, Hitler evidently began to dwell upon the consequences for the Jews, his obsession with what he saw as the guilt of the Jews for the immense but futile blood sacrifice of Germany during the war of 1914-1918, and for the calamitous defeat and revolution that had ensued, had never left him. He was already blaming Jewish warmongers in Great Britain and the USA, as well as the pernicious Jewish-Bolshevik Soviet Union, for any new conflagration that might ensue. And the growth and spread of German might now meant that notions of removing the Jews no longer had to be confined to the Reich itself. The Jews must get out of Germany, yes, out of the whole of Europe, he told Goebbels at the end of November 1937. That will take some time yet, but will and must happen. In the anti-Jewish climate in Germany around the time of the Reichskristallnacht pogrom of November 9th and 10th 1938, a climate more menacing than ever before, Marks of a genocidal mentality were in clear evidence in the Nazi leadership. Threats to the existence of the Jews were specifically linked to the outbreak of another war. Hitler himself still connected this with revenge for 1918. Speaking to the Czechoslovakian foreign minister, František Kuvelkovsky, on January 21, 1939, he stated, The Jews here will be destroyed. The Jews did not bring about November 9, 1918 for nothing. This day will be avenged. He was not, of course, announcing to a foreign diplomat a preconceived extermination plan or program. But the sentiments were not merely rhetoric or propaganda. There was substance behind them. In his long Reichstag speech on January the 30th, 1939, in the main a defiant tirade against what he portrayed as Jewish-inspired Western warmongers, Hitler declared, In the course of my life I have very often been a prophet and have usually been ridiculed for it. Today I will once more be a prophet. If the international Jewish financiers in and outside Europe should succeed in plunging the nations once more into a world war, then the result will not be the Bolshevizing of the earth, and thus the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. This was not the decision to proceed with the irreversible mission, effectively a prior announcement of the final solution. Nor was it simply 
a rhetorical gesture designed to put pressure on the international community. The speech, though not inaugurating an extermination program which would only fully materialize over three years later, can nevertheless be seen to hold a key to Hitler's role in the final solution. The frequency of his later repetition of the prophecy, which significantly he consistently misdated to September the 1st, 1939, the day that war began, and at decisive junctures in the unfolding of genocide, shows how it was etched on his mind. Between 1941 and 1945, in the years when the final solution engulfed the Jews of Europe, Hitler referred publicly and privately to his prophecy of 1939 on more than a dozen occasions. No Nazi leader was left unaware in these years of the prophecy the Führer had made about the Jews. Josef Goebbels, Hans Frank, and Alfred Rosenberg were among his underlings who alluded to it at different times. The German public, too, heard Hitler openly speak of it in major public addresses broadcast to the nation on no fewer than four occasions in 1942 alone, at the very time that the grisly operations in the death mills in Poland were going ahead at full tilt. For Hitler, the prophecy donated the indelible link in his mind between war and revenge against the Jews. Its repetition also served a wider purpose. Without ever having to use explicit language, the prophecy beyond its propaganda effect to condition the general population against humanitarian sympathy for the Jews, signalled key escalatory shifts, acted as a spur to radical action by conveying the wish of the Führer, and indicated to insiders Hitler's knowledge and approval of the genocide. Hitler's Prophecy and the Implementation of the Final Solution Hitler returned to his prophecy on January 30th, 1941, as his war against the Jewish Bolshevik archenemy was taking concrete shape in his mind. In the very weeks prior to the speech, he had agreed to Heydrich developing a new plan to deport the Jews from the German sphere of domination to replace the short-lived and now defunct notion of deporting them to Madagascar. Ideas of deporting the Jews of Europe to a conquered Soviet Union after an anticipated quick victory over Bolshevism were already being aired by the SS leadership. The repeat of the prophecy at this juncture, then, was a veiled hint that the hour of the showdown with the Jews was approaching. By the time Hitler's prophecy next leaves a mark in the records, in the summer, genocide was already raging in the Soviet Union. The slaughter, initially confined in the main to male Jews, which had begun with the German march into the USSR on June the 22nd, 1941, had been widened massively from August onwards to include Jewish women and children. This crucial extension of the killing followed a series of one-to-one -one discussions in mid-July between Hitler and Himmler. No record of the talks was kept, but the outcome, we can reasonably infer, was that Hitler gave Himmler authorization to extend greatly the number of killing units in the East. Hitler wanted to be kept informed on the progress of the killing. According to a message from the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller, on August the 1st, continual reports from here on the work of the Einsatzgruppen in the East are to be presented to the Führer. By midsummer 1941, party fanatics and police leaders were vehemently pressing for Jews, portrayed as dangerous agitators on the home front, to be removed from German cities. A step on the way was to compel them to wear some form of identification on their clothing. Hitler alone, it was accepted, could take the decision. Goebbels undertook to present the case. He found the dictator, on visiting the Führer Hauptquartier, on August the 18th, recovering from illness. Despite the astonishing successes of the Wehrmacht in the first weeks of the attack on the Soviet Union, there were ominous signs already in August that victory would not be attained before winter set in. After the first major dispute with his army leaders, Hitler was in a state of nervous tension. Goebbels had come at a good moment to put his case for permission to compel Jews to wear the yellow star. Hitler granted the propaganda minister what he requested. In so doing, he once more had recourse to his Reichstag prophecy, voicing his conviction that this was coming true with uncanny certainty. The Jews will not have much cause to laugh in future, Hitler said. A key moment of radicalization of anti-Jewish policy within Germany was plainly interpreted by Hitler as a step towards the fulfillment of his prophecy. The decision, which again all Nazi leaders acknowledged could only come from Hitler, to deport Reich Jews to the East, taken in September 1941, constituted a major step in the direction of total genocide. 
Hitler had until this point insisted on awaiting final victory in the East. Now, aware that the war would drag on, and conscious that the USA would probably soon be involved, he agreed to demands from a number of Nazi leaders. Exploiting Stalin's deportation of hundreds of thousands of ethnic Germans from the Volga region to the wastes of western Siberia and Kazakhstan to press for retaliatory measures. To deport German, Austrian and Czech Jews to the east even though the war was not over. It was a vital shift in policy. And the decision, indicated by Himmler on September the 18th, 1941, was taken by Hitler himself. At precisely this point, the Nazi Party's propaganda department distributed posters to all party branches containing the words of Hitler's prophecy. Evidently, the prophecy had by now acquired symbolic status, serving as a weapon of propaganda in preparing the German population for the deportation of the Jews through hardening the climate of opinion. The self-created logistical problems following from the deportation decision gave the genocidal impulses in Poland, the Baltic and other conquered eastern territories a strong and irreversible push. In the autumn, the steps into all-out genocide began to follow quickly, one after the other, as the German advance faltered and plans for full-scale deportation to the Russian wastes had to be postponed, then abandoned. A month or so after giving the order to deport Jews from the Reich, with Himmler and Heydrich as his dinner-table guests in his field headquarters, and in the context of comments betraying his knowledge of the SS's attempts to drown Jewish women in the Pripyat marshes, Hitler reminded his entourage of his prophecy of destruction for the criminal race which had been responsible for the dead of the First World War, and now again hundreds of thousands in the current war. Genocide was by now in the air. As preparations were underway to deport the first batches of Jews from Berlin and other German cities, Goebbels, who continued to be one of the most vehement advocates of the deportation, sustained the poisonous atmosphere with a menacing article on November the 16th, 1941, in his newspaper Das Reich, headed The Jews Are Guilty. Here, too, in an article widely circulated among the troops on the Eastern Front, as well as within Germany, Goebbels directly invoked Hitler's prophecy of the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe, commenting that, we are experiencing right now the fulfillment of this prophecy. Probably, given the centrality of the issue, the article had been discussed with Hitler. An added remark by Goebbels that any sympathy with the Jews was misplaced certainly mirrored a sentiment forcibly voiced by Hitler on more than one occasion, as the final solution became reality. On December the 11th, 1941, following the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor four days earlier, Hitler announced Germany's declaration of war on the United States. By then, as we have noted, the killing of Jews in the Wartegau in western Poland was beginning, and the construction of a small extermination camp at Birzhets in eastern Poland was underway. While deported Reich Jews had already been shot on arrival at Kovno and Riga. But these were as yet local rather than general solutions. The changed situation after December the 11th now provided new impetus towards a comprehensive solution. The following day, Hitler addressed his party leaders in the Reich Chancellery in Berlin in a speech which, as we have noted, Christian Gerlach took to be the announcement of his basic decision to exterminate the Jews. We have seen reason to doubt this interpretation. Even so, the speech was important. Goebbels summarized next day in his diary what Hitler had said. His brief report indicates how, in the fundamental issue of anti-Jewish policy, crucial phases of radicalization could be initiated. With regard to the Jewish question, Goebbels noted, the Führer is determined to make a clean sweep. He prophesied that if they brought about another world war, they would experience their annihilation. This was no empty talk. The world war is here. The annihilation of the Jews must be the necessary consequence. This question is to be viewed without sentimentality. A repeat of the point expressed in his newspaper article a month earlier. We are not to have sympathy with the Jews but only sympathy with our German people. If the German people has again now sacrificed around 160,000 dead in the Eastern Campaign, the instigators of this bloody conflict will have to pay for it with their own lives. In the atmosphere immediately following such a decisive moment as the entry of the USA into the war, Hitler's repetition of his prophecy was, to go from Goebbels' account of it, more menacing than ever. Four days later, on December the 16th, Hans Frank, Governor-General of Poland, speaking to his own minions in Krakow, 
repeated Hitler's prophecy in almost the identical words that Hitler himself had used in Berlin. What is to happen to the Jews? he then asked rhetorically. Do you believe they'll be accommodated in village settlements in the Ostland? They said to us in Berlin, Why are you giving us all this trouble? Liquidate them yourselves. He concluded, We must destroy the Jews wherever we find them. But he did not know how this would come about. Obviously, a comprehensive extermination program still had to be developed. He reckoned there were 3.5 million Jews in his domain. We can't shoot these 3.5 million Jews, he declared. We can't poison them. But we must be able to take steps leading somehow to a success in extermination. Over the following weeks, the steps were taken. Hans Frank and his underlings did not need any specific Hitler order. They understood perfectly well what the repetition of his prophecy had meant. The time for the final reckoning with the Jews had arrived. The prophecy had served as the transmission belt between Hitler's own inner conviction that the war would bring about the final destruction of European Jewry and the actions of his underlings, determined to do all they could to work towards the Führer in turning Hitler's presumed wishes into reality. Little over a month later, at the Wannsee Conference on January the 20th, 1942, to discuss the organization of what Heydrich called the coming final solution of the Jewish question, Hans Frank's right-hand man, Josef Bühler, state secretary in the General Gouvernement, asked directly if a start could be made in his area. He wanted the Jews there, most of them, as he emphasized, incapable of work, removed, and the Jewish question there solved as soon as possible. The authorities there would do all they could to cooperate. Bühler, and behind him Hans Frank, had their way. By spring 1942, what was now rapidly emerging as a comprehensive extermination program was extended from certain districts to the whole of the General Gouvernement, as trainloads of Jews were ferried to the newly erected camps of Birgetz, Sobibor, and a little later Treblinka, in what soon came to be called Aktion Reinhardt. Ten days after the Wannsee Conference, speaking on January the 30th, 1942, at the Sportpalast in Berlin, Hitler again invoked his prophecy. I already stated on the 1st of September 1939 in the German Reichstag, he declared, as always deliberately misstating his prophecy, that this war will not come to an end as the Jews imagine, with the extermination of the European Aryan peoples, but that the result of this war will be the annihilation of Jewry. For the first time, the old Jewish law will now be applied, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Monitoring reactions to the speech, the SD, Sicherheitsdienst, remarked that Hitler's statement had been taken to mean that very soon the last Jew would disappear from European soil. At the end of March 1942, Goebbels wrote explicitly in his diary of the liquidation of Jews in the Lublin district of the general government. A judgment is being carried out on the Jews, which is barbaric, but fully deserved, he noted. The prophecy which the Führer gave them along the way for bringing about a new world war is beginning to come true in the most terrible fashion. He added, Here too, the Führer is the unswerving champion and spokesman of a radical solution. During spring and summer of 1942, the deportation to the death camps in Poland now including the biggest of all, Auschwitz-Birkenau, was extended to the whole of the General Gouvernement and to Slovakia, and finally to the occupied countries of Western Europe. Previous important decisions concerning the solution of the Jewish question, such as the introduction of the Yellow Star or the deportation of Reich Jews, had required Hitler's authorization. It is unimaginable that it was not again sought and given for the massive extension of the killing program. As Florent Braillard has argued, this feasibly occurred during discussions with Himmler under the impact of Heydrich's assassination. The head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, who bore the chief responsibility for the implementation of the extermination program, repeatedly claimed that he was acting on Hitler's authority. In a secret memorandum of July the 28th, 1942, to SS Obergruppenführer Gottlob Berger, head of the SS Hauptamt, for instance, Himmler stated, the occupied eastern territories are being made free of Jews. The Führer has placed the implementation of this very difficult order on my shoulders. 
He certainly spoke privately with Hitler on several documented occasions directly about extermination policy. According to post-war testimony provided by his former personal adjutant, Otto Günche, and his manservant, Heinz Linge, Hitler showed a direct interest in the development of gas chambers and spoke to Himmler about the use of gas vans. Though their testimony is inaccurate in a number of ways and cannot be trusted with regard to detail, Adolf Eichmann, in effect the manager of the final solution, Dieter Wislitzeni, one of his deputies, and Rudolf Hirsch, the commandant of Auschwitz, all asserted after the war that the orders passed on to them to implement the final solution derived from Hitler himself. Second and third tier SS leaders directly implicated in the final solution were in no doubt themselves that they were fulfilling the wish of the Führer. There is no reason to doubt that they were correct, and that Hitler's authority, most probably given as verbal consent to propositions usually put to him by Himmler, stood behind every decision of magnitude and significance. Hitler was kept informed of the scale of the removal of the Jews, sometimes in detail. On December 29, 1942, for example, Himmler gave him a report, one of a series, of bandits liquidated in southern Russia and the Ukraine over the previous three months. The total executed numbered 387,370. Of these, 363,211 were Jews. It was a clear indication that, as Hitler had agreed with Himmler a year earlier, the Jews were being exterminated in the East as partisans. But by the end of 1942, the killing was no longer confined to the East, and now extended over much of Nazi-occupied Europe. And as Hitler repeated his prophecy in his speech to the party's old guard in Munich on November the 8th, according to the SS's reckoning, close to four million Jews were dead. Hitler continued to be closely involved in the final solution. The pattern is by now familiar. In line with his prophecy, Hitler's aim to remove, which now no one was in doubt, meant kill the Jews of Europe, set the framework. Within this general remit, a radicalizing proposal would then be put to Hitler to deal with some specific aspect of the overall problem. Hitler would give his approval. The action would follow. In this way, he agreed in September 1942 to a request by Goebbels to remove Jews from the armaments industry and have them transported to the East. The roundup of these Jews followed in January 1943. In December 1942, Hitler acceded to Himmler's request to have 600,000 to 700,000 Jews in France, where the southern part of the country was now also under German and partly Italian occupation, done away with. Only diplomatic difficulties over the deportation with both the Italians and the French prevented the implementation of the order. As the war turned against Germany, such diplomatic difficulties intensified. Hitler's allies, looking to a post-Nazi future, became increasingly unwilling to deport their Jews to the gas chambers. In the wake of the German military crisis following the catastrophe at Stalingrad, Hitler took a direct hand in trying to persuade them to be more cooperative. Obsessed as ever with the notion of demonic Jews presumed to be behind the war, he pressed his Romanian and Hungarian allies to sharpen the persecution. His language, when addressing the Hungarian leader, Admiral Horty, in mid-April 1943, was particularly vicious. Hitler urged him, to no avail, to adopt a harsher stance towards the Jews, mentioning that the Polish Jews were being dealt with like a tubercular bacillus that attacks healthy bodies. A month later, speaking to Goebbels, Hitler likened Jews to insects and parasites, declaring, There is nothing else open to modern peoples than to exterminate the Jews. The prophecy, by now essentially a cliché used to legitimate to others and to himself, that the war he had launched, which was driving Germany ever closer to perdition, had been inevitable and warranted, was still evidently deeply embedded in Hitler's psyche. On May the 26th, 1944, he addressed a large gathering of senior officers on the Obersalzberg, above Berchtesgaden. In a central passage of his lengthy speech, he referred to the treatment of the Jews. The old notion that had possessed him since 1918 of Jews as a treacherous fifth column of seditionists and revolutionaries on the home front, was again voiced. The removal of the Jews had eliminated this danger within Germany, he declared. He defended himself against suggestions that it might have been achieved more humanely by emphasizing once more the war as an all-or-nothing, life-or-death struggle, giving an apocalyptic vision of what would happen if Germany's enemies were victorious, and speaking of the horrors of the bombing of Hamburg and other cities, summing up, this entire bestiality has been organized by the Jews. 
Humanitarian feelings were, therefore, he argued, cruelty towards one's own people. He went on to hint at the action about to be taken against the Jews in Hungary. The horrific destruction of Hungarian Jewry would indeed unfold within weeks, following pressure directly imposed by Hitler, to remove what he called a seamless web of agents and spies. It was at this point that he turned once more to his prophecy of 1939, that in the event of war not the German nation but Jewry itself would be eradicated. The audience of Wehrmacht officers responded with storms of applause. In the last weeks of the war, the prophecy served Hitler's need for self-justification. Although his last recorded monologues from early 1945 survive only in dubious form, the comments about the Jews on February the 13th certainly sound authentically Hitlerian and are fully in line with the repetitions of his prophecy that we have noted. I have fought openly against the Jews, the text runs. I gave them a last warning at the outbreak of war. I never left them in uncertainty that if they were to plunge the world into war again, they would this time not be spared, that the vermin in Europe would be finally eradicated. And as we saw at the outset, his very last political manifesto was still urging the relentless persecution of the Jews. Conclusions Hitler's prophecy of January the 30th, 1939, which he was to invoke so frequently in the following years, has claimed to be regarded as a key both to Hitler's mentality and to the ways he provided directions for action in the core element of his ideology. As such, it highlights the central ideological driving force of National Socialism, and also shows the ways in which fundamental and unchanging ideas were accommodated to shifting forms of draconian persecution and translated into ever more radical policy decisions. It illustrates, in fact, how charismatic leadership operated in the crucial area of genocidal policy, and how Nazi activists at different levels of the regime were adept in knowing how to work towards the Führer without having to wait for a precise Führer order. It seems unlikely that Hitler ever gave one single explicit order for the final solution. Within the unchanging framework of his prophecy, he needed do no more than provide requisite authorization at the appropriate time to Himmler and Heydrich to go ahead with the various escalatory stages that culminated in the murder of Europe's Jews. In speaking, as he had done in March 1942, of Hitler as the unswerving champion and spokesman of a radical solution to the Jewish question, Goebbels was correctly summarizing Hitler's role in the final solution. This role had often been indirect rather than overt frequently granting approval rather than initiating. The unparalleled outpourings of hatred were a constant amid the policy shifts. They often had a propaganda or mobilizing motive and usually remained generalized. Even so, there cannot be the slightest doubt. Hitler's role was decisive and indispensable to the unfolding of the final solution. Had another form of nationalist government been in power at the time in Germany, it would probably have introduced discriminatory legislation against Jews. But without Hitler, the creation of a program to bring about the physical extermination of the Jews of Europe is unimaginable. Part 2 Popular Opinion and the Jews in Nazi Germany 5. The Everyday and the Exceptional the Shaping of Popular Opinion, 1933-1939 to Generalizations about attitudes of the German people towards the Nazi regime tended in the early post-war years to polarize around diametrically opposed interpretations. On the one hand, especially outside Germany, the emphasis was laid upon enthusiastic mass backing. On the other, among Germans themselves, the stress fell upon the helplessness of a population which for the most part rejected the regime but in the face of unparalleled terror and repression, could do little but engage in passive resistance. Since the social history of Nazi Germany began in earnest in the 1970s, as late as 30 years after the end of the war, a voluminous literature has wholly amended such crude generalizations. Even so, the tendency in the initial phase of Alltagsgeschichte, the history of everyday life, which set in during the 1970s, was to underline the extent of popular opposition. 
This sometimes came close, it seemed, to playing down or grossly underestimating the spheres of consensus which provided the regime with an extensive basis of support and at times enthusiastic approval. Both elements, nonconformity and consent, opposition and approval, were features of attitudes of the German people during the Third Reich. They are two sides of the same coin. Most Germans were neither dyed-in-the-wool Nazis nor convinced anti-fascists. Partial rejection of Nazism existed in large parts of the population alongside partial approval of the Nazi regime. In what follows, an attempt is made to explore how far varied reactions to what we might call, drawing on Max Weber, everyday and exceptional factors, might help to explain this Janus face of popular opinion. A few remarks about the concept of popular opinion and about the sources that have to serve to reconstruct it, are necessary at the outset. Research on Popular Opinion Sources and Problems The term public opinion is scarcely usable for the Third Reich. At any rate, we have to accept that public opinion, in the sense of opinion that was publicly expressed, was, from 1933 onwards, practically only that of the regime or rival entities among the leadership elite. Nevertheless, the regime recognized the continued existence of spontaneous, non-directed expressions of unofficial opinion beneath the surface of conformity. The very absence, indeed, of freely expressed public opinion encouraged the regime to set up its own agencies to register and test the mood of the population, if only to be able to improve the framing of propaganda. So instead of public opinion, a term suited to the pluralistic formation of attitudes in a liberal democracy it seems more appropriate to speak of popular opinion to embrace the unquantifiable, often generalized, diffuse and uncoordinated, but still genuine and widespread views of ordinary citizens. Trying to reconstruct trends in opinion is difficult enough for historians, especially before opinion polls, even in democracies where opinion is shaped by pluralistic political parties, interest groups, trades unions and mass media. In conditions of repressive dictatorship, where nonconformist opinion is subjected to draconian persecution and where monopolistic propaganda determines official views, such an attempt faces severe problems. The first of these is obviously the lack of surviving authentic expressions of opinion in their original form. Open statements of political opinion in contemporary diaries, letters and private papers are, given the fear of reprisals, unsurprisingly rare. So reconstructing opinion trends in the Third Reich necessarily has to fall back in large measure upon sources from agencies of the regime or oppositional sources, in both cases serving directly political purposes and subject to evident but unquantifiable internal bias. Beyond that, evaluation has to take into account the fact that people were intimidated into concealing their true views or at best expressing them only obliquely or in camouflaged form. It can consequently be taken for granted that critical views registered in sources favorable to the regime represent the tip of the iceberg. Equally, pro-Nazi views recorded in oppositional sources are probably minimized and, when they occur, are to be taken as significant indicators of support for the regime. A final general difficulty in trying to assess opinion in the Third Reich is that there is no possibility of quantifying attitudes. Trends of opinion after 1933 can, therefore, only be impressionistically reconstructed. And interpretations can scarcely do justice to the multiplicity of individual motives of approval or rejection of specific measures. Conclusions are necessarily, then, limited and hypothetical, not definitive. Even so, if we want to grasp anything about the attitudes of the German people towards the Hitler regime, we have to establish, at least in broad contours, those aspects of Nazi policy which found substantial popular appeal and those which met with notable criticism. Despite the interpretative problems, not least that of the representative nature of registered opinion, systematic and critical analysis of surviving sources allows for significant insights into mentalities and behavioral patterns of the German people during the Nazi era. Two types of source are of special importance in reconstructing popular opinion in the Third Reich. The regular confidential reports of Nazi agencies on the mood and bearing, Stimmung und Haltung, of the people, compiled, for example, by party offices, local government offices, the judicial administration, the Gestapo, and the SD, 
and the detailed and extensive reports on the situation in Germany produced by exiled left-wing oppositional groups, especially by the Social Democratic Party, SPD, leadership based in Prague, then Paris, and now known as the Zopade, based upon information smuggled out of the Reich by the illegal opposition. The regular situation reports, or reports on mood, Lager und Stimmungsberichte, from Nazi agencies, constitute a source of primary importance for the social history of the Third Reich. This extraordinarily voluminous and varied, if widely scattered, material, compiled by the lower tiers of the regime's administration, such as local police stations, government offices, and party and SD offices at society's grassroots, is less attuned than reports produced higher up the ladder to stylized propaganda, and as such, permits glimpses beyond the standardized picture of manufactured opinion. Certainly, analyzing this material is no simple matter. First of all, its survival is very uneven, both in quality and quantity. Continuous reports for the entire pre-war period can be found at the regional level only in Bavaria and the Palatinate, at that time part of Bavaria. Even there, the position is uneven. At the local level, some reports survive in full sequence and are of extraordinary value. But for other localities, they are intermittent, sparse in content, and of limited use, and in many places they are missing altogether. So there are huge gaps in the overall picture. Moreover, before 1938, there was no regular central reporting by the SD, and reports became frequent only once war broke out. An evaluation of the material that remains, despite the gaps still extremely voluminous, has to contend, alongside other problems, with that of selection and representative content. Secondly, there is no certain or unobjectionable way of eliminating the bias and inherent subjective nature of the reports. The aim and character of the specific series of reports have naturally to be borne in mind. But even more important is to develop a familiarity with the style of reporting, which allows a critical sense of where registered comment is contrived or authentic. The sheer quantity of surviving reports from scattered localities and from differing provenance provides some level of control on reported comment. And thanks to the unrefined and unpolished expression of many of those reporting at the grassroots, their reports give a relatively firm notion of the main trends of opinion. Thirdly, it is not easy to contend with the problem of fear and intimidation within the population. Those compiling the reports were themselves fully conscious of the difficulty in penetrating the reluctance of people to express their true feelings openly. Quite apart from the bias of the sources, it is essential, therefore, to be able to read between the lines, to recognize the silences, the sentiments left unexpressed. Even so, it is astonishing, given the circumstances, how many people were prepared, despite the possible dangers, to risk pointed criticism of the regime and that such criticism was so extensively and often so plainly reported. In this respect, it is in some ways more difficult to interpret reporting of expressions of approval for the regime, where an intrinsic readiness to say what was expected prevailed, and where conformity might have been less than freely displayed, than oppositional comments and actions which often speak for themselves. The implicit danger is an overestimation of oppositional leanings and a tendency at the same time to play down conformist and acclamatory attitudes. Also invaluable for the reconstruction of popular opinion and for the social history of the Third Reich in general are the extensive reports of the Zopade, which survive between 1934 and 1940. These focus naturally on the situation and attitudes of the industrial working class, but are also extremely informative on other groups of the population and on issues such as the church struggle, the persecution of the Jews, and quite especially, the state of the economy. The central Germany reports, which the Zopade circulated each month from May 1934 to April 1940, in Prague, 1934 to 8, and Paris, 1938 to 40, on thin green paper, hence the alternative name Green Reports, were compiled on the basis of regular and extensive reports submitted from border secretaries stationed around Germany's border in Czechoslovakia, Switzerland, Belgium, and Denmark, for instance. These, in turn, drew on contacts with the illegal opposition within Germany. The information emerging from the Reich, obviously at great danger to those smuggling it out, touched upon many varied assets of daily life in Nazi Germany, above all, 
conditions within German factories. Especially for the years 1935 to 1938, the material is very extensive. The Germany reports, reproduced in two parts, reports and overviews, are themselves no more than a fraction of the total material. Reports, especially those of the border secretaries, almost completely preserved in Bonn, contain a mass of detailed information which, for security reasons, could not be included in the Germany reports. The colouring of this material is easy to see, leaning as it does towards a natural tendency to exaggerate the alienation of the mass of the population from the Nazi regime. It conveys the impression that the regime rapidly lost any basis of popularity and was forcibly sustained only by terror. Both the border secretaries, and quite especially the Zopade leadership, nonetheless tried to avoid simplistic generalizations about popular opinion, qualifying the readiness of some reporters to resort to undifferentiated assessments, and at times pointing to the subjectivity and unreliability of the information received. Even with regard to the working class, they emphasized the variance in political attitudes and avoided resort to the type of one-dimensional, heroic view of working-class resistance which might have been expected and which frequently appeared in reports by the exiled Communist Party of Germany, KPD, organization. The Zopade reports amount to an extremely valuable source, therefore, and, together with the inferences to be drawn from the reports of regime agencies, enable the construction of a nuanced depiction of trends of opinion in the Third Reich. The Significance of Everyday Conflict in the Formation of Opinion Detailed analysis of such sources plainly shows how significant everyday experiences were to the formation of political experience. The material conditions of daily life directly and continually determined the attitude of the population to national socialism. The extent of the disillusionment and discontent with Nazi rule, which arose from subjective experience of socio-economic conditions and was mirrored in political nonconformity and oppositional behavior, is truly striking. At the same time, it is equally clear that it was often superficial and of no political significance. In fact, as the reports show, oppositional attitudes were often infiltrated and distorted by ideas revealing at least partial acceptance of Nazism. Consent and dissent could be apparent within the same individual. All sections of the population, even parts of the working class that had imbued socialism, showed the impact in ideological disorientation of relentless exposure over years to publicly unchallenged propaganda. In the absence of the counter-exposure to the public criticism of government policy, which is the basis of pluralistic opinion formation in a democracy, the political horizons of the masses increasingly narrowed, while the effect of at least parts of Nazi ideology both widened and deepened. The discontent produced by the worries and cares of daily life were therefore often accompanied by acceptance and approval of the essential thrust of Nazi policy. The first clear signs of extensive discontent, largely rooted in economic disappointment, could already be glimpsed in 1934. The initial wave of optimism about economic recovery, especially the work creation measures, gave way in the spring of 1934 to increasing criticism of the regime. This manifested itself most vehemently among those who before the takeover of power had been numbered among the fervent supporters of the NSDAP. Numerous reports, for instance, record the dissatisfaction in the middle classes about the unfilled promises to the Mittelstand. Small traders complained about the disadvantages arising from the regime's economic policies, lack of credit, absence of orders placed by the state, the burden of taxation, the excessive compulsory donations for the party the exploitation of the Mittelstand in favour of big industry, and, not least, the failure to eliminate the department stores and consumer associations. Material self-interest was plainly at the root of such criticism. A change of mood against the regime could also be observed among farmers. The disadvantages of the Reich-entailed farm law, Reich Zeberhofsgesetz, of September 1933, the increasing intervention of the Reich food estate, Reichsnährstand, in the marketing of agricultural produce, recalling the hated coercive economy of the First World War, and other purely sectoral concerns prompted the farmers' discontent and dissatisfaction with the regime in rural areas. The head of the regional administration, Regierungspräsident, in one part of Bavaria, spoke of a dangerous loss of confidence in broad sections of the peasantry. According to one report, at party meetings in his region directed at grumblers and miseries, 
seen as responsible for the downturn in mood, negative attitudes had surfaced at a flash. Farmers were critical of everything which could in any way be criticised. The general mood, it was reported, bore comparison with that of 1917 to 18. This was unquestionably a gross exaggeration. It would be a mistake to overrate the significance of grassroots critical opinion in the summer of 1934. Even the Zopadé's Germany reports, whose general tenor, as we have noted, was self-evidently oppositional, pointed out that, apart from the limited nature of the complaints motivated by economic grievances, the regime could still depend upon extensive reserves of support, especially the idealism of younger Germans, and the fact that Hitler still captivated the masses even though the party was increasingly in the firing line of criticism. According to Zobade reports, the middle-class disillusionment, based as it was on no more than material dissatisfaction, was far removed from political aim and wholly devoid of significance. Fear of Bolshevism and lack of political education sufficed to underpin support for the regime despite economically motivated complaints. The main characteristics of popular opinion in the summer of 1934, a judged Zopade informants, were passivity and grumbling. But beyond that, to oppose the regime, it doesn't go that far. Shrugging the shoulders, political cluelessness, fear and the atomization of society, meaning that there was not only no public opinion in Germany, but also no sectional opinion any longer, were said to characterize the attitude of the people in 1934. Even without taking account of the repressive power of the regime, the all-embracing propaganda, and the hundreds of thousands of beneficiaries of the system who constituted its hard-core support, the Zopade reached a pessimistic evaluation of the fractured popular opinion, even among opponents of the regime. The weakness of the opposition is the strength of the regime. Its opponents are ideologically and organizationally weak. They are ideologically weak because the vast number of them are mere discontents, grumblers whose dissatisfaction derives purely from economic causes. This is especially so among the middle classes and peasantry. These sections of the population criticize more loudly and strongly than any others, but their criticism mainly arises from personal interests. They are least ready to fight the regime in any serious way because they know least of all what they should be fighting for. Fear of Bolshevism, of the chaos which, in the opinion of the vast majority, especially in the middle classes and peasantry, would follow the fall of Hitler, still forms the negative basis of the regime's mass support. Its opponents are organizationally weak because it is in the essence of the fascist system not to allow any organizational concentration of its opponents. The forces of reaction are extraordinarily splintered. The working class movement is still split between socialists and communists. The attitude of the church-based opponents of the regime is disunited. Their struggle is evidently not least directed towards improving the position of the churches within the regime. A new high point of discontent was reached in winter 1935-6. Severe food shortages, especially of butter, fats, eggs and meat, together with a corresponding steep rise in food prices, while wages fell or at most were held stable, led to hardship and suffering, especially among the working population of large cities. In contrast to the wave of criticism of 1934, which largely emanated from the peasantry and middle classes, a bitter mood in 1935-6 made itself felt above all within the industrial working class. Serious working-class unrest was recorded with concern in the reports of all Nazi authorities. They noted an increase in derogatory comments about the state and a revitalization of illegal opposition whose agitation in factories and motorway construction sites, known centers of unrest, now found growing appeal. A rise in the numbers of cases of protective custody and those coming before the special courts, set up in 1933 to deal speedily with cases of subversive comment or action, seem to reflect the discontent, not least since for the most part the workers arrested had no history of political activism. Bitter criticism was rampant, attacking working conditions in factories, the German labor front, the Nazi party and the state leadership, the injustice of a system where workers were paid starvation wages, though industrialists still drew their massive salaries and profits, the corrupt Bostum, Bon Socrati, of the regime, and the wastage of money on grand Nazi building projects, while an acute shortage of housing and falling standard of living prevailed. The regime's own internal reports in Bavaria 
spoke of a growing discontent with regime and party in the working class. The Zopa Day reports from industrial areas were more expressive. According to one report from the Ruhr district, the shortage of foodstuffs had provoked enormous tension in the entire population. It is possible to speak of a feverish unrest in all sections of the population. At the least opportunity in daily life, the most varied sorts of Nazis, SS, SA, NSV, DAF, etc., have the bitter anger directly thrown in their faces. In Saxony, the bitterness was said to have found vent in furious insults. Throughout the whole province, the mood against the regime has intensified in such a way that it would now only need a light in the powder keg to produce the explosion. In Rhineland, Westphalia, it was said that all sections of the population are opposed to the system. You have to be amazed that this government can still keep going at all. This was plainly a complete misjudgment. Other Zopade reports, in fact, were concerned not to exaggerate the significance of the critical mood. They stressed instead the divided opinion about the regime and the naivety of most critics, who were too short-sighted to draw ideological or political deductions from their discontent. They depicted, too, the prevailing conditions of fear, intimidation and atomization, which in practice excluded the possibility of directing the discontent into organized political aims. One report from Saxony called the extensive anger a purely emotional matter, without political reflection. A Bavarian report explained that it would be wrong to regard the generally prevalent poor mood as direct hostility to the ruling forces, and pointed out that despite the criticism to be heard everywhere, the orders of the rulers are carried out without any thought of resistance. It frequently happened that people who poured out their complaints about the state of affairs then shouted the loudest when filled with enthusiasm again by Nazi speakers at some rally or other. In the last years of peace, the morale of the peasantry and industrial workers caused the regime most concern because of their key importance to the economy. All sources indicate the widespread and growing discontent in farming circles between 1936 and 1939, as the needs of farming took second place to those of armaments production and pressure on the peasantry intensified. Beyond all other concerns in the countryside, the ever more acutely critical shortage of agricultural workers caused bitterness, anger and demoralization. The SD spoke in 1938 of a mood among the peasantry approaching complete despair. The flight from the land, becoming an avalanche as rural workers sought better paid jobs in the armaments industry, gave farmers the feeling of being crushed and produced a mood which turned partly to resignation and partly into an attitude of outright revolt against the farmers' leadership. The provincial farmers' leadership in Bavaria even reported a protest demonstration in February 1939 of around 50 peasants in Munich, adding, The shortage of hired hands, Dienstboten, has reached indescribable levels. The mood of the peasants has risen to boiling point. The ambivalence of the farmers' political attitude was nevertheless obvious. The same farmers who so vehemently demanded state help to prevent the flight from the land complained the loudest about the oppressive state intervention in agriculture. Indeed, the Nazi state had provided the peasantry, despite organizational disadvantages and mounting bureaucratic controls, with stable prices and protected marketing. The overall picture is not altogether straightforward. On the one hand, especially among older farmers, the criticism of the regime could be extraordinarily blunt. On the other hand, important elements of Nazi ideology undoubtedly found favour among the peasantry, so that specific dissatisfaction could never be channelled into a serious political danger for the regime. As Zopade reporters continually pointed out, outweighing the economic bitterness was the acute fear of communism, constantly reinforced by Nazi propaganda. The peasants, it was noted, fear that Bolshevism would take their land and property from them, so they prefer to come to terms with the Nazis, who only half expropriate them. Within the working class, the critical labour shortage and the stress of an oppressive work rate led to an increase rather than decrease of industrial unrest during the last pre-war years. This found expression in absenteeism and falling discipline in the workplace. It was countered by intensified controls over the workforce, limits on movement of labour and tougher action against recalcitrant workers backed by the power of the state and its organs of repression. Industrial conflict in the Third Reich was inevitably politicized. 
and the attitude of large sections of the industrial working class towards the Nazi regime was reflected in their actions. Even so, the Zopperday reporters tried to avoid simple generalizations about workers' political views and stressed that opinion was influenced by varied objective factors, such as the composition of the workforce, the relations with the employer, working conditions in the factory, or the conduct of local party representatives. The differences between various industrial plants and their workers were too great, thought the Zopade leadership, to rule out subjective distortions in evaluating opinion. Apart from this difficulty, it could repeatedly be seen that the working class was more reserved, more careful, and more sceptical than other sections of society. Not because it was non-political, but because workers and their entire existence stood in a different relationship to the power of the regime than did peasants or tradesmen. It was also impossible to ignore the fact that the enormous increase in the work rate not only physically but also psychologically exhausts many workers. The superficial apathy and political indifference of the mass of the workers were said to be results of the repression and terror, the overlong working hours and inhumane work rate. In contrast to the view of some reporters who wanted to interpret the sagging productivity by workers in some industries as the result of sabotage and passive resistance, the leadership of the Zopade was inclined to conclude on the basis of the majority of the reports that the drop in productivity is less the consequence of conscious action than the expression of the widening grip of weariness. The entire tenor of the Zopade reports matches the impression gleaned from the regime's internal reporting. This was that down to 1939 the Nazi regime had almost wholly alienated the industrial working class, but had politically largely neutralized it. The Nazi success, in the view of the Zopade, was to have atomized the working class and smashed its leadership, which had earlier been capable at least in part of transcending the divisions among workers. This unifying force of the workers' movement no longer exists. The National Socialists have consciously destroyed it, and instead directed their policy at atomizing the working class. They have done something even beyond that. They have tried to break the psychological and moral force of resistance of workers through excessively long working hours and an attritional work rate. Superficially, it looks as if they have succeeded. The great mass of workers are exhausted and worn down. But in fact, this method has only deepened the differentiation within the working class. Those who used to think still think today, and those who did not think then, think now even less. Only that the thinkers are today no longer able to lead the non-thinkers. Everyday reality in the Third Reich gave practically every sector of the population cause, if in different degree, to be discontented. Reports in the pre-war years, both from opponents of the regime and from Nazi authorities, indicate disappointment, bitterness and disillusionment mainly arising from personal or sectoral material interests. This was the case among the lower civil service, teachers, parts of the free professions, people in business and the trades, among the bourgeoisie, and even among German youth. In all cases, the dissatisfaction had at its root the gap between the expectations that had been placed in National Socialism and the reality of the Third Reich, the true face of the people's community. There was no need, however, for the regime to be too worried about the discontent, except where poor morale among peasants or especially industrial workers had implications for economic production. The bitter complaints of primary school teachers, for instance, about low pay, teacher shortages, poor conditions in schools, attacks by the party and Hitler youth on teachers' pronounced status consciousness, and the lack of recognition of their selfless work in education as well as in numerous honorary positions of service for their local communities, were in political terms utterly unimportant. This was all the more so, since a high proportion of teachers evidently sympathized broadly with Nazi ideological aims, and, despite their discontent, were often prepared to act in the service of the party in onerous honorary offices. Nazi social policy prompted an astonishing level of open criticism and deep antipathy. The attitude of the population towards the regime nevertheless remained fragmented. Even within specific social groups, there was little unity of opinion, and it was naturally the case that concrete everyday experiences of a particular social group seldom had relevance for other groups. A critical, and even in places a hostile, popular opinion was not silenced in the Third Reich. 
but it was completely atomized and as a result rendered largely harmless. Without organized political opposition or a vehicle capable of orchestrating opinion, there was no possibility of creating horizontal opinion around a coalition of varied interests with the potential for political action. The Significance of the Führer Myth for Popular Opinion The indications of growing discontent in varied sectors of the population between 1933 and 1939 are, if not quantifiable, nevertheless unmistakable. The Nazi regime was evidently by 1939 far from realizing its ideal of a united people's community. Daily life under National Socialism was characterized by social tensions and discord. The shaping of opinion towards developments beyond the experiences of everyday life was, however, quite a different matter. In what we might call the exceptional sphere of politics, the regime was able to manufacture the desired national unity to an extraordinary extent, through the exploitation of anti-symbols and the fixation on distant utopian goals, both of which diverted concern, at least temporarily, from the arena of everyday conflict. In the exceptional sphere, rejection of National Socialism and opposition to its policies played as good as no role whatsoever. An example is the Jewish question, the core of the Nazi worldview. When non-Jews were directly confronted before their very eyes with outright Nazi brutality and savagery towards the Jewish minority, or felt their economic interests or even livelihoods threatened by the tightening boycott of Jewish businesses, they often reacted in a negative fashion, even in anger or disgust, though seldom, it seems, out of humanitarian sympathy for the victims. Such critical reactions, plainly visible during the anti-Semitic wave of 1935, reached a peak after the pogrom of the 9th to the 10th of November 1938, the so-called Reichskristallnacht, probably the only time that the Jewish question, if only briefly, played a central role in the formation of opinion. In the years after 1933, the Jewish question had actually less and less genuine relevance for the daily life of the majority German population. Increasingly, Jews were depersonalized, forced out of social and economic contact with non-Jews, largely removed from the daily life of the ordinary citizen and reduced in effect to an ideological anti-symbol. The consequence for the shaping of opinion was less the creation of dynamic hatred than of a lethal indifference towards the fate of the Jewish population. The further Jews were removed from the real world of everyday life, the more apparent was the indifference of the non-Jewish population. The relatively smooth course of anti-Jewish policy in the early war years reflected an ideological sphere of Nazi policy, the utopian goal of the removal of the Jews, which met with broad approval and hardly any rejection, not least because it scarcely touched in any direct sense the daily experiences of the vast majority of the population. In the exceptional, non-everyday sphere, a potentially wide consensus was available as compensation for the travails and disaffection of daily life. The more the people's community revealed itself to be an empty propaganda slogan, the more it had to be artificially manufactured. A type of pseudo-integration took place through projecting the positives in National Socialism onto Hitler, the charismatic leader, through focusing upon the ideals which he appeared to embody and upon his achievements. The greatest achievement of Nazi propaganda, Goebbels himself thought so, was the creation of the Führer myth. But that is only part of the truth of the matter. The supradimensional image of the Führer was not only a propaganda product injected into the population, but to a large extent the result of naive popular expectations of national salvation to be brought about by a coming great leader. The combination of suggestivity through propaganda and pre-existing belief in a great leader among extensive sections of the population led to an increasing readiness to dissociate the image of Hitler not only from that of the party, but also from the system itself. Just how far popular images of Hitler had detached themselves from his thoughts and actions can be seen, for example, in the acclamation he gained from the Röhm affair in 1934. Röhm's murderous action on the 30th of June 1934 was in the main completely misinterpreted, according to contemporary reports on popular opinion, allowing Hitler to appear as a leader standing above vested interests, concerned only for his people, ready to intervene when necessary against corruption, misuse of power, and injustice within the system. In reality, 
he had the leaders of the stormtroopers slaughtered to bolster his own power. In a phase of growing discontent, Hitler was able inordinately to strengthen, at the cost of part of his own movement, his public esteem as the people's leader, standing above and transcending the negative or distasteful aspects of his own party. The image of the Führer, far removed from reality, was crucial as an element of integration, since it was ever more plain that the party itself was divisive rather than unifying, and incapable of overcoming the grievances and resentments of everyday life. The hopes and expectations vested in Hitler have to be seen in part as a safety valve for the discontents of wide swaths of the public, reflecting the need for a point of salvation despite the unpalatable realities of daily life dominated by the party. The Führer stood for so many people beyond the party, beyond the everyday. His charisma remained largely untouched by the miseries and vexations of the everyday. Hitler's undoubted popularity in the pre-war years lay outside the everyday political sphere. In fact, it was in part a direct reaction against it. Hitler's popularity naturally rested, in the first instance, upon his perceived great achievements. Much of what he had to offer in spring 1933 had attractions for wide sections of the population, not just dyed-in-the-wool Nazis. This was the basis of the massive extension of his popularity. Once he could claim successes in tackling national problems, he could start to win acceptance not as a party leader, with all its divisive connotations, but as a national leader of stature, an emblem of unity. More than anything in the first phase of his chancellorship, far more than the slight improvement in the economy, Hitler owed the rise in his popular standing to the ruthless attack on the left, especially on the communists. The selective wave of terror directed at the left-wing parties, regarded in bourgeois circles not just as opponents of the Nazis but as enemies of Germany, gained Hitler enormous recognition. The leading article of a Bavarian provincial newspaper, not Nazi, though with Nazi leanings, on the 28th of February 1933, gives a vivid flavour of the prevailing atmosphere. The article was commenting, under the headline An End to Moscow, on the emergency decree of that day, the day after the Reichstag fire, which in one fell swoop legislated out of existence the liberal freedoms and basic rights of the Weimar Constitution. This emergency decree will find no opponent despite the quite draconian measures which it threatens. Against murderers, arsonists and poisoners, there can only be the most rigorous defence. Against terror, the call to account through the death penalty. The fanatics who would like to make a robber's cave out of Germany must be rendered harmless. The consequences of the most acute struggle against communism have finally been drawn. It concerns more than parties. It concerns Germany. In fact, the entire Western culture built upon Christianity. And for this reason, we welcome the recent emergency decree. The smashing of the left was terrain where the regime, in its initial stage, could build upon a broad, if imprecise, consensus which, despite the deep social, ideological and political divisions in German society, already existed outside the third or so of the population which had supported the SPD and KPD. The same applied to two other aspects of popular opinion. For one thing, there was a general conviction that only a strong state leadership could transcend the damaging and divisive conflicts, overcome Germany's deep-seated crisis and bring about new unity and prosperity. Beyond this, there was the perhaps even more widespread feeling that Germany had not only been unfairly treated in the Versailles Treaty, but was also ringed by enemy states ready to take advantage of the nation's weakness in order to destroy the German people. A government which held out hope of restoring Germany's power, and with that could appeal to national pride as well as guarantee greater security towards Germany's enemies, had good prospects of winning massive popularity. Both spheres of consensus inner unity and external strength, merged in the popular image of Hitler. Compared with the situation in 1932, the internal achievements of the regime, all personalised as Hitler's achievements, work creation, restoration of order, economic recovery, seemed hugely impressive. Counter-arguments to the Nazi interpretation that the Führer had rescued Germany were other than within parts of the working class which had paid the lion's share of the price for the economic miracle of the Third Reich, hard to formulate convincingly. Anyone disagreeing with the official version could easily be denigrated as a grumbler and griper, 
a sour malcontent. Above all, in the realm of foreign policy, Hitler's achievements seemed incomparable. Though his aims were mainly misinterpreted, he was unquestionably able to win overwhelming backing for the attainment of a new international standing for Germany, which had seemed unimaginable at the time of the seizure of power. The genuinely popular foreign policy successes down to 1939 drew extensively upon the resentments and hopes of most Germans. Hitler seemed in this to be the representative not of specifically Nazi, but of nationalist values. And it was as national triumphs that the remilitarization of the Rhineland, the Anschluss of Austria, and, to a lesser extent, the homecoming of the Sudeten Germans were cheered by most Germans, also by those who were highly critical of the regime's attacks on the Christian churches or its social policy. The diffusing and neutralization of army opposition through Hitler's success in the Munich settlement of 1938 is well known. The left-wing opposition, for its part, repeatedly acknowledged how much Hitler's run of diplomatic coups had undermined their attempts at subversive propaganda. A report, soon after the remilitarization of the Rhineland, from the border secretary for northern Bavaria, provides a typically pessimistic assessment. From contacts in upper Franconian industrial districts, he had learnt of a mood of the great mass, that nothing could be done against Hitler if things became serious. People were completely convinced by the modern armaments and striking capability of the German armed forces. It had to be admitted, the border secretary added, that this consideration occupied the entire thoughts of the great majority of the population, and that poor business trends, low wages, stability of the mark, and so on, were not much discussed. The great mass of the population believes that he, Hitler, will put that right. In short, it's a very bad time for us again. The pseudo-integration of German society, which was to a large extent the product of the Hitler myth, served not only to diffuse potential internal points of crisis, but also to legitimize the Nazi regime abroad. The recognized plebiscitary acclamation for Hitler's foreign policy was not least of significance in the development of appeasement thinking. The unity of leadership and people, constantly trumpeted by Nazi propaganda, appeared abroad to represent something not far from the truth. The Nazi regime was unable to put its social promises into practice. Attainment of the people's community, from the outset a utopian idea, retreated ever farther into the distance as all sections of the population came under the pressure of the armaments economy. The social backbone of national socialism, the petty bourgeoisie and rural population, was by the end of the 1930s largely resentful and disillusioned. The working class was politically neutralized by repression and remained alienated from the regime. Disaffection and discontent were, however, only one facet of popular opinion. More important was its accompaniment. The growing depoliticization, the increasing indifference, the astonishing apathy of the great mass of the people. In the view of the Zopade, the entirely powerless whinging was underpinned by neither political insight nor political will. In March 1938, the Zopade sought to summarize the main characteristics of German popular opinion. Simply to judge external impressions would lead to wrong conclusions, thought the Zopade leadership. But, insofar as it is possible to generalize about the attitude of an entire people at all, the report stated, the following could be concluded. 1. Hitler had approval of a majority of the people in two essential issues. He has provided work, and he has made Germany strong. 2. There is extensive discontent about prevailing conditions, but this affects only the daily concerns until now has not led to fundamental hostility to the regime among most people. 3. Doubts about the continued existence of the regime are widespread, but equally widespread is the cluelessness about what could replace it. The achievement of the Nazi regime with regard to popular opinion is well summarized in this appraisal. Terror and intimidation on the one hand, and the massive but superficial politicization that embraced all public life on the other, promoted in reality a pervasive depoliticization of the masses, reflected in the sense of futility among opponents of the regime and the atomization of opinion. The vacuum that arose from this depoliticization was filled with the pseudo-integrative force of the Führer myth. In Max Weber's conceptualization, charismatic authority faces the constant danger of routinization, 
Fair Alltäglichung, becoming the everyday, instead of remaining something exceptional. Only the dynamism of unbroken recurring success could sustain such authority. In the context of the Third Reich, the pseudo-integration of the community of fate of the German people could be sustained only by national successes. In Hitler's own view, only constantly renewed national success could prevent stagnation and the feared social unrest that would result from it. The more domestic policy revealed disunity and conflict, the greater was the need for the transcendental unity which foreign policy triumphs, if always of short duration in their effect, could produce. The progressive dynamism was, however, not endless. The end was war and destruction. Hans Diel, the Sopa Dei's border secretary of northern Bavaria from 1934 to 1938, based in the Sudetenland, not far from the German frontier, recognized already in 1936 at the remilitarization of the Rhineland the connection between the pressure of acclamation and the dynamic of German foreign policy. In a letter to the former chairman of the SPD, Otto Wels, on the 7th of March 1936, Diel wrote, Hitler can no longer escape from his policy. He has removed the possibility of that through the dissolution of the Reichstag and the new election. With more than 90% of the votes, he will get approval for this, his policy, on the 29th of March. Then the ring is sealed, and he can no longer step out of it. The dictator lets himself be bound by the people to the policy which he wanted. The links between the everyday sphere of conflict and the consensus sphere, which emanated from the exceptional, charismatic determinants of Nazi policy, formed an essential part of the unstable dynamism of the Nazi regime. 6. German popular opinion during the final solution. Information, comprehension, reactions. One is left with the troublesome thought that there may not have been much resistance at all to involvement in genocide, that it is by no means foreign to man in society, and that many features of contemporary civilized society encourage the easy resort to genocidal holocausts. This was Leo Cooper's concluding sentence to his chapter on the German genocide against Jews, placed in a comparative perspective in his book, Genocide, Its Political Use in the Twentieth Century. I would like to bear this comment in mind in the following reflections on German popular opinion during the Third Reich and its responses to the final solution. It seems to me that Cooper's remark directly poses the open question, going beyond historical research and beyond German-Jewish relations, of whether the perceptible German patterns of opinion and behaviour toward the Jews are consonant with what could conceivably take place in other advanced societies, and involving minority groups other than Jews, where, for whatever reasons, a paranoid ideological thrust levelled at a recognisable and largely unpopular ethnic minority could be turned into a central focus of government policy. Not long ago it would have seemed futile to pose any questions about the nature of popular opinion in Nazi Germany, widely regarded as a monolithic, totalitarian, mass society, manipulated and repressed into uniformity by a powerful combination of propaganda and coercion. The mass society image had links with two radically opposed sets of generalized impressions of the position of the German people in the Third Reich, which thrived in and immediately after the war. On the one hand, there was the distorted image prevalent in Allied wartime propaganda, and continuing to some extent even in the post-war period, of a population won over almost in its entirety by Nazi ideas, and therefore of a more or less direct equation of German and Nazi. The apologetic counter-picture placed the emphasis not on propaganda but on repression. This was the self-image of the Germans, as the helpless victims of totalitarian terror, incapable of voicing their dissent from Nazi policies. Recent research on German society under Nazism has had no difficulty in demonstrating the palpable absurdity of both types of generalization. It has become increasingly clear that attitudes and behavior of ordinary Germans in the Third Reich on a whole range of issues were far from uniform, and that a plurality of political, social, moral, ethical, intellectual and religious influences continued to exist, posing at least partial blockages to Nazi ideological penetration. 
The very wide variety and extent of political nonconformity and dissent has been amply demonstrated, particularly in issues affecting the spheres of interest of the Christian churches and daily economic concerns, especially labor relations. In such cases, collective protest and forms of civil disobedience were far from unknown. In the most celebrated instance, the so-called euthanasia action, a genuine issue of humanitarian concern, a halt, at least in part, was called in August 1941 to the liquidation of hereditary and incurably sick persons in asylums within Germany itself, as a result of the growing popular unease and objections articulated by leading churchmen. The fact that protest could and did take place in a range of issues, even including, as in the euthanasia action, a directly humanitarian issue, itself indicates the hollowness of the apologetics that the terroristic repression of a totalitarian system was sufficient in itself to deter any dissent. Of course, the fear element as a genuine deterrent from opposing anti-Jewish policy has to be highly rated, but terror alone would not have sufficed to quell objections had the so-called Jewish question been an issue of importance, relevance, and above all, self-interest to a large number of Germans. The apologetics that people did not know the fate of the Jews can be fairly rapidly dispelled. But what I would like especially to suggest in this paper is that the general passivity which marked the most pervasive reaction, or perhaps one should say non-reaction, to the persecution and extermination of the Jews reflected above all the low level in the ranking of priorities which the fate of the Jews occupied in German consciousness. The lack of interest in or exclusion of concern for the fate of racial, ethnic or religious minority groups marks, I would argue, at the societal level, a significant prerequisite for the genocidal process, allowing the momentum created by the fanatical ideological hatred of a section of the population to gather pace, especially, of course, when supported by the power of the state itself. The following comments concern themselves with popular opinion in Germany only at the time, between 1941 and 1943, when the genocidal process had reached its climax. It is hard to imagine that any expression of public concern could, by this stage, have presented a major obstacle to the determination of the Nazi leadership to exterminate the Jews, even if the extreme emphasis upon the secrecy of the final solution itself suggests the regime's uncertainty about its public reception. But the difficulties for the Nazis in arriving at that stage would have been incomparably greater had the position of the Jews been incorporated into the sphere of humanitarian self-interest and self-defense at a much earlier stage by the Christian churches, and before 1933 also by the trade unions and the anti-Nazi political parties. In what follows, I want to consider briefly, and by way of a few selected examples from the available evidence, three aspects of popular opinion and the final solution. Whether the information in circulation was of a kind which allowed people to deduce the nature of Nazi anti-Jewish policy in Eastern Europe. Whether the genocidal character of the policy was comprehended. And what sort of reactions the final solution provoked among the German people. Information the notion that there was an effective wall of silence around information about the final solution inside Germany, the post-war apologia that no one had been aware of what was happening to the Jews, has been thoroughly disposed of, not least in Walter Lacke's book, The Terrible Secret. Of course, it goes without saying that it is impossible to establish how many people knew of the extermination of the Jews and what degree of knowledge they possessed. There is no good reason to doubt that many people were genuinely shocked at the post-war revelations about the scale and nature of the Holocaust, and at the disclosed horrors of the extermination camps, and that they had never possessed genuine and exact information about what was going on in the occupied territories. But what can be established beyond question is that widespread rumours were in circulation about the fate of the Jews, and that the information contained in the rumours was often explicit enough to provide an unmistakable indication that Jews were being killed in great numbers in the East. No less than Hitler himself referred to public rumours about the extermination of the Jews in one of his Table Talk monologues in October 1941. And a year later, Martin Bormann felt it necessary to counter rumours about very sharp measures taken against Jews in the East, which had been, as he said, a topic of discussion among the population. Such evidence is sufficient in itself to suggest that information pointing to genocidal policies was widely available in Germany, 
and certainly not confined to a tiny minority of the population. How many chose to close their ears to such rumors cannot, of course, be elicited. Many doubtless became skilled at knowing how not to know. What was the nature of the rumors referred to? Some fragmentary local SD reports, which have survived, confirm the existence of rumors of mass shootings of Jews as early as autumn 1941, and indicate that ordinary Germans who were keen to find out could ascertain with some accuracy what was happening. According to a report from Minden in December 1941, it was being said in the district that all the Jews were being deported to Russia, the transport being carried out in cattle cars once they had reached Warsaw, and that once in Russia the Jews were being put to work in factories while the old and sick were being shot. Rumours in the Erfurt area in April 1942, where there was said to have been considerable interest in acquiring information, stated that the Sicherheitspolizei had been given the task of exterminating Jewry in the occupied territories, with thousands of Jews having to dig their own graves before being shot, and shootings reaching such an extent that members of the extermination squads were suffering nervous breakdowns. An extraordinary record both of the nature of the rumours in circulation and of the information open to those interested in acquiring it is provided by the remarkable diary notes kept by Karl Duerkefalden, son of a worker in the Zeller district of Lower Saxony, who himself later became a skilled technician and engineer. He heard of the deportation of the Jews of Holland from a conversation with a Dutch lorry driver in July 1942, and a few months later recorded the news of deportations of French Jews which he heard from the BBC. The wife of a Jew in the area told him details in July 1942 of the transportation of the last Jews from Peine, in Lower Saxony, to Theresienstadt, and of the conditions of other Jews from the area who had been deported earlier to Warsaw. In autumn 1942, he heard again on the BBC of the gassing of Jews in motor vans. A soldier who had formerly worked in the same firm provided him in January 1943 with information about the shooting and gassing of Jews from France and other countries who had been shipped off to Poland and he learned from the same source that only a fraction, a tenth it was said, of the former Jewish population still survived in the town of Vilna. His brother-in-law, a construction engineer who had helped build a bridge across the Dnieper near Kiev, visiting him on June the 6th, 1942, on leave from the front, gave him a graphic description, recounted in the diary in detail, of the shooting of 118 Jews from the workforce, Jews who had been ill-provisioned and had become too ill and weak to work. Asked if he had seen it himself, his informant told Duerkefalden that he had stood twenty metres away. He spoke further of the mass burial of fifty thousand, on another occasion of eighty thousand Jews, and on a further trip home from the front, declared that there were no more Jews in the Ukraine. They were now all dead. Compared with information on shootings, rumours of gassing seem to have been relatively sparse. As in the case of Duerkefalden, some information was available by listening to foreign broadcasts, an audience estimated to have been, despite the draconian penalties, in the millions rather than the thousands. Here, too, rumours were spread by soldiers on leave from the front. Surviving records, it can be confidently asserted, can hardly bear sufficient testimony to the extent of knowledge of the gassing operations. Even so, the silence, compared with the availability of information on the shootings, suggests that knowledge of the gassings and in particular of the conveyor belt extermination of the death camps, was relatively limited in extent. It might be expected that information on the camps would be more extensive in the eastern regions of the Reich than in the far west. According to a report from Upper Silesia in mid-1943, the slogan, Russland Katyn, Deutschland Auschwitz, had been chalked up on walls in parts of Upper Silesia. An explanatory note pointed out that the concentration camp Auschwitz, generally known in the East, is meant. Though I have not encountered the name of Auschwitz or of any other extermination camp in documents emanating from western parts of Germany at that time. Clearly, not everyone in Germany was hearing stories about the Jews in the East. But even the few examples from a far more extensive array of evidence, which I have quoted here, demonstrate categorically that hard information, not just vague rumour, was being brought back to the Reich and was available. Its extent was considerable, the information itself often impressive in its detail. Only those anxious to shut their ears to the rumours in circulation could have been utterly ignorant, 
and only the willfully ignorant could have imagined a drastically different fate for the Jews than was actually in store for them, even if the exact character and scale of the final solution was scarcely conceivable. The question of the comprehension of what was happening, partly answered on the above evidence, will detain us only for a short while longer. Comprehension What people made of the information coming their way, how far they comprehended the full significance of the information and grasped the magnitude of the developments unfolding in the East, are questions which, by their nature, can scarcely be answered in any precise way by the historian. As Walter Lacker has said, those who had witnessed the murder of a thousand people or heard about it from an unimpeachable source could still persuade themselves that this had been an exceptional case. They might even forget it. After all, a great many people were killed in the war. Human life was cheap. However, it is difficult to imagine that the evidence we have already seen and the further examples I am about to provide left much doubt in the minds of the purveyors and the recipients of the information that the radical solution to the Jewish question, which Hitler himself, Goebbels, and others were openly hinting was underway, meant more than simple resettlement of the Jews. It is difficult to imagine, in fact, that it could have been taken to mean anything other than what it was. Systematic physical annihilation. Genocide. To return to Karl Dueckefelden for a moment. At the beginning of February 1942, he had heard on the BBC a broadcast by Thomas Mann, who had mentioned that 400 young Dutch Jews had been killed in Germany through the testing of poisonous gas. Dueckefelden put this information, as he did on other occasions, in his diary notes, in the context of official statements by the Nazi leadership. On February the 24th, 1942, Hitler delivered a major speech on the anniversary of the Nazi Party's foundation, in which, as in several other speeches that year, he alluded to the destruction of the Jews with reference to his baleful prophecy of January the 30th, 1939, when he had forecast the destruction of European Jewry in the event of another war. The report of the speech on the following day in the Nieder Zeichsische Tageszeitung had one paragraph relating to the prophecy part of Hitler's speech under the heading, The Jew is being exterminated. Der Jude wird ausgerottet. It was precisely this page of the newspaper which Dueckefelden kept in his diary. The extreme anti-Jewish sentiments expressed in some letters from soldiers at the front, which at times gave explicit details of mass shootings of Jews, one surviving letter speaks of the shooting of 30,000 Jews in one town, also included direct references to Hitler's stance on the Jewish question, interpreting the war in classical Nazi fashion as a struggle brought about by the Jews and destined to end in their destruction. Comprehension about what was taking place is evident in the comments. One, stating that the great task imposed on us in the struggle against Bolshevism resides in the annihilation of eternal Jewry, went on, only when you see what the Jew has brought about here in Russia can you really understand why the Führer began the struggle against Jewry. What sort of suffering would not have fallen upon our fatherland if this beast of mankind had retained the upper hand? Another, this time from a lance corporal serving on the Western Front, and evidently of an extreme Nazi mentality, expressly referred to Hitler's prophecy in a malevolent tirade in which, among other things, he thanked the Sturmer for remaining true to its principles in the Jewish question. He added, Things have now finally reached the point which our Führer at the outbreak of this struggle prophesied to world jury in his great speech. Gradually this race is being ever more reminded of these words. All its efforts won't any longer be able to alter its fate. Other soldiers sent letters with similar sentiments direct to the Sturmer, which still had a circulation during the war estimated at over 300,000. Surviving sources from the home front, too, indicate that comprehension of what was happening to the Jews went beyond belief that the reported atrocities were isolated incidents. As the war started to turn sour for Germany, situation reports of the SD and other Nazi agencies recorded awareness that Jews were suffering a dire fate in the occupied territories, and the fears that there would be retaliatory measures taken against Germany in the increasingly likely event of a lost war. An SD report from Franconia in December 1942 pointed out unequivocally that one of the strongest causes of unease among those attached to the church and in the rural population 
is at the present time formed by news from Russia in which shooting and extermination, Ausrutung, of the Jews is spoken about, adding the widely held opinion in the rural population that if the Jews come again to Germany, they will exact dreadful revenge upon us. Nazi propaganda exploiting the discovery of Polish officers' graves at Katyn was also countered, according to SD reports, by remarks that the Germans had no right to condemn Soviet atrocities when, on the German side, Poles and Jews have been done away with in much greater numbers. Clergy in Westphalia were reported as declaring that the terrible and inhumane treatment meted out to the Jews by the SS demands nothing short of God's punishment for our people. If these murders do not bring bitter revenge upon us, then there is no longer any divine justice. The German people has taken such blood guilt upon itself that it cannot reckon with mercy and pardon. These selected examples from the available evidence provide incontrovertible testimony to a plain awareness of the genocidal nature of Nazi policy toward the Jews, even though the actual details of the final solution were known only to a relatively small number of people. Those who closed their ears to the available information doubtless closed their minds to the unmistakable significance of that information, and many who heard and even understood had, it seems certain, been affected by years of dehumanizing Nazi propaganda and the increased brutalization of the wartime period, and grasped reality only in an abstract or remote sense, along the lines that terrible things happen in war. Such partial comprehension was still reconcilable with genuine expressions of shock at the post-war exposure of the reality of the final solution. Lastly, we move on to a brief attempt to place the evidence I have so far surveyed in the context of overall reactions of the German people to the radicalization of anti-Jewish policy. Reactions The lack of uniformity in reaction, which had been perceptible in the pre-war era in popular responses, for example to the promulgation of the Nuremberg Laws in 1935, or the Reichskristallnacht pogrom in 1938, is still plainly discernible in the period of the final solution. On the one hand, there are reflections in the available sources of a hardening of attitudes toward Jews in verbal expressions of hatred and of approval of Nazi policies, though one should bear in mind here the probability that outrightly Nazified sentiments are overrepresented in SD reports and the like. Contrasting reactions, verbal expressions of sympathy and solidarity with Jews existing amid the general climate of hostility, were also registered among a small minority of the population. The liberal intelligentsia, active churchgoers, and left-wing opponents of the regime, as before the war, were the groups most likely to be sympathetic to Jews. Three examples referring to the deportations will illustrate the mixed recorded reactions. The Gestapo in Bremen indicated in November 1941 that, while the politically educated section of the population generally welcomed the imminent evacuation of the Jews, churchgoing and commercial circles especially, show no sympathy for it and still believe today that they have to stick up for the Jews. Both Catholics and Protestant supporters of the Confessing Church were said to have vehemently expressed their pity for the Jews. The deportation of Jews from Minden, a few weeks later, reportedly prompted the great concern of a large proportion of the population, and the voicing of two basic viewpoints. The likely retaliation abroad, especially in America, with reference to the way the Crystal Knight pogrom had harmed rather than helped Germany, and secondly, a more humanitarian standpoint which, it was said, could not be widely registered but could be heard in a large section of the better-off circles, especially among the older generation, that the deportation was far too hard, that many Jews could not be expected to survive the journey to the east in the middle of winter, and that they were all Jews who had lived in the district since time immemorial. A third response was then noted, among the people's comrades who understand the Jewish question, which was that the entire action is absolutely approved of, and the German identity feeling brought into prominence. Finally, the transport of the last Jews from Lemgo in July 1942 also attracted considerable attention and provoked mixed responses. The deportation, it was observed, was generally negatively criticised, by a large proportion of the older population, among them party members. It was objected that the hardship now to be imposed upon the Jews was unnecessary, 
since they were in any case dying out in Germany. Even people who had previously demonstrated their national socialist attitude were said to have upheld the interests of the Jews, and people in church-going circles spoke of the coming punishment of God. Although those with confirmed Nazi views sought to explain that the action was fully justified and absolutely necessary, this argument was countered by the opinion that the old Jews could not do any damage, would in fact not harm a fly, and that there were many among them who had done much good. As we have already suggested, the fairly widespread knowledge of the mass shootings of Jews was also compatible with a spectrum of responses ranging from overt approval to blank condemnation and above all with an apathetic shrug of the shoulders, the feeling of impotence, or the turning of the face from unpalatable truths. Much suggests, in fact, that this last type of reaction, that is, non-reaction, was the most commonplace of all. If one term above all sums up the behavioural response of the German people to the persecution of the Jews, it is passivity. The passivity was consonant with a number of differing internalised attitudes toward Jews, most obviously, it corresponded to latent anti-Semitism, and arguably to a mentality of moral indifference. It also mirrored apathy, a deliberate turn away from personal concern, and a willingness to accept uncritically the state's right to take radical action against its enemies. Above all, I would argue, passivity, as the most general reaction, was a reflection of a prevailing lack of interest in the Jewish question— which ranked low in the order of priorities of most Germans during the war and played only a minor role in the overall formation of popular opinion. At the time that Jews were being murdered in their millions, the vast majority of Germans had plenty of other things on their mind. Let me return now to the considerations I raised at the outset. I hope I have sufficiently demonstrated that information about the final solution was widely available and that the significance of that information was often well comprehended. I have also attempted to illustrate the varied reactions to the Jewish question, and have argued that the momentous scale of the inhumanity carried out in the occupied territories was of relatively little concern to most Germans. Given the access to information on genocide and comprehension of that information, should people have reacted differently? Would the populations of other countries have responded in more honourable fashion in similar circumstances? I suspect not. Certainly, the decline of basic humanitarian and moral values among a sizable proportion of the population of Nazi Germany was an extremely steep one, even before their almost collapse during the war itself. But the liberal assumption that people will instinctively defend other human beings against mass slaughter seems at least questionable. To cite Leo Cooper again, it may be that one must allow for the possibility that there are historical situations or periods in which genocide is taken for granted. In the case we have been considering, it seems clear that, although the Jewish question was not an issue of the greatest moment to the majority of the population, the widespread latent anti-Semitism, which itself conditioned the absence of any serious and organized opposition to anti-Semitism from non-Jewish institutions before the Nazi takeover of power, was quite sufficient to allow the anti-Jewish radical momentum of the Nazi regime from 1933 onwards to gather pace, until, given the existential conditions of the war years, it was as good as unstoppable. Self-preservation is not a particularly admirable instinct, but especially in a climate of repression and terror, it is usually stronger than the instinct to preserve others. It goes hand in hand with moral indifference and apathetic compliance but there may be little in it which is peculiarly German, or specific only to the Jewish question. The most obvious conclusion would seem to me that the failure, if that is the right word, of German popular opinion with regard to the Jews during the Third Reich was really the failure of the pluralistic society of the pre-Nazi era to anchor the defence of Jewish interests in its organisational and institutional structures. For, it seems to me, only the incorporation of minority interest into the organized defense of majority interest against authoritarian inroads provides the structural framework where the processes which can culminate in genocide are blocked from the outset. 7. Reactions to the Persecution of the Jews The significance of the Jewish question for the broad mass of the German population in the Third Reich 
is a complex issue which has prompted frequent speculative generalization but little systematic exploration. Alongside the apologetic, much heard in Germany since the end of the war, that the persecution of the Jews could be put down to the criminal or insane fixations of Hitler and the gangster clique of top Nazis around him, in the face of widespread disapproval by the mass of Germans insofar as they knew and understood what was going on, exists the counter-generalization, much favoured by Jewish historians, of a German people thirsting for a war against the Jews, in which anti-Semitism, based on a centuries-old tradition of persecution, played a central role in providing Hitler's support from the German people and in motivating the popular adulation of the Führer. According to this interpretation, the central role of anti-Semitism in Hitler's ideology is echoed by its central role in the mobilization of the German people. Far from emphasizing a more or less spontaneous eruption of popular anti-Semitism in the socio-psychological crisis of Weimar, contrasting interpretations have stressed the conscious manipulative exploitation of anti-Semitism, which thus functioned as a tool of integration and mass mobilization by the Nazi regime, whether in the interests of imperialist finance capital or as the cementing element which guaranteed the continuing ceaseless negative dynamic diverting from the inevitable failures of socio-economic policy and holding the antagonistic forces of the Nazi movement together. This chapter seeks to confront such interpretations with as exhaustive an examination as possible of the empirical evidence from Bavaria for the reactions of ordinary people to the anti-Jewish policies of the Nazi regime. By examining dissent from and approval of various facets of the persecution of the Jews, we are attempting to explore the spheres of penetration of Nazi racial ideology in the consciousness of ordinary Germans, and to ask to what extent anti-Semitism served to integrate the German people and mobilize them behind the Nazi leadership during the Third Reich. At the outset of our inquiry, we can do no more than touch upon the pattern of Jewish settlement in Bavaria, the regional distribution and socio-economic structure of the Jewish population, and the traditional framework of its relations with the non-Jewish sector of the population in Bavaria, all of which helped to shape the context in which the radical anti-Semitism of the Nazis has to be placed. The regional distribution of Jews in Bavaria was very uneven. As a consequence of Wittelsbach policies in the 16th and 17th centuries, in which the Jews had been driven out of the Bavarian heartlands, there were few resident Jews in Alt Bayern, Upper and Lower Bavaria, and the Upper Palatinate, even deep into the 19th century. By contrast, the diversified structure of land ownership and lordship in Franconia and Swabia had tended since the 16th century to promote settlements of Jewish communities in the countryside and in small towns. Since the early 19th century, the Jewish proportion of the total population had been in decline. In 1818, after Lower Franconia and the Palatinate had been incorporated into Bavaria, the 53,208 Jews accounted for 1.45% of the entire Bavarian population, including the Palatinate. The restrictive legislation of 1813, the so-called Juden Edict, which severely limited Jewish mobility, seriously contributed, however, to continued demographic decline. By the time of German unification, the number of Jews had fallen to 1.04% of the entire population, by the turn of the century to 0.9%, and by the beginning of the Third Reich to a mere 0.55%. As many as 88% of Bavaria's Jews still resided in 1840 in country districts or small towns. Only following the ending of the restrictive legislation in 1861 did Jewish migration to the larger towns and cities make great headway and in so doing helped foster the nascent anti-Semitism of the urban communities. But by 1919, the geographical distribution of Jews had fundamentally altered. Now, as many as 78% lived in the cities and larger towns. The overwhelmingly urban character of the domiciled Jewish population is clearly shown in the results of the census of 1933. One implication of this is obvious. The population of large tracts of Bavaria had no or at best minimal, contact with Jews. For very many, therefore, the Jewish question could be of no more than abstract significance. As the 1933 census showed, only in Middle and Lower Franconia was the proportion of Jews in the total population higher than the Reich average of 0.76%.
Almost a half of Bavaria's Jewish population lived in the four cities of Munich, 9,005, Nuremberg, 7,502, Augsburg, 1,030, and Würzburg, 2,145. Fürth, adjoining Nuremberg, was the other major Jewish community. Even so, the urban concentration of Jews in Bavaria was far weaker than in Germany as a whole. In Lower Franconia, the proportion of the Jewish population living in villages and small towns of less than 10,000 inhabitants was exceptionally large, at 60%. Alongside the five major Jewish communities of over 1,000 souls, there were a further eight communities with between 300 and 1,000 members each, in all 4,116 Jews. The remaining 10,694 Jews in Bavaria, roughly a quarter of the total number, formed in all 186 small, mainly very small, communities or lived as individuals in country districts. Large stretches of Bavaria had, therefore, no resident Jews. Of the sum total of 293 Jews in the whole of Lower Bavaria, as many as 73% lived in the four provincial towns of Straubing, Landshut, Passau and Degendorf. Of the few Jews in the Upper Palatinate, 77% lived in the towns of Regensburg, Weiden, Neumarkt in the Oberpfalz, Amberg, and Schwandorf. Outside Franconia, where, on account of the relatively prominent presence and high population density of the Jews, a history of sporadic animosity, and the effect of anti-Semitic tirades of Julius Streicher and his following in the 1920s, the Jewish question acquired a peculiar importance. The non-Jewish population of Bavaria came into contact with Jews mainly in the towns, especially the big cities, in spa and tourist resorts, and in some rural areas where Jews dominated agricultural trade. Anti-Jewish violence was part of the scene of traditional social conflict in some parts of Bavaria, especially in Franconia, in the 19th century. Synagogue arson, the desecration of cemeteries, attacks on Jewish property, the hanging of effigies, and other outrages were prompted not only by economic rivalry or social envy, but reflected, too, still existent religious antagonism of Christian towards Jew. Allegations of ritual murders or well poisonings and the ancient slur attached to the crucifiers of Christ or murderers of Christ, sentiments sometimes inflamed by comments of Catholic priests or Protestant pastors, all occasioned isolated outbreaks of violence against Jews throughout the 19th century. For most people, however, feelings probably did not go much further than an abstract dislike or distrust of Jews, and there seems to have been a good deal of indifference to what was already being dubbed the Jewish question. In 1850, for example, partly at the prompting of the Catholic lower clergy, about 13% of the entire population of Bavaria signed petitions opposing Jewish emancipation. When, however, the state authorities made further investigations into the true mood of the people, it turned out that many petitioners were wholly indifferent on the issue, had no contact with Jews, knew little of any Jewish question, and had often added their signatures only at the prompting of the priest. Elements of this archaic hostility towards Jews undoubtedly lasted in Franconia into the Third Reich. However, the traditional anti-Semitism was already in the later 19th century giving way to or merging with the newer, more strongly ideological currents of the Völkisch nationalist racial anti-Semitism, which came to provide the basis of Nazi racial thinking. Above all, in the crisis-ridden years following the end of the First World War, the Revolution and the Rete Republik, Racial anti-Semitism in Bavaria, especially in the cities of Munich and Nuremberg, found conditions in which it could thrive. Favoured for a time even by the Bavarian government, racial anti-Semitism was the main prop of demagogues such as Streicher in Nuremberg and, of course, Hitler in Munich, whose speeches in the early 1920s poured forth an unending torrent of anti-Jewish filth, much to the approval of those finding their way to Nazi meetings in Munich's beer halls. Prominent among them already, sections of the Mittelstand and Lumpen Bourgeoisie, fearful of the socialist left and resentful of the influence of Jewish profiteers and financiers. Old and new anti-Semitism existed side by side and provided mutual support for each other. The traditional hostility only surfaced for the most part where there was an actual physical presence of Jews, 
and where the local population came into direct contact, especially economically, with Jews. The racial Völkisch variety, although fueling appalling outrages against Jews, was in essence capable of existing independent of direct contact with Jews as an abstract racial hatred, whose target was only superficially a specific Jewish shop or trader, and in reality, Jewry itself. Following a calmer period in the middle years of the Weimar Republic, the climate for Jews all over Germany obviously worsened dramatically during the period of the Nazis' rapid rise to power. However, research has done much to counter and qualify the notion of a society driven by pathological hatred of the Jews, in which generations of anti-Semitism had prepared the Germans to accept Hitler as their redeemer. Though Hitler himself apparently regarded anti-Semitism as the most important weapon in his propaganda arsenal, it seems, in fact, far from being the main motive force in bringing Nazism to power, to have been secondary to the main appeal of the Nazi message. A contemporary Jewish assessment of the spectacular gains in the 1930 Reichstag elections emphasized that millions of Nazi voters were in no sense anti-Semites, adding pointedly, however, that their rejection of anti-Semitism, on the other hand, was evidently not great enough to prevent them giving their support to an anti-Semitic party. Analysis of the ideological motivation of a selection of old fighters in joining the NSDAP suggests anti-Semitism was decisive only in a small minority of cases. And in his perceptive study of the rise of Nazism in Nordheim in Lower Saxony, where the NSDAP polled almost double the national average in 1932, W. S. Allen reached the conclusion that the Jews of the town were integrated on class lines before 1933 and that people were drawn to anti-Semitism because they were drawn to Nazism, not the other way round. Anti-Semitism cannot, it seems, be allocated a significant role in bringing Hitler to power, though, given the widespread acceptability of the Jewish question as a political issue, exploited not only by the Nazis, nor did it do anything to hinder his rapidly growing popularity. However, the relative indifference of most Germans towards the Jewish question before 1933 meant that the Nazis did have a job on their hands after the takeover of power to persuade them of the need for active discrimination and persecution of the Jews. The following pages consider the extent of Nazi success in transforming latent anti-Jewish sentiment into active dynamic hatred. The first section concentrates on popular reactions to Nazi attempts to oust Jews from economic activity and to the terror and violence employed in the exercise between 1933 and 1938. The second part then goes on to consider the role played by the lower clergy in influencing opinion on the Jewish question. In the final section, the varying reactions to the November pogrom of 1938 are examined. 1. Boycott and Terror 1933-8 to eight. The nationwide boycott of Jewish shops carried out on the 1st of April 1933 was, as is generally known, in Bavaria as elsewhere in the Reich, less than a total success from the Nazi point of view. If it met with no opposition to speak of, the response of the public had been markedly cool. A repeat performance across the whole country was never attempted. Though in Franconia localized boycotts and attacks on Jews continued to be an all-too-prominent feature of the political scene during 1933-4, elsewhere, in the context of a deteriorating economic situation and the need to avoid making gratuitous enemies on the diplomatic front, a relative calm in anti-Jewish activity set in towards the end of 1933. The calm was an uneasy one, and lasted no more than a year before a new series of verbal tirades by rabid anti-Semites such as Gauleiter Streicher in Franconia and, outside Bavaria, Gauleiter Küber, Kurmark, and Gauleiter Grohe, Köln Aachen, together with the intensified campaign of filth in Streicher's paper, the Sturmer, set the tone for the renewed and heightened violence which afflicted the whole of Germany in 1935. The renewal of anti-Jewish agitation was in large measure the reflection of the discontent of the Nazi party, or the leadership of individual sections of it, with the progress, all too sluggish in their view, made by the state in solving the Jewish question. One aim of their activity was to push the state much more rapidly in that direction. The new wave of anti-Jewish violence reached its climax in Bavaria with the anti-Semitic disturbances in the streets of Munich's city centre in May 1935, to which we will shortly return. 
Before then, quite contrary to the situation in Franconia, the Jewish question had played in general an insignificant role, both for the population at large and even for the Nazi party, in southern Bavaria, where, outside Munich, few Jews were resident. The government presidents of the non-Franconian regions came to include a section of their reports dealing specifically with Jews only in 1935, in the case of Lower Bavaria and the Upper Palatinate, in fact, only in 1938, and even then had frequently nothing to record. This was a reflection of the fact that most reports from the localities were providing nil-return entries, Fehrenzeiger, on the Jewish question, since no Jews were resident in their areas. Typical for the situation in much of rural southern Bavaria is the comment, in summer 1935, from Bad Eibling, Upper Bavaria, a locality which, in common with all other districts, was by this time plastered with advertisements for the Sturmer, sported notices put up by the local party carrying the slogan, Jews not wanted here, and was experiencing a non-stop campaign of scurrilous agitation against the Jews perpetrated by local activists. All this hardly corresponded with the real concerns of the local population, as the district officer laconically pointed out. Actually, the Jewish question is not a live issue for the district itself, because only one Jewish family of Polish nationality lives in the entire district, and among the summer visitors only one long-standing summer guest in Feilenbach and a spa visitor in Eibling have been observed. The government president of Upper Bavaria added himself a month later that the Jewish question was insignificant for the rural areas, since outside Munich there were only 602 Jews in his entire region. The situation was of course different in Munich itself, as well as in the other major city of southern Bavaria, Augsburg. In a number of the Swabian small towns with prominent Jewish minorities, in upper Bavarian tourist areas like Garmisch or Bad Tertz, and in rural districts where Jews plied the cattle or wood trade. But even here, serious cases of violence towards Jews seldom occurred before 1938. Such boycotts and harassment of Jews as took place were invariably instigated by local party organizations, quite irrespective of the interests and wishes of the bulk of the local population. The boycott movement and anti-Jewish agitation of spring and summer 1935 tended, in fact, to alienate rather than win support for the Nazi party in Munich and southern Bavaria. A major exception to the relative absence of outbreaks of open violence against Jews in southern Bavaria in the first years of the Third Reich occurred on the 18th and 25th of May 1935, when anti-Jewish demonstrations took place in the centre of Munich among the crowds of the city's busy Saturday shoppers. There was nothing spontaneous about the riotous disturbances, they were the culmination of a long campaign initiated and stirred up by no less a figure than Gauleiter Adolf Wagner, who, as Minister of the Interior, was actually responsible for order in Bavaria. Wagner, as it later transpired, had used two employees of the Sturmer, working in collaboration with sections of the Munich police force, to instigate the action, carried out largely by some 200 members of an SS camp near Munich and by members of other party affiliations. The response of the public, as the Munich police felt compelled to report, was wholly opposed to this sort of anti-Semitism, and strong antagonism was felt in the city and its environs. With the mood in the city very heated, Wagner was forced to denounce in the press and on the radio the terror groups who were the cause of the trouble. The distaste felt by the Munich public was more probably evoked by the hooliganism and riotous behaviour of the Nazi mob than by principled objections to anti-Semitism for such primitive violence found condemnation deep into the ranks of the party itself. Even Gauleiter Karl Wahl of Swabia, certainly no friend of the Jews, condemned what he called the aping of Franconian methods. The anti-Jewish boycott formed in fact only one part of a whole series of disturbances initiated by party activists in the spring and summer of 1935. The population reacted even more sharply towards the attacks on Catholic associations taking place at the same time the accompanying disturbance of Caritas collections, and the numerous unruly incidents surrounding the traditional Bavarian white and blue flag during the customary May celebrations in rural areas. Popular feeling was certainly incensed, but much more as a result of the disturbance of order than the fact that the Jews had been a target of attack. The outcome was hostility towards the party, rather than sympathy for the Jews or rejection of the anti-Jewish policies of the regime. 
Even so, it seems clear from such reactions that the aggressive, dynamic hatred of the Jews, which the Nazi formations were trying to foster, was not easy to instill in a population whose feelings towards the Jews went little further, for the most part, than traditional antipathy. In Franconia, the situation was different. Leaving aside the Palatinate, 62.8% of Jews in Bavaria at the time of the 1933 census were to be found there, especially in Middle and Lower Franconia. Even before the First World War, Franconian North Bavaria had been known as prime anti-Semitic territory, and Streicher was able to play on much existing resentment in making the Jewish question a prominent feature of agitatory politics, to a far greater extent than in most other regions of Germany during the Nazi rise to power. Nuremberg and Coburg, in particular, developed into centres of the most vitriolic anti-Semitism during the 1920s, and Jews there, made to bear the brunt of the economic resentments of small traders or farmers, were already given, during the Depression, a foretaste of what was to come. Following the seizure of power, the position of Jews, especially in middle Franconia, but also to a large extent in the neighbouring parts of Upper and Lower Franconia, was as bad as anywhere in Germany. The overwhelmingly Protestant Middle Franconia, heavily under Streicher's influence, saw the most vicious forms of anti-Semitism. Although even here the local party leadership, or alternatively the SA, SS or HJ, directed and perpetrated almost all the outrages, the notorious Gunzenhausen pogrom of March 1934 the worst expression of anti-Jewish violence in the whole of Bavaria before the horrific events of Crystal Night in 1938, showed that in extreme circumstances a wider public could be whipped up into a hysterical mood against local resident Jews. Political conflict in Gunzenhausen, a small provincial town of 5,600 inhabitants in 1933, among them 184 Jews, seems to have been particularly bitter before the takeover of power and the local Nazi party, according to the comments of functionaries in the post-pogrom investigations, had built up a store of especial hatred towards the town's Jews, who, supported by a certain lack of character of a broad section of the population in the Gunzenhausen district, had backed the socialists and communists, and had stirred up feeling against the NSDAP even after the seizure of power. A whole series of violent outbursts, set in motion and executed by a particularly unsavoury local SA leadership, punctuated the following months, so that by March 1934, in the SA's own interpretation, the mood of the population in Gunzenhausen had reached such a pitch that the smallest incident would be enough to prompt a demonstration against the Jews. The incident, which turned the small town on Palm Sunday 1934 into an inferno of murderous hatred towards its Jewish inhabitants, occurred after a young local leader, Kurt Baer, along with other SA men, had entered a public house run by a Jewish couple, had mishandled and arrested them, and had gratuitously beaten up and badly injured the couple's son. Baer then addressed the mob, which had begun to gather outside, in a hate-filled speech in which he called the Jews our mortal enemies, who had nailed our Lord God to the cross, and were guilty of the deaths of two million in the World War, and the 400 dead and 10,000 seriously injured in the movement. He also spoke of innocent girls who had been raped by Jews. The speech was heard by some 200 bystanders. It lit the touch paper to the quasi-medieval pogrom which followed. In groups of between 50 and several hundred people, the inhabitants of Gunzenhausen roamed the streets of the town for two hours, going from one Jewish home to another and shouting, The Jews must go! In brutal fashion, some 35 male and female Jews were dragged to the town prison, where some were gravely maltreated by Kurt Baer. One Jew was found hanged in a shed. Another stabbed himself in the heart before the bellowing mob could get at him. Between 1,000 and 1,500 people were said to have taken part in the pogrom. If without doubt the ringleaders were SA men, it is nonetheless clear that in this case a considerable number of non-party members must also have taken part in the wild orgy of violence. It provided, however, a case unique in its horror even for middle Franconia. In no other administrative district of the 53 belonging to my governmental region has such an array of infringements taken place as in Gunzenhausen, wrote Government President Hofmann to the Bavarian Ministry of the Interior after the pogrom. 
he attributed the peculiarly tense situation in Gunzenhausen, where there had been at least eight more or less serious violent incidents between the seizure of power and the pogrom, directly to the agitation of the special commissioner, S.A. Oberstumbahnführer Karl Baer, uncle of Kurt, who himself has no sense of discipline and order. Most reports from the lower administrative authorities in Middle Franconia in the years 1933-5 to contain no critical comments of the population about violence shown towards Jews. This must be juxtaposed with the open anger and protest registered in precisely this part of Bavaria at the Nazi intervention in the running of the Protestant Church in 1934. Obviously, the degree of intimidation in the Jewish question was acute, as is shown by the arrest of a photographer from Gunzenhausen for allegedly making critical remarks about Kurt Bär, the instigator of the Gunzenhausen pogrom, and himself arraigned before a court of law for the offence. The level of intimidation was also largely responsible for the fact that already in spring 1933, few dared to engage in economic dealings with Jews, in contrast to the situation in most parts of Germany. Friends of Jews were exposed to practically the same danger as Jews themselves. Intimidation, however, does not explain quite everything. Since intimidation itself was closely related to and dependent upon denunciation of neighbours or workmates for their remarks or actions, its effectiveness presupposes that a considerable proportion of the population were, or were thought to be, in basic agreement with the broad contours of the persecution of the Jews. An example of the poisoned atmosphere in one mid-Franconian village is provided by Altenmuir, near Gunzenhausen. There were 31 Jews among the 800 inhabitants, and when an elderly Jew died in 1936, the construction of a coffin and transportation of the body to the cemetery, even though permission from the local police had been granted, was refused by the local joiner and undertaker. The coffin had eventually to be made by a cartwright, and the corpse carried to Gunzenhausen by a hearse ordered from Nuremberg. As the report says, it had once been usual for a fair number of Aryan mourners to attend a Jewish funeral. Since the takeover of power, this fact has, however, fundamentally altered. Today, in Altenmuir, it is inconceivable that Germans would pay last respects to a Jew. In the second half of 1935, the wild Einzelaktionen, individual measures taken against Jews without any legal base, declined sharply after being banned by the state authorities and especially following the promulgation of the notorious Nuremberg Laws in September 1935, which, in providing anti-Jewish legislation, went a long way towards meeting the aims of the party's summer anti-Semitic campaign. With one eye on the approaching Olympics, and the other on the foreign and economic situation, the regime needed a period of relative calm. In August 1935, Hitler and Deputy Führer Hess had expressly banned individual actions against Jews. Even after the murder of Wilhelm Gustloff, the leader of the Nazi Auslandsorganisation in Switzerland, by a young Jew in February 1936, there were no outbreaks of anti-Jewish violence following another firm ban by the Reich Minister of the Interior, together with Hess, on any prospective sallies against Jewish targets. The largely negative attitude of the population, especially in South Bavaria, to the open violence of Nazi thugs in the summer of 1935, was perfectly compatible with broad approval of the anti-Jewish legislation passed at the Nuremberg Party rally in September 1935 by a specially summoned assembly of the Reichstag. Probably the government president of Upper Bavaria was not far from the mark when he distinguished between rejection of the inexpedient slogans and posters of the 1935 campaign, together with fears of economic repercussions in tourist areas, and approval, in every respect, of the objective struggle against Jewry. Indifference seems, in fact, to have been the most common response to the Nuremberg Laws. A wide range of reports from Bavarian localities do not even mention the promulgation of the laws, and the reports of the government presidents, summarising opinion at the regional level, indicate only in the briefest terms that the legal regulation of the Jewish question had been generally welcomed, and had met with the approval of the population not least in its contribution towards the elimination of the recently prevailing intense disturbance. However, even where they had been unpopular, the individual actions had not been without influence on people's attitudes towards Jews. As the alleged provocation of the disturbances, 
Many were glad to see the back of the Jews, as a report in December 1936 from Bad Neustadt, an almost wholly Catholic district of Lower Franconia, which the Nazis had scarcely penetrated before the seizure of power, shows. Altogether, there has been an almost complete change in the attitude of the population towards the Jews. Whereas people used to side in unmistakable fashion with the persecuted Jews, one now hears, if only they would all soon be gone. Solely from the point of view of the tax shortfall, and thus of damage to communal finances, is the departure of the Jews regarded in Unsleben as unfortunate. Racial anti-Semitism met its greatest obstacle and came up against notable resistance where the Nazis tried to break commercial relationships between Jews and the non-Jewish population. In 1936-7, the party, together with the Nazified trade and agricultural organizations, made renewed attempts to destroy trading contacts with Jews. The revitalized boycott encountered little sympathy, it seems, even in Streicher's territory. Those who stood to gain economically through trading in Jewish shops, trafficking with Jewish cattle dealers, providing accommodation for Jewish visitors to tourist resorts, or finding work in Jewish-owned firms, were not eager to break off their contact and to boycott the Jews. Economic self-interest clearly prevailed over ideological correctitude. Here were obvious limits of Nazi ideological penetration. Alzenau, a relatively industrialized district on the northwestern border of Lower Franconia, provides an example of how the ideological norm preached by the party came to grief in the face of pragmatic material self-interest of workers at the Jewish-owned cigar factories which dominated local industry. Though the Nazis had made no great headway in this area before 1933, the party was responsible for not infrequent acts of violence against Jews and their property in the years after the seizure of power. The boycott movement had, as the focus of its attack, the Jewish ownership of the cigar factories, Jews, in fact, owned most of the 29 factories with a combined workforce of 2,206 women and 280 men. Inquiries into the position of the tobacco firms, following the allegation that the boycott was threatening their existence and the jobs of their employees, met with a more or less unanimous response. The people were glad to have work and did not ask whether the employer was an Aryan or a Jew. The relationship between the firms and the local residents is a thoroughly good and friendly one. Complaints about the employers have not been heard so far. The boycott problems of the Nazis were even greater in the countryside. Here, the main issue was the remaining dominance in many areas of the Jewish cattle dealer, the traditional middleman and purveyor of credit for untold numbers of German peasants. Despite vicious intimidation and ceaseless propaganda, however, the Nazis found it an uphill struggle. Most peasants were unconcerned about the racial origins of the cattle dealer as long as his prices were good and his credit readily forthcoming. Aryan cattle dealers, complained many peasants, had little capital and could not offer prices comparable to those of their Jewish rivals. The consequence was that the ousting of the Jewish cattle dealers made remarkably slow progress. The wholesale cattle trade in the Ebermannstadt area was in 1935 still to a good 90% in Jewish hands and inquiries in autumn 1936 came to the regrettable conclusion that, especially in the hill farm districts of the Jura, nothing at all had changed. Here, the cattle Jew traffics just as ever in the farmhouses. When questioned, the peasants explain almost in unison that the Jew pays well, and pays cash, which is not the case with the Aryan dealers. In some instances, there are no Aryan dealers at all in the outlying communities. Even party members and village mayors were not adverse to keeping ideological precepts and practical profits separate. There are numerous instances on record of functionaries and local dignitaries trafficking with Jews. Every form of chicanery, especially the withdrawal of trading permits, was used to bring about the almost complete exclusion of Jewish dealers from Middle Franconia as early as the end of 1934, though that was only possible in the peculiar conditions of Streicher's Gau, and even here was not always welcomed by the peasants. Elsewhere in Bavaria, the Jews could largely maintain their dominance in the cattle trade, despite harassment, down to the end of 1937. A not untypical report from a village in Lower Franconia shows the position clearly. The major stated that it was difficult to provide a list of names of peasants dealing with Jews, as requested, since apart from party members, almost all peasants still carried out their transactions with Jews. Recognition of the necessity of avoiding contact with Jews was hardly existent. 
and the currently expected attitude of rejection of Jews was therefore lacking. Some peasants stood out, in fact, on account of their friendliness towards Jews. Gestapo findings were even more alarming to Nazi eyes. Even as late as 1937, the Gestapo at Munich were forced to concede shocking results arising from their inquiry into relations of peasants and Jews. In Swabia alone, there had been 1,500 cases of peasants trafficking with Jews in 1936-7, and although this had been put down to the lack of reliable Aryan dealers with sufficient capital, the real reason, claimed the Gestapo, was the attitude of the peasants which lacked any sort of racial consciousness. Part of the problem, in the Gestapo's view, was that numerous peasants, who mainly have no idea of the racial problem, were of the opinion that commercial dealings with Jews were in order since the state had given them a trading license. The withdrawal of trading licenses, refusal to ensure cattle bought from Jews, expulsion from the Cattle Farming Association, and not least exposure of those continuing to traffic with Jews in the pages of the Sturmer, were all part of an intensified campaign to break the Jewish contact with the farming world, and by the end of 1937 the Nazis were approaching their goal. The reactions of peasants from the lower Franconia village of Bischofsheim and der Rhone mirror the complaint of many farmers, that their economic situation had deteriorated as a result of the exclusion of the Jews, since there was no longer anyone who would buy up the cattle. The Jews are not allowed to engage in the cattle trade any longer, and there are, apart from them, no cattle dealers to speak of resident in this district. Peasant attitudes were determined almost wholly by material considerations and economic self-interest. Nazi racial propaganda played no great part. The fourfold increase in sales of the Sturmer during the first ten months of 1935, despite the widespread distaste the newspaper provoked, was testimony nonetheless to the fact that anti-Semitism was gradually gaining ground in popular opinion. And certainly the fact that peasants continued to trade with Jewish dealers does not make them pro-Jewish. But it does suggest that the racial origins of the purchaser of their cattle was for them a matter of complete indifference. The only question that mattered was the price for the cow. Negative reactions to anti-Jewish placards and slogans posted at the entry and exit in most villages by the local Nazi party were probably also prompted more by economic than humanitarian motives. Even Nazis themselves recognized that the anti-Jewish slogans Jews are our misfortune, Jews not wanted here, and even more threatening and offensive varieties, were guaranteed to damage the tourist trade. An anonymous letter to Reich Governor Epp in August 1934, allegedly coming from a long-serving party member who undoubtedly had his own economic interest in the matter, pointed out that the anti-Jewish notices made the worst possible impact on foreigners travelling down the Romantische Strasse, through Franconia to the Passion Play in Oberammergau and that as a result the tourist industry in towns such as Rothenburg, Dinkelsbühl, Nördlingen and Ansbach was suffering greatly. With the massive extension of the notices in 1935, up to then they had been largely a Franconian speciality, came grave misgivings in other tourist areas, such as garmisch partenkirchen where serious economic consequences were feared. In some rural areas, peasants expressed their distaste for the anti-Jewish boards by removing them altogether or altering the wording to express welcome to the Jews. In one upper Bavarian village, where some peasants were worried that the anti-Jewish notices set up by the Hitler Youth would deter Jews from coming to buy up their hops, the boards, Jews not wanted here, disappeared for a short time before being replaced with an amended text, Jews very much wanted here. In its patronage of Jewish shops, the rural population in particular was regarded by the authorities as ideologically unteachable. In one report about the boycott of Jewish shops in Kham, Upper Palatinate, in December 1936, it was pointed out that the rural population especially, despite repeated and thorough instruction at party meetings and on other occasions, still preferred to buy in Jewish shops. Even being photographed for the Sturmer's rogues gallery was not enough to deter them, and many were prepared even to take sides with the Jews. In Munich, the police interpreted the massive success of the annual sales at a leading Jewish clothing store as a sign that many women still had not understood nor want to understand the lines laid down by the Führer for solving the Jewish question. Such complaints were common the length and breadth of Germany in these years. Nevertheless, 
In the long run, the intimidation did not fail to do its work. As early as December 1935, the government president of Swabia could provide several examples to show how the economic position of Jewish dealers in Swabia had drastically deteriorated. Ichenhausen, where Jews formed a higher proportion of the population, 12.4%, than almost anywhere else in Germany, and where commercial life revolved around Jewish trade, was described as a dying town, since many no longer wanted to buy in Jewish shops and preferred to travel to Günzburg or Ulm to do their shopping, a process which was also damaging Christian shops, added the report. Not a few Aryan businessmen saw in the Jewish boycott a chance to damage or even ruin rivals by reporting their Jewish background to the local party. Under constant pressure, countless Jewish businesses had by the end of 1937 seen their customers driven away, had sold out or gone into liquidation, had emigrated or moved to larger cities where they could continue a shadowy existence for some time to come on the fringes of society, withdrawn, threatened and persecuted. 2. The Influence of the Clergy on Attitudes to the Jewish Question Following their detailed inquiries into the continuing commercial contact between peasants and Jewish dealers, the Gestapo attributed the limited penetration of the Nazi Weltanschauung in rural areas chiefly to the influence of the Christian churches. If, despite enlightenment through the National Socialist Movement, there were still those who think they have to stand up for the Jewish people, claimed the Gestapo, this was above all the fault of the clergy. It was often the case in rural parishes, in fact, continued the report, that the priest or pastor would represent the Jews as the chosen people and directly encourage the people to patronize Jewish shops. The inquiries, which are not yet concluded, show already that in exactly those districts where political Catholicism still holds sway, the peasants are so infected by the doctrines of belligerent political Catholicism that they are deaf to any discussion of the racial problem. This state of affairs further shows that the majority of peasants are wholly unreceptive to the ideological teachings of National Socialism, and that they can only be compelled through material disadvantage to engage in commercial links with Aryan dealers. After more than four years of Nazi rule, then, the Nazi Weltanschauung, in particular racial anti-Semitism, its central feature, had, in the view of the Gestapo, been able to make little headway among the Catholic rural population, which had no racial consciousness and was deaf to the racial problem. The tendency of the Gestapo, like the SD, to exaggerate the opposition of the churches is well known. Even so, there is no doubting the fact that the Christian churches, especially the Catholic Church, were able to exercise very considerable influence on the population, particularly in rural areas. The churches remained practically the only non-Nazified bodies in Germany which retained enormous influence upon the formation of opinion and the potential, as the church struggle shows, to form and foster an independent public opinion running counter to Nazi propaganda and policy. Furthermore, it was evident that the racial theories on which Nazi anti-Semitism was grounded amounted to a hatred of part of mankind which was diametrically opposed to the Christian commandment to love thy neighbour. Racism, as the central element of the Nazi Weltanschauung, stood in irreconcilable conflict with the Christian basic tenet of the equality of all men before God. However, the attitude of the churches and of the leaders of both denominations to racism was highly ambivalent. This ambivalence had deep roots. Against the fundamental rejection of racism stood the Christian tradition of anti-Judaism, which, though in decline since the Enlightenment, retained some force as a Christian undercurrent of anti-Semitism well into the twentieth century. Steeped in such traditions, and also in the contemporary commonplaces of racial prejudice, many church leaders were unable or unwilling to speak out forcefully and unambiguously against anti-Semitism. Even, on the Catholic side, Cardinal Faulhaber, who had in 1923 been labelled the Jewish Cardinal by Nazi sympathisers at Munich University, for his criticism of anti-Semitic agitation, shied away from an outright public condemnation of Nazi racism. In his bold and justly famous Advent Sermons of 1933, which enjoyed a wide readership outside Germany, he stressed that the love of one's own race ought never to be turned into hatred towards other people. He added, however, that the Church had no objections to racial research, 
Rassenforschung, and racial welfare, Rassenpflege, nor to the endeavor to keep the individuality of a people as pure as possible, and, through reference to the community of blood, deepening the sense of national community. A year later, the cardinal felt compelled to make clear that in his Advent sermons he had defended the old biblical scripture of Israel, but not taken a stance on the Jewish question of today. The even more strongly featured nationalist leanings in the Protestant church allowed racial and anti-Semitic thinking to surface all the more readily, quite apart from the German Christians, the thoroughly racist, Nazified wing of the church. Both churches accepted in essence the principle of racial differentiation, rejecting, again apart from the German Christians, only the outrightly aggressive hatred of Jews by the Nazis. Günther Levy used sharp but fitting words to emphasize the consequences of such an ambivalent stance in the case of the Catholic Church. A church that justified moderate anti-Semitism and merely objected to extreme and immoral acts was ill-prepared to provide an effective antidote to the Nazis' gospel of hate. The difference in attitude towards the Jewish question, which we have already witnessed, between Franconia and South Bavaria, certainly had something to do with the denominational divide between Protestant and Catholic areas. The particularly pronounced national feeling in Franconia, which was closely coupled with fervent Protestantism, undoubtedly tended to foster acceptance of Nazi racial stereotypes, and the piously Protestant rural population of Middle Franconia, which defended its church and bishop so demonstratively and effectively in 1934, revealed in the same period hardly a trace of opposition to the racial idea. However, it would be easy to take the denominational distinction too far. The position of the Jews was by no means rosy in the adjacent and largely Catholic Lower Franconia. Catholicism provided no protection in itself against anti-Semitism, as of course is plain from the example of Austria and other Central European countries. Nevertheless, given the generally stronger social cohesiveness of the Catholic Church's following, the Christian teaching which ran counter to the Nazi doctrine of race hatred certainly played a part in influencing opinion on the Jewish question in the Catholic regions of Bavaria. While the ambivalent and hesitant attitude of the papacy, of the Catholic hierarchy, and of the leadership of the Evangelical Church to the Jewish question has been the subject of thorough inquiry, the stance adopted by the parochial clergy has been little touched upon. Yet it was the parish clergy who were most able to exert direct influence upon their congregations. The extent to which they attempted to influence opinion on the Jews is an important one, therefore, requiring detailed examination. Few clergymen of either denomination seem to have spoken publicly, mainly in sermons, on the racial problem in a fully-fledged Nazi sense. As the Nazi authorities themselves often reported, they were the exceptions. One Protestant pastor, a rare bird amongst his sort, according to the government president of Upper and Middle Franconia, was said to have claimed in a sermon in April 1937 that the Jew had nothing in common with the Christian church, was a foreign element, and must be regarded as the enemy of the Christian faith. The Jews sought to introduce Bolshevism into the church, and by so doing to destroy the religious community. The Jews are the destroyers and deserve to be whipped out, he reportedly concluded. An equally honorable exception was the Catholic Redemptorist from Kham, who in April 1939 paid tribute to the Nazi state, touched on the Jewish question, and described the Jews as murderers because they had crucified Christ. Another Catholic priest from the Bamberg district whose pro-Nazi comments in a sermon in March 1939 had caused such offence among his congregation that some thirty people left the church in protest, was said to have called out as they went, Let them go! They're nothing but Jew servers! Such unrestrained Nazified remarks seldom occurred. Much more frequent were instances where members of the clergy, while not preaching racial hatred, betrayed signs of a racist attitude and of basic acknowledgement that there was indeed a racial problem. In his well-attended sermons in the Frauenkirche in Munich in December 1936, the well-known Jesuit Hermann Muckermann, speaking on the personality of the historic Jesus, drew the conclusion that the teaching of Christ was not Jewish in origin, but stood rather in opposition to Jewry. He upheld expressly the facts of heredity and race, and stated that the Church approved in principle of the eugenic and racial policies of the government. 
Mukaman had already formulated his ideas about eugenics and race in spring 1936 in a series of lectures in Bamberg, in which he described a healthy racial stock as a lofty, magnificent gift of heaven, and regarded it as Christian duty to uphold and increase the home race, Heimrasse. Though not in itself against the divine order, mixing the home race with alien races was to be rejected. Mukaman's views were based upon his theoretical concern with racial and eugenic problems, upon which subjects he had written a number of tracts. Other clergymen tended rather to reveal in their comments an unreflected acceptance of racial premises. Such attitudes were also betrayed by the eagerness with which a number of Protestant pastors retaliated in denying the calumny that the clergy was Jew-ridden, verjudet. When Gauleiter Kuber of the Kurmark attacked pastors of the Confessing Front as Jews' accomplices in June 1935, for instance, an array of protest telegrams landed in the offices of the Nuremberg police, and protestations were also made during services in and around Nuremberg. Even such a leading figure in the Protestant church as Helmut Kern, head of the People's Mission, who otherwise described concepts of race, blood and nationality, as no more than secular values and recognised the connections between new heathenism, racism and the attack on Christian values, showed, probably in an unreflecting way, undercurrents of anti-Semitism when, in his campaign against the community school, he described it as a product of the Enlightenment and of Jewish liberalism, or spoke in the same context of the ideas of Jew-ridden Marxism and liberalism though it was not the intention in these or similar instances to attack the Jews directly, such comments of pastors and priests could only help to legitimize and strengthen the existing anti-Semitic climate of opinion. Far more numerous, however, to go from the report material, were instances where clergy of both denominations, though Catholics more frequently than Protestants, took issue with the racial policy of the regime, or even sided openly with the persecuted Jews. The authorities were informed, for example, of a Protestant missionary preacher in the Weissenburg district of Middle Franconia, who, in a sermon in 1935, referred disparagingly to the name of the former SA leader, Ernst Röhm, shot in 1934, in connection with the notion of race, in order to show that the Aryan race was not to be regarded as better than any other. Another Protestant preacher was said to have stated that in a time when race and blood were being elevated to the status of idols, people needed above all the badge of faith. During a Catholic mission in Bamberg, a speaker was alleged to have declared in a sermon, For God there are no Völkisch matters and no national laws. For him there are no racial differences. A Jesuit, also in Bamberg, was reported as saying that the Catholic Church had no use for a national or racial church because it preaches its doctrine to all people, whatever their race. Some clergymen of both denominations supported the Jews publicly and openly condemned their persecution. A Catholic priest in Neustadt an der Saale, Lower Franconia, for example, spoke following a series of terroristic attacks against local Jews in a sermon in October 1934 about human hatred and lack of charity in connection with anti-Jewish actions, referred to an anti-Jewish song of the Hitler Youth and commented that in this way the hatred towards the Jews is planted in the hearts of young people. The courageous Father Furch, a Catholic priest in the Bamberg district and clever opponent of the regime who had long been a thorn in the flesh of the authorities, declared in sermons in February 1936 that the Jews also did a very great deal of good and were not, therefore, to be spurned. In the same month, a Protestant pastor at Heersbruck, Middle Franconia, expressly emphasized that according to the Bible the Jews were the chosen people. Dompfarer Kraus of Eichstätt, who battled with the authorities about the attack on Catholicism, also defended the Jews in one of his sermons and strongly criticized an article in the Sturmer entitled Why I Hate the Jews. Another known opponent of the regime, the brave Protestant pastor, Karl Steinbauer, who paid for his courage by forfeiting his liberty, castigated anti-Semitism and the entire Völkisch way of thinking in a sermon in September 1935, in which he boldly repeated the biblical words, Salvation comes from the Jews. Other pastors prayed for the Jews, or requested the congregation to pray for them. 
Even during the war, some clergymen were prepared to support the Jews. One Catholic priest in the district of Neustadt an der Eich, in middle Franconia, was served with a summons in summer 1940 for allegedly saying in a sermon that the Jews should not be cast out since they too are human beings. Particularly courageous and noteworthy were the remarks of the Catholic priest Josef Atzinger in Landshut in November 1940, in which he condemned the racial legislation of the Third Reich as godless, unjustified, and harmful. Neither the Catholic nor the Evangelical Church leadership took any official stance towards the November pogrom of 1938. The undoubted deep disapproval of the bulk of the clergy of both denominations was voiced therefore only in the isolated comments of individual priests and pastors. Their courage in speaking out amid the official silence was all the greater in that they could expect no support from above from their bishops and hierarchies, and little or no protection from any possible retribution by local party activists. Four Catholic and two Protestant clergymen in the district of Wunsiedl, in Upper Franconia, for example, were the targets of violent attacks because of their alleged pro-Jewish attitude during the Crystal Night. Reports of the Bavarian authorities contain several instances where the Jewish action was openly denounced by members of the clergy of both denominations. A Protestant pastor in the Bamberg area, for example, was indicted with offences against the Malicious Practices Act for saying in sermons in November 1938 that the actions carried out against the Jews were from a Christian point of view in no sense deserving of approval, but were rather to be condemned, and stating, A Christian person does not do such things. These were subhumans, untermenschen. A priest in Neumarkt in the Oberpfalz compared those who smashed Jewish windows with the purest Bolsheviks. Another priest, from Pfarrkirchen in Lower Bavaria, was arraigned before the Munich Special Court for allegedly saying to an eleven-year-old schoolboy following the murder of embassy official Ernst vom Rath, the spur to the pogrom, that many innocent Jews had to suffer with the one guilty of vom Rath's assassination. And at St. Lawrence's church in the centre of Nuremberg, on the Sunday following the pogrom, all the clergy of the parish followed the pastor's remarks of sympathy for the Jews by chanting the Ten Commandments in unison before the altar. Further critical remarks of the clergy about the pogrom could not be found in the report material. Most priests and pastors kept silent. Yet as in the neighbouring Württemberg, their general rejection of the pogrom was easily recognisable by the authorities. This was confirmed by the comment of the government president of Upper Bavaria about reactions to the pogrom. Only those circles influenced by the church do not yet go along with the Jewish question. Examination of remarks made by members of the Bavarian parish clergy about the Jews suggests that the attitudes were divided on the race question. Some clergymen adopted an outright Nazi stance and fully approved of the exclusion of Jews from German society. They were, however, exceptions. Most rejected the Nazi dogma of hate towards part of mankind. Nevertheless, latent anti-Semitic feelings occasionally found expression. There was also some ambivalence in a number of statements which appeared to condemn not discrimination itself, but merely the methods of discrimination, the deplorable excesses of the persecution of the Jews. The clearest conclusion of all from the evidence surveyed would seem to be, however, that the parish clergy had on remarkably few occasions anything at all to say on the Jewish question. The overwhelming majority of priests and pastors, like their superiors, refrained from any public comment and let the persecution of the Jews pass them by in silence. Such comments as have been cited in this chapter were therefore themselves exceptional in being made at all, and the fact that most examples derive from Franconian parishes is itself no accident, again showing that the Jewish question was for the most part only in this area a live issue. In asking why the clergy commented so rarely on the inhumanities of the persecution of the Jews, we have, of course, immediately to take into account their exposed position in the Third Reich, the intimidation of the police state, the probability of recriminations, and the general pervading atmosphere of fear and repression. This explains much, but not everything. In other matters, especially when it was a case of defending immediate concerns of the Church against the regime, priests were prepared to act despite the obvious dangers involved. 
defense of the church had its own legitimacy for priests and pastors. The Jewish question, on the other hand, belonged in the realm of politics, which the church, from its leaders down, conscientiously eschewed from 1933 onwards. Even apart from any principle of non-interference in politics, however, there are grounds for strong suspicion that the Jewish question was not regarded by the clergy as a central theme of interest. The narrower field of denominational issues and defence of the Church's rights and practices consumed in great measure the potential energy of the parish clergy to oppose the regime. In this sphere, the priest was able decisively to influence the opinion and behaviour of the population and to manipulate it in the struggle against the anti-church measures of the regime. He could generally count on popular support of churchgoers in response to Nazi intervention in church affairs, and on the maximum backing from his superiors. In the Jewish question, things were different. The clergy encountered mainly indifference or feelings of sullen helplessness when not a widespread, if abstract and latent, anti-Semitism even among churchgoers. Whereas the clergy tried actively to influence popular opinion in church matters, in the Jewish question they gave little lead, and tended to follow and reflect rather than mould popular opinion. As Christians, the majority of the clergy rejected the inhumanities of the Nazi regime, but as individuals living amid a climate of opinion hostile to Jews, they tended largely to mirror the latent anti-Semitism and indifference of their society. Since the Jewish question appears to have been relatively unimportant to the Church, and since, as we have seen, the clergy rarely took a direct part in shaping opinion on the Jews, the Gestapo's interpretation linking the lack of penetration of Nazi racial doctrines in rural areas to the active influence of the clergy seems a dubious one. The lack of racial consciousness in the Bavarian peasantry, which the Gestapo bemoaned, was undoubtedly often founded on traditional Christian precepts of basic humanity, which continued to stand for many Christians in crass opposition to Nazi barbarity. Of at least equal importance, especially in Catholic rural areas, was the widespread rejection of the Nazi party, above all for its assault on the Catholic Church itself, which brought with it increased solidarity with the priest and rejection of Nazi values. More important still, however, in explaining the unwillingness of the peasantry to go along with Nazi boycott demands, was not so much lack of racial consciousness as direct material self-interest. Nazism had only limited success in breaking down the conventional mentality of the population built partly on self-interest and replacing it with an ideological dogma of hatred towards Jews. Though Christian teaching often provided the basis of the antipathy towards the Nazi Weltanschauung, the hierarchy and lower clergy did little directly to foster anti-racist attitudes. Only indirectly, through the closer bonds of the population to the church as a consequence of the church struggle, was immunity to Nazi ideological penetration reaffirmed. The ambivalent attitude of the church towards race allowed, however, the retention of anti-Semitic views by the faithful. If, according to the teaching of the church, Jews were not to be hated and persecuted, they did not necessarily have to be loved. The words of the Catholic preacher cited earlier, that in the eyes of God there were no völkisch matters, national laws or racial differences, denoted an uncompromising attitude adopted by a few clergymen even during the war. Such a stance ran, of course, completely counter to the very core of Nazi ideology. As was implicitly recognized here, the Nazi new heathenism was grounded on the principle of racial inequality, which stood in contradiction to the commandments of God. The defense against the anti-church component of Nazism ought theoretically, therefore, to have found one of its central points in the rejection of the concept of race. In practice, however, from the point of view of the Church, the ideological struggle was regarded mainly as a struggle for the faith in the narrower sense of the word, and as a defense of Church institutions in which the racial issue was seldom touched upon and then only tangentially. The isolated voices of protest raised by a few courageous individuals from both denominations acquired, therefore, no significance within the framework of the church struggle and found little support from the church leaderships. One can hardly avoid the conclusion that the Jewish question was on the whole a matter of just as much indifference to the clergy as it was to the church-going population of Bavaria.
the courageous stand taken on denominational issues was never matched by anything like the same fervor on matters of so much greater human significance. 3. Crystal Knight Only once in the twelve years of the Third Reich was the German people directly confronted with the full savagery of the anti-Jewish terror. This was on the morning of the 10th of November 1938, following the so-called Crystal Night, Reichskristallnacht, the quasi-medieval orgy of destruction, plunder, burning of synagogues, and wild devastation carried out by the party and the SA at the call of Propaganda Minister Goebbels, in his words, as a spontaneous answer of the population to the killing of Legation Secretary Ernst vom Rath by a 17-year-old Jewish boy, Herschel Grünspan, in Paris. After the relative calm of the years 1936-7, to the position of the Jews in Germany had worsened visibly since the beginning of 1938. Following the Anschluss of Austria, and especially in connection with the Zudeten crisis, serious outbreaks of anti-Jewish violence had occurred in numerous Franconian localities, as party activists exploited the tension and the eventual triumphs of the Nazi state to unleash a wave of terror against the Jews. Seen through Jewish eyes, the situation in the middle Franconia was threatening in the extreme during the weeks before the pogrom. Already for a few weeks there had been decided signs of unrest among the masses. There also appeared on various shops, cinemas, etc., the notices, Jews not wanted, etc. In Ansbach, seat of the district administration, for example, this notice was to be seen weeks beforehand on every shop of whatever sort without exception, in smaller places and in the countryside, conditions were worse still. Through terror acts or by being compelled to sign, people were forced to sell all their belongings for a bargain price within a few hours and to go away. Where to? Naturally, into the next big town. The same question, where to, which now confronts all of them. According to the report of the district officer of Altsenau, Lower Franconia, at the end of October 1938, the area had experienced a constant spate of night attacks on Jewish buildings. Windows had been smashed in many houses, the walls smeared with red paint, and two synagogues damaged by stone-throwing. Attacks by party activists on synagogues were sharply increasing in number long before the pogrom. The tone was set by the festive demolition of the main synagogues in Munich and Nuremberg in summer 1938. In Leutershausen, Middle Franconia, the synagogue was plundered by SA men in mid-October, and the windows of nearby houses smashed amid tumultuous scenes. At the end of the month, a tear gas bomb was hurled into the Ansbach synagogue, and slogans daubed on Jewish houses, Jew, clear off before 1139. The government presidents reported ever-increasing numbers of outrages against Jews throughout 1938. Only in Upper Bavaria were conditions relatively quiet in the months before the Great Pogrom. And in contrast to the situation following the murder of Gustloff in February 1936, the dangerously volatile climate inside the country combined with Germany's new dominance in Europe since the Munich settlement to provide more or less ideal circumstances for the anti-Jewish retaliatory measures of November 1938. The methodically whipped-up hate campaign of 1938 together with the intensified boycott and exclusion of Jews from certain sections of the economy, had accelerated Jewish emigration, especially from small towns and villages where Jews had been particularly exposed. The relatively high proportion of Bavarian Jews living in such areas, as compared with the Reich as a whole, was one reason why emigration rates from Bavaria were higher than in Germany in general. Whereas the 370,000 Jews still remaining in Germany, leaving aside Austria and the Sudetenland, on the 1st of October 1938, represented 74% of the recorded number of 1933. In Bavaria, here including the Palatinate, the Jewish population formed only 67.5% of its 1933 level. There were significant regional differences within Bavaria. In Upper and Middle Franconia, there was a drop to 59%, and in Lower Franconia, to as little as 55%. Whereas the inflow from internal migration to Munich almost compensated for the city's losses, and there was only a slight drop to 95% of the 1933 figure. The quarterly statistics of the authorities show clearly the increase in emigration since 1937 following the stepped-up boycott. In the period of almost four years, from June 1933 to March 1937, 
the Jewish population in Bavaria had decreased by about 8,500 persons. In the one and a half years from the 1st of April 1937 to the 1st of October 1938, by as much as 5,200 persons. Even this was not fast enough for the Nazi regime. Towards the end of October 1938, around 17,000 Jews of Polish extract were expelled, among them the parents of Herschel Grunspan, whose revenge killing of Vom Rat triggered off the Kristallnacht pogrom, the subsequent temporary internment of some 30,000 Jews in concentration camps, and, as one consequence, the massive acceleration of Jewish emigration. Jews now left Germany in droves. By May 1939, more than 40% of those Jews still left in Bavaria on the eve of the pogrom had left. So far as Goebbels had reckoned with spontaneous popular support for the pogrom, however, he was disappointed. The disapproval of large sections of the population was abundantly clear, even if open protest was in the circumstances hardly conceivable. Though, in accordance with Goebbels' instructions, the press carried relatively few details about the nature and scale of destruction, in contrast to the extensive coverage of the legal measures introduced immediately after the pogrom. Shocked inhabitants of the cities and larger towns had the appalling evidence of smashed windows, demolished property, and burnt-out synagogues before their very eyes on the morning of the 10th of November. Outside the towns there were fewer signs of destruction, though word of the devastation in the cities travelled rapidly. The pogrom was throughout the Reich largely an urban phenomenon, except in the few areas where rural Jewish settlement was still prominent, and the scale of the pogrom corresponded largely to the size of the resident Jewish population and the level of radicality of the local party organizations. In Upper Bavaria, few cases of violence and destruction were recorded outside the city of Munich. Jews were often forced to leave their place of residence immediately or within a few hours, to offer their property for sale, and to sign an agreement never to return. Many were handed over to the police and kept in custody.